Section 1 of The Pastor's Wife This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Carson The Pastor's Wife by Elizabeth von Arnim Section 1 Part 1 Chapter 1 On that April afternoon all the wallflowers of the world seemed to her released body to have been piled up at the top of Regent Street so that she could walk in fragrance. She was in this exalted mood, the little mouse-coloured young lady slipping along southwards from Harley Street because she had just had a tooth out. After weeks of miserable indifference she was quivering with responsiveness again feeling the relish of life, the tang of it, the jollity of all this bustle and hurrying past of busy people. And the beauty of it, the beauty of it, she thought, fighting a tendency to loiter in the middle of the traffic to have a good look. The beauty of the sky across the roofs of the houses, the delicacy of the mistiness that hung down there over the curve of the street the loveliness of the lights beginning to shine in the shop windows. Surely the colour of London was an exquisite thing. It was like a pearl that late afternoon, something very gentle and pale with faint blue shadows. And as for its smell, she doubted indeed whether heaven itself could smell better, certainly not so interesting. And anyhow, she said to herself, lifting her head a moment in appreciation, it can't possibly smell more alive. She herself had certainly never been more alive. She felt electric. She would not have been surprised if sparks had come crackling out of the tips of her sober gloves. Not only was she suddenly and incredibly relieved from acute pain, but for the first time in her life of twenty-two years she was alone. This by itself, without the business of the tooth, was enough to make a dutiful, willing, and hard-worked daughter tingle. She would have tingled if by some glorious chance a whole free day had come to her merely inside the grey walls of the garden at home. But to be free and idle in London to have them all so far away, her family down there in the west, to have them so necessarily silent, so oddly vague already, and pallid in the distance. Yet she had only left them that morning. It was only nine hours since her father, handsome as an archangel, silvery of head and gaitered of leg, had waved her off from the doorstep with offended resignation. "'And do not return, Ingeborg,' he had called into the fly where she sat holding her face and trying not to rock, "'till you are completely set right. Even a week, even ten days, have them all seen to.' For the collapse of Ingeborg, daunted into just a silent, feverish thing of pain, had convulsed the ordered life at home. Her family bore it for a week with perfect manners, and hardly a look of reproach. Then they sent her to the Redchester dentist, a hitherto sufficient man, who tortured her with tentative stoppings, and turned what had been dull and smooth into excitement and jerks. Then, unable to resist a feeling that self-control would have greatly helped, it began to find the etiquette of Christian behavior, which insisted on its going on being silent, while she more and more let herself go irksome. The bishop wanted things in vain. Three times he had to see himself off alone at the station, and not be met when he came back. Buttons, because they were not tightened on in time, burst from his gaiters, and did it in remote places like railway carriages. Letters were unanswered, important ones. Engagements, vital ones, 
through lack of reminders, went unkept. At last it became plain, when she seemed not even to wish to answer when spoken to, or to move when called, that this apathy and creeping away to hide could not further be endured. Against all tradition, against every home principle, they let a young unmarried daughter loose. With offended reluctance, they sent her to London to a celebrity in teeth. After all, it was not as if she had been going just to enjoy herself. And your aunt will please forgive us, said the bishop, for taking her in this manner unawares. The aunt, a serious strong lady, was engaged for political meetings in the north, and had gone away to them that very morning, leaving a letter and her house at Ingeborg's disposal for so long as the dentist needed her. The dentist, being the best that money could buy, hardly needed her at all. He pounced unerringly, and at once on the right tooth, and pulled it out. There were no stoppings, no delays, no pain, and no aunt. Never was a life more beautifully cleared. Ingeborg went away down Harley Street free, and with ten pounds in her pocket. For the rest of this day, for an hour or two tomorrow morning, before setting out for Paddington and home, she could do exactly as she liked. Why, there's nothing to prevent me going anywhere this evening, she thought, stopping dead, as the full glory of the situation slowly dawned on her. Why, I could go out somewhere really grand to dinner, just as people do, I expect, in all the books I'm not let read, and then I could go to the play. Nobody could prevent me. Why, I could go to a music hall if I chose, and still... Nobody could prevent me. Audacious imaginings that made her laugh. She had not laughed for weeks, darted in and out of her busy brain. She saw herself in her mouse-colored dress, reducing waiters in marble and gilt places to respect and slavery by showing them her ten pounds. She built up lurid fabrics of possible daring deeds, and smiled at the reflection of herself in shop windows as she passed, at the sobriety, the irreproachableness of the sheath containing these molten imaginings. Why, she might hire a car, just telephone, and there you were with it round in five minutes, and go off in the twilight to Richmond Park or Windsor. She had never been to Richmond Park or Windsor, she had never been anywhere. But she was sure there would be bats and stars out there, and water, and the soft duskiness of trees, and the smell of wet earth, and she could drive about them slowly, so as to feel it all, and then come back and have supper somewhere, have supper at the Ritz, she thought of which she had read hastily out of the corner of an eye between two appearances of the bishop in the more interesting portions of the times just saunter in you know or she could have dinner first yes dinner first dinner at claridge's no not at claridge's she had an aunt who stayed there another one her mother's sister rich and powerful and it was always best not to stir up rich and powerful aunts. Dinner at the Thackeray Hotel, perhaps. That was where her father's relations stayed, fine-looking, serious men, who once were curates, and yet earlier good and handsome babies. It was near the British Museum, she had heard. Its name and surroundings suggested magnificence of a nobler sort than the Ritz. Yes, she would dine at the Thackeray Hotel and be splendid. Here, coming to a window full of food, she became aware that wonderfully, and for the first time for weeks, she was hungry. So hungry that 
she didn't want dinner or supper or anything future but something now she went in and all her gilded visions of the ritz and the thackeray hotel were swamped in one huge cup she felt how legitimate and appropriate a drink it was for a bishop's daughter without a chaperone and ordered the biggest size costing fourpence an aerated bread shop cocoa it was six o'clock when she emerged amazingly nourished from that strange place where long-backed elderly gentlemen with tired eyes were hurriedly eating poached eggs on chilly little clothesless marble tables and continued down regent street she now felt strangely settled in her mind she no longer wanted to go to the ritz indeed the notion of dining anywhere with the cocoa clothing her internally as with a garment a thick winter garment almost she thought like the closer kinds of fur was revolting she still felt enterprising but a little clogged she thought now more of things like fresh air and exercise not now for her the heat and glitter of a music hall there was a taste in that pure drink that was irreconcilable with music halls a satisfying property in its unadulteratedness its careful cleanliness that reminded her she was the daughter of a bishop walking away from the aerated bread shop rather gravely she remembered that she had a mother on a sofa an only sister who was so beautiful that it was touching and a class of boys once unruly and now looking up to her in fact that she had a position to keep up she was still happy but happy now in a thoroughly nice way and she would probably have gone back in this warmed and solaced condition to her aunt's house in bedford square and an evening with a book and an early bed if her eye had not been caught by a poster outside an office sort of place she was passing a picture of water and mountains with written on it in big letters a week in lovely lucerne seven days for seven guineas those who intend to join next trip inquire within now ingeborg's maternal grandmother had been a swede a creature of toughness and skill on skis a young woman when caught surprisingly by the washed-out english tourist ingeborg's grandfather drenched in frank reading and thinking and in the smell of the abounding forests and in wood strawberries and sour cream she had lived up to the day when for some quite undiscoverable reason she allowed herself to be married to the narrow stranger in the middle of big beautiful things big stretches of water big mountains big winds big loneliness and ingeborg who had never been out of england and had spent years in the soft and soppy west seeing the picture of the great lake and the great sky in the window in regent street felt a quick grip on her heart it was the fingers of her grandmother she stood staring at the picture half remembering trying hard to remember quite something beautiful and elusive and remote that once she had known oh that once she had known but that she kept on somehow forgetting the urgencies of daily life in episcopal surroundings the breathless pursuit of her duties the effort all day long to catch them up and be even with them the bishop's buttons the bishop's speeches the bishop's departures by trains his all-pervadingness when at home his all-engulfing mass of correspondence when away she is my right hand he would say in stately praise the red chester tea parties to which her mother couldn't go because of the sofa the county garden parties to which judith had to be taken the collars the bazaars the cathedral services the hurry the noise life at home seemed the noisiest thing 
these had smothered and hidden beaten down put out and silenced that highly important and unrecognized part of her her little bit of lurking grandmother now however this tough but impulsive lady rose within her in all her might her granddaughter was in exactly the right state for being influenced she was standing there staring longing seething for scandinavia and presently arguing why shouldn't she the bishop as she had remarked with wonder earlier in the afternoon seemed to have faded quite pallid that long way off and arrangements had been made he had engaged an extra secretary his chaplain had been warned judith was going perhaps to do something her mother would stay safely on the sofa they did not expect her back for at least a week and not for as much longer as her tooth might ache if her tooth was still in her mouth it would be aching if the dentist had decided to stop it it would have been a fortnight before such a dreadful ache as that could be suppressed she was sure it would and the ten pounds her father had given her for taxis and tips and other odds and ends spread over a fortnight what would have been left of it anyhow besides he had said and indeed the bishop desirous of taking no jot from his generosity in the whole annoying business had said it and said it with the strong flavour of scripture which hung about even his mufti utterances that she might keep any fragments of it that remained that nothing be lost your father is very good to you said her mother in whose prostrate presence the gift had been made but bishops flashed across ingeborg's undisciplined and jerky mind have to be good she caught the flash however and choked it out before it got half way you'll be able to get yourself a spring hat yes mother said ingeborg holding her face and i should think a blouse as well said her mother thoughtfully yes mother my dear remember i require ingeborg here said the bishop uneasy at this vision of an indispensable daughter delayed by blouses you will not of course forget that ingeborg no father and here she was forgetting it here she was in front of a common poster forgetting it what the ritz and the thackeray hotel with all their attractions had not been able to do that crude picture did she forgot the bishop or rather he seemed at that distance such a little thing such a little bit of a thing a tiny little black figure with a dab of white on its top compared to this vision of splendid earth and heaven that she wilfully would not remember him she forgot her accumulating work she forgot that her movements had all first to be sanctioned a whirl of scandinavianism of violent longing for freedom and adventure seemed to catch her and lift her out of the street and fling her into a place of maps and timetables and helpful young men framed in mahogany when when she stammered breathlessly pointing to a duplicate of the same poster hanging inside when does the next trip start to-morrow madam said the young man her question had tumbled on a solemnity fell upon her she felt it was providence she ceased to argue she didn't even try to struggle i'm going she announced and her ten pounds became two pounds thirteen and she walked away conscious of nothing except that the very next day she would be off chapter two she was collected by the official leader of this particular dense excursion at charing cross the next morning and swept into a second-class carriage with nine other excursionists and next door there were more she counted eighteen of them at one time crowding round the leader asking him questions and besides these there was a crowd of ordinary passengers bustling about with holiday expressions and several runaway couples and every single person seemed like herself eager to be off 
the runaway couples from the ravaged expressions on their faces were being torn by doubts perhaps already by repentances but ingeborg though she was deceiving her father who being a bishop should have been particularly inviolate and her mother who being sofa ridden should have appealed to her better nature and her sister who being exquisite should have been guarded from any shadow that might dim her beauty had none she had been frightened that morning while she was packing and getting herself out of her aunt's house the immense conviction of the servants that she was going home cowed her and she had had to say little things paddington for instance to the taxi driver when she knew she meant charing cross and had blushed when she changed it through the window but here she was and there was a crowd of people doing exactly the same thing whose secure jollity except in the case of those odd sad couples was contagious and she felt both safe and as though she were the most normal creature in the world what fun she thought her blood dancing as she watched the swarming surging platform what fun often had she been at the redchester station in attendance on her departing father but what a getting off was that compared to this hilarity there was bustle of course because trains won't wait and people won't get out of the way but the bishop's bustlings particularly when their end was confirmations were conducted with a kind of frozen offendedness there was no life in him she thought remembering them he didn't let himself go on the other hand she reflected careful to be fair you couldn't snatch illicitly at things like confirmations in the way you could at a dense tour and devour them in secret with a fearful hidden joy she felt like a bulb must feel she thought at the supreme moment when it has nosed its little spear successfully up through the mould it has endured all the winter and gets it suddenly out into the light and splendour of the world the freedom of it all the joy of getting clear the excursionists in the carriage struggled to reach the window across her feet and say things to their friends outside they all talked at once and the carriage was full of sound and gesticulations the friends on the platform could not hear but they nodded and smiled sympathetically and shouted at intervals that it was going to be a good crossing everybody was being seen off except herself and the runaway couples indeed you could know which those were by the gaps along the platform she sat well back in her place anxious to make herself as convenient as possible and to get her feet tucked out of the way a typical daughter of provincial england and a careful home and the more expensive clergy well dressed inconspicuous and grey her soft mouse-coloured hat as the fashion that spring still went on decreeing in the west came down well over her eyes and ears and little rings of cheerful hair of a scandinavian colouring wantoned beneath it her small face was swallowed up in the shadow of the hat you saw a liberal mouth with happy corners and the nostrils of a selective nose and there was an impression of freckles and of very fair sunny sort of skin the square german gentleman opposite her knowing nobody in london and therefore being but for a different and honourable reason in her position of not having any one to see him off filled up the time by staring entirely unconscious that it might be embarrassing he sat and stared with the utmost singleness of mind he wished to see the rest of her when he would be able to determine whether she was pretty or not ingeborg absorbed by the wild excitement on the platform had not noticed him but immediately the train started 
and the other passengers had sorted themselves into their seats and were beginning the furtive watchfulness of one another that was presently to resolve itself into acquaintanceship she knew there was something large and steady opposite that was concentrated upon herself she looked up quickly to see what it was and for a moment her polite intelligent eyes returned his stare he decided that she had missed being pretty and with a faint regret wondered what god was about fattened up yes possibly he thought fattened up yes perhaps and he went on staring because she happened to be exactly opposite and there was nothing else except tunnels to look at the other excursionists were all in pairs they thought ingeborg was too and put her down at first as the german gentleman's wife because he did not speak to her there were two couples of young women one of ladies of a riper age and one of the earnest young men who were mentioning balzac to each other almost before they had got to new cross indeed a surprising atmosphere of culture pervaded the compartment ingeborg was astonished except the riper ladies who persisted in talking about schoolbred they were all presently saying educated things balzac blake bernard shaw and mrs florence barclay were bandied backwards and forwards across the carriage as lightly and familiarly as though they had been balls in the far corner browning was being compared with tennyson the middle dickens with thackeray the two elder ladies who kept to schoolbred formed a sort of dam between these educated overflowings and the silent backwater in which ingeborg and the german gentleman sat becalmed presently owing to a politeness that could not allow even an outlying portion of any one else's clothing or belongings to be brushed against without excuse me having been said and don't mention it having been answered acquaintances were made chocolates were offered they introduced each other to each other for a brief space the young men's caps were hardly on their heads and the air was murmurous with gratified noises but the two riper ladies passionately preoccupied by schoolbred continued to dam up ingeborg and her opposite neighbour into a stagnant and unfruitful isolation she tried to peep round the lady next to her who jutted out like a mountain with mighty boulders on it so as to see the three people hidden in the valley beyond glimpses of their knees revealed that they were just like the ones on the seat opposite they were neat knees a little threadbare not with the delicate threadbareness of her own home in the palace at redchester where splendors of carved stone and black oak and ancient glass were kept from flaunting their pricelessness too obviously in the faces of the local supporters of disestablishment by a christian leanness in the matter of carpets but knees that were inexpensive because they had to be who were these girls and young men and the two abundant ladies and the man with the vast thick head and unalterable stare all people who did things she was certain not just anything like herself but regular things that began and stopped at fixed times that were paid for that was why they were able to do frankly and honourably what she was snatching at furtively in a corner for a brief astonishing instant she was aware she liked the corner way best staggered at this for she could in no way reconcile it with the bishop the cathedral the home nor with any of her thoughts down there while enfolded in these three absorbing influences she tried to follow her father's oft repeated advice and look into herself but it did not help much 
she saw indeed that she was doing an outrageous thing but then she was very happy happier than she had ever been in redchester plied with legitimate episcopal joys there was a keenness about this joy the salt freshness of something jolly and indefensible done in secret she did look at penitence sideways for an instant but almost at once decided that it was a thing that comes afterwards first you do your thing you must of course do your thing or there couldn't be any penitence she sat up very straight her face lit with these thoughts that both amused and frightened her her lips slightly parted her eyes radiant ready for anything life had to offer a little fattened up thought the german gentleman a little even would probably suffice there was to be a night in paris no time to see it but you can't have everything and paris is paris and next morning into the train again and down down all down the slope of the map of france to bail the gate of beauty surely of heavenly beauty and then you got there and there were five whole days of wonder and then her thoughts hesitated why then she supposed making an effort you began to come back and then but here she thought it wisest not to go on thinking excuse me but do you mind having that window up asked the lady on the, her right oh no said ingeborg darting at the strap with the readiness to help and obey she had been so carefully practised in it was stiff and she fumbled at it wondering a little why the man opposite just watched when she had got it up he undid the woolen scarf round his neck and unbuttoned the top button of his overcoat at last he said in a voice of relief heaving an enormous sigh he looked at her and smiled instantly she smiled back any shreds of self-consciousness she may have had clinging to her in her earlier days had been finally scraped off when judith that amazing piece of loveliness came out were you cold she asked with the friendly interest of a boy naturally when windows are open one is always cold oh said ingeborg who had never thought of that she perceived from his speech that he was a foreigner from the turned-down collar and white tie beneath his opened scarf she also was made aware that he was a minister of religion how they pursue me she thought even here even in a railway carriage reserved for dense excursionists only one of them had filtered through she also saw that he was of a drab complexion and that his hair drab too and close cropped and thick seemed to be made of beaver but that's what windows are for she said after reflecting on it no the two large ladies let schoolbred pause while they looked at each other they considered ingeborg's behaviour forward she ought not to have spoken first impossible on a dense tour not to make friends indeed the social side of these excursions is the most important but there are rules the other end of the carriage had observed the rules the two ladies hoped they had not joined anything not quite high-toned the other end had carried out the rules with rigid savoir vivre had accidentally touched and trodden on had apologized had had its apologies accepted had introduced and been introduced and so had cleared the way to chocolates no repeated ingeborg inquiringly the aperture was there first said the german gentleman of course said ingeborg seeing he waited for her to admit it and in the fullness of the ages came man and mechanically shut it yes said ingeborg but consequently 
the function of windows is to shut apertures yes but and not to open that which without them was already open yes but it would be illogical said the german gentleman patiently to contend that their function is to open that which without them was open already reassured by the word illogical which was a nice word well known to and quite within the spirit of a dense tour the two ladies went on with southbred where they had left him off the first day i was in england i went about logically and shut each single window in my boarding-house i then discovered that this embittered the atmosphere around me it would thicken it nodded ingeborg interested it did and my calling after all being that of peace and my visit so short that whatever happened could be endured i relinquished logic and purchased in its place a woolen scarf this one then i gave myself up unrestrictedly to the air and did you like it it made me recollect with pleasure that i was soon going home in east prussia there are on the one hand drawbacks but on the other are double windows stoves and a just proportion of feathers for each man's bed till the draughts and blankets of the boarding-house braced me to enduring instead of enjoying i had thought my holiday too short and when i remembered my life and work at home my official life and work it had been appearing to me puny puny said ingeborg her eyes on his white tie puny the draughts and blankets of the boarding-house cured me i am returning gladly my life there i said to myself may be puny but it is warm so he added smiling a man learns content taught by draughts and blankets taught by going away oh said ingeborg had providence then only led her to that poster in order that she should learn content were dense tours really run educationally by providence but she began and then stopped it is necessary to go away in order to come back said the german gentleman again with patience yes of course but the chief use of a holiday is to make one hungry to have finished with it oh no she protested the joy of holiday in her voice ah you are at the beginning the very beginning yet at the end you too will return home reconciled she looked at him and shook her head i don't think reconciled is quite the she paused thinking to what she went on to puniness too the two ladies faltered in their conversation and glanced at ingeborg and then at each other perhaps not to puniness you are not a pastor there was a distinct holding of the breath of the two ladies the german gentleman's slow speech fell very clearly on their sudden silence no said ingeborg but what has that i am and it is a puny life ingeborg felt a slight curdling she thought of a father also if you come to that a pastor she was sure there was nothing in anything he ever did that would strike him as puny his life was magnificent and important filled to bursting point with a splendid usefulness and with a tendency to fill the lives of every one who came within his reach to their several bursting points too but he of course was a prince of the church still he had gone through the church's stages beginning humbly yet she doubted whether at any moment of his career he had looked at it and thought it puny and was it not indeed the highest career of all however breathless and hurried it made one's female relations in its upper reaches and drudging in its lower the very highest but though she was curdled she was interested it might not be your miss continued the pastor looking out of the window at some well-formed land they were passing if it were not for the sundays again she was curdled but 
they spoil it. She was silent, and the silence of the two ladies appeared to acquire a frost. It is the fatal habit of Sundays, he went on, following the disappearing land with his eyes, to recur. He paused as if waiting for her to agree. She had to, because it was a truth one could not get away from. Yes, she said reluctantly, of course, it's their nature. Then a wave of memories suddenly broke over her, and she added warmly, Oh, don't they? The frost of the ladies seemed to settle down. It grew heavy. They interrupt one's work, he said. But they are your work, she said, puzzled. No. She stared, but she began. A pastor. A pastor is also a man. Yes, said Ingeborg, but you have no doubt observed that he is invariably also a man. Yes, said Ingeborg, but and a man of intelligence. I am a man of intelligence, cannot fill up his life with the meagre materials offered by the practice of the tenets of the Lutheran Church. Oh, the Lutheran Church, said Ingeborg, catching at a straw. Any church? She was silent. She felt how immensely her father would not have liked it. She felt it was wicked to sit there and listen. She also felt strange and dreadful to observe, refreshed. Then she began knitting her brows, for really this at its best was bad taste, and bad taste, she had always been taught, was the very worst. Oh, but how nice it was, a little bit of it. After the swamps of good taste one waded about in, in cathedral cities, she knitted her brows aghast at her thoughts. Then what, she asked, do you fill your life up with? Manure, said the German gentleman. The ladies leapt in their places. Ma, began Ingeborg, then stopped. I am engaged in endeavouring to teach the peasants of my parish how best to farm their poor pieces of land. Oh, really, said Ingeborg, politely. I do it by example. They do not attend to words. I have bought a few acres and experiment before their eyes. Our soil is the worst in Germany. It is inconceivably thankless, and the peasants resemble it. Oh, really, said Ingeborg, the result of the combination is poverty. So then I suppose, said Ingeborg, with memories of the bishop's methods, you preach patience. Patience, I preach manure. Again, at the dreadful word, the ladies leapt. It is, he said solemnly, his eyes glistening with enthusiasm, the foundation of a nation's greatness. I hadn't thought of it like that, said Ingeborg, seeing that he waited. But on what then does a state depend in the last resort? She was afraid to say, for there seemed to be so many possible answers. Naturally on its agriculture, said the pastor, with the slight irritation of one obliged to linger over the obvious. Of course, said the pliable Ingeborg, trained in acquiescence. And on what does agriculture depend in the last resort? Brilliantly she hazarded manure. For the third time the ladies leapt, and the one next to her drew away her dress. He showed his appreciation of her intelligence by nodding slowly. A nation must be fed, he said, and empty fields will feed no one. Of course not, said Ingeborg. So that is the chief element in all progress, for the root of progress flourishes only in a filled stomach. The ladies began to fan themselves violently, nervously, one with the daily mirror, the other with answers. Of course, said Ingeborg. First, said the German gentleman, you fill your stomach. The lady next to Ingeborg made a sudden lunge across at the strap. Excuse me, but do you mind putting that window down? She said in a sort of burst. The German gentleman, stemmed in his speech, used the interval while Ingeborg opened the window in buttoning up his overcoat again with care and patience and readjusting his muffler. 
when he had attended to these things he resumed his enthusiasm he seemed to switch it on again the infinite combinations of it he exclaimed its infinite varieties kali kainit chili saltpetre superphosphates he rolled out the words as though they were the verse of a psalm when i shut the door on myself in the little laboratory i have constructed i shut in with me all life all science every possibility i analyze i synthesize i separate reduce combine i touch the stars i stir the depths the daily world is forgotten i forget indeed everything except my research and invariably at the most profound the most exalted moments some one knocks and tells me it is sunday again and will i come out and preach he looked at her indignantly demanding sympathy preach he repeated then why she asked with the courage of curiosity are you a pastor because my father made me one but why are you still one because a man must live he oughtn't to want to said ingeborg with a faint flush for she had been carefully trained to shyness when it came to pronouncing opinions the bishop called it womanly he oughtn't to want to at the cost of his convictions nevertheless said the pastor he does yes said ingeborg obliged to admit it even at redchester cases were not unknown he does she said nodding of course he does and unable not to be at least as honest as the pastor she added and so does a woman naturally said the pastor she looked at him a moment and then said impulsively pulling herself a little forward towards him by the window strap this woman does she's doing it now the two ladies exchanged glances and fluttered their fans faster which woman inquired the pastor whose mastery of english though ripe was not nimble this one said ingeborg pointing at herself me i'm living at this very moment i'm whirling along in this train i'm running away for this holiday entirely at the cost of my convictions chapter three after this it was not to be expected that dent's tour should look favorably on either ingeborg or the german gentleman running away and something happened at dover that clinched it in its coldness the train had slowed down and the excursionists had become busy and were all standing up expectant and swaying with their bags and umbrellas ready in their hands except ingeborg and the pastor the train stopped and still the two at the door did not move they were so much interested in what they were saying that that they went on sitting there barbarously corking up the congested queue inside the carriage while streams of properly liberated passengers poured past the window on their way to the best places on the boat the queue heaved and waited holding on to its good manners till the last possible moment quite anxious with the exception of the two ladies who were driven to the very verge of naturalness by the things they had had to listen to lest it should be forced to show what it was feeling for what one is feeling dense excursionists had surprisingly discovered is always somehow something rude and seconds passed and still it was kept there heaving then the pastor gazing with a large unhurried interest at the people pushing by the window people disfigured by haste and the greed for the best places on the boat said in a voice of mild but penetrating complaint it almost seemed as if in that congested moment he saw only leisure for musing aloud but why does the good god make so many ugly women it was when he said this that the mountainous lady at the head of the queue flung behavior to the winds 
and let herself go uncontrollably. Will you allow me to pass? she cried. Nor did she give him another instant's grace, but pressed between his and Ingeborg's knees, followed torrentially by the released remainder. To keep us all waiting there, just while he blasphemed, she panted on the platform to her friend and during the rest of the time the party was together it retired led by these two ladies into an icy exclusiveness outside which and left together all day long ingeborg and the pastor could not but make friends they did they talked and they walked they climbed and they sight saw they did everything dent had arranged going with him but not of him always as it were bringing up his rear equally careful being equally poor they avoided the extras which seemed to lurk beckoning at every corner of the day their frugality was flagrant and shocked the other excursionists even more than the dreadful things they said such bad taste the tour declared when on the third day after having provoked criticism by their negative attitude towards afternoon tea and the purchase of picture postcards they would not lighten its several burdens by taking their share of an unincluded outing in flies along the lake even mr ascoff dense distracted representative thought them undesirable and especially could make nothing of ingeborg except that somehow she was not dense sort the german gentleman though in appearance a more familiar type became whenever he opened his mouth grossly unfamiliar foul-mouthed was the expression the largest lady had used bearing down on mr ascoff at dover to complain adding that as she had done all her travelling for years with and through dents she felt justified in demanding that this man's mouth should be immediately cleansed i'm not a toothbrush mrs bawn replied the distracted mr ascoff engaged at that moment in struggling for air and light in the middle of his clinging flock then i shall write to mr dent himself said mrs bawn indignantly and mr ascoff intimidated fought himself free and followed her down the platform inquiring dreadfully really he seemed to be a person of little refinement whether then the german gentleman's conversation had been obscene i can get rid of him if it's been obscene you know said mr ascoff was it so that mrs bawn incensed and baffled was obliged for the dignity of her womanhood to say she was glad to have to inform him she did not know what the word meant but the pastor his name was dremmel he told ingeborg robert dremmel took everything that happened with simplicity they might shut him out and he would never notice it they might turn their backs and he would never know nothing that dense tour could do in the way of ostracizing would have been able to pierce through to his consciousness having decided that the women of it were plain and the men uninteresting he thought of them no more with his customary single-mindedness he concentrated his attention at first only on switzerland which was what he was paying to see and he found it pleasant that the young lady in grey should so naturally join him in this concentration just for a few hours at the very beginning he had thought her naturalness her ready friendliness a little unwomanly she was he thought a little too productive of an impression that she was a kind of boy she had no self-consciousness which he had been taught by his mother to confound with modesty and no desire whatever apparently to please the opposite sex she went to sleep for instance towards the end of the long journey right in front of him letting her mouth open if it wanted to and not bothering at all that he should probably be looking at it 
Herr Dremmel, who besides his agricultural researches prided himself on a liberal, if intermittent, interest in womanly charm, regretted these shortcomings, but only for a few hours at the very beginning. By the end of the first day in Lucerne, he was finding it pleasant to pair off with her, womanly or unwomanly. He discovered he could talk to her, as he had been unable to talk to the few East Prussian young ladies he had met, in spite of the stiff intensity of their desire to please him. He searched about for a reason, and concluded that it was because she was interested. Whatever subject he discoursed upon, she came, so it seemed, running to meet him. She listened intelligently and with a pliability. He did not then know about the bishop's training, rarely to be found in combination with intelligence. Intelligent persons were very apt, he remembered, to argue and object. This young lady was intelligent, without argument, a most comfortable compound, and before a definite opinion had a graceful knack of doubling up and if her doublings up were at all as they sometimes were delayed while she put in but he only needed repeat with patience to bring out an admirable submissive suddenness he could not of course know of her severe training in suddenness at the end of the second day he had told her more about his life and his home and his work and his ambitions than he had ever told anybody and she had told him, only he was unable to find that so interesting, about her life and her home and her work. She had no ambitions, she explained, which he said was well in a woman. He was hardly aware of the bishop, so lightly did she skim over him. By the end of the third day he had observed what had, curiously, escaped him before, that she was pretty not of course in the abundant east prussian way the way of generous curves and of what he now began to think were after all superfluities but with delicacy and restraint he no longer considered she would be better fattened up and he was noticing her clothes and after a painstaking comparing of them with those of the other ladies applying to them the adjective elegant at the end of the fourth he admitted to himself that very probably he was soon going to be in love by the end of the fifth he knew without a doubt that the thing had happened the to him incontrovertible proof being that on this day switzerland sank into being just her background even the rigi he observed with interest was nothing to him he walked up it he who never walked up anything, because she wanted to. He toiled up panting, and forgot how warmly he was dissolving inside his black clothes in the pleasure of watching her on ahead, glancing in and out of the sunshine that fell clear and white on her, as she fluttered above him among the pine trunks and when he got to the top instead of looking at the view he sat down in the nearest seat and became absorbed in the way the burning afternoon light seemed to get caught in her hair as she stood on the edge of the plateau and made it look the colour of flames this was very interesting he had never yet within his recollection preferred hair to views a curious result he reflected of his harmless holiday enterprise he had not intended to marry he was thirty-five and dedicated to his work he felt it was a noble work this patient proving to ignorance and prejudice of what could be done with barrenness if only you mixed it with brains he was fairly comfortable in his housekeeping having found a woman who was a widow and had therefore learned the great lesson that only widows ever really know that a man must be let alone he was poor and what he could spare by rigid economies went into the few acres of sand 
that were to be the light he had to offer to lighten the gentiles every man he thought should offer some light to the abounding gentiles before he died some light which however small might be kept so clear that they could not choose but see it a wife he had felt when considering the question from time to time which was each year in the early spring would come between him and his light she would be a shadow and a voluminous all-enveloping shadow his church and the business of preaching in it were already sufficiently interrupting but they were weekly a wife would be every day he could lock her out of the laboratory he would reflect and perhaps also out of the sitting-room when he became aware that he was earnestly considering what other rooms he could lock her out of and discovered that he would want to lock her out of nearly all he as a wise and honest man decided he had best leave the much curved virgins of the neighborhood alone the question occupied him regularly every year in the first warm days of spring for the rest of the year he mostly forgot it absorbed in his work and here he was on the top of the rigi a cool place almost wintry with it suddenly becoming so living that compared to it his fertilizers seemed ridiculous he examined this change of attitude with care he was proud of the way he had fallen in love he a poor man doing it without any knowledge of whether the young lady had enough or indeed any money he sat there and took pleasure in this proof that though he was thirty-five he could yet be reckless he was greatly pleased at finding himself so much attracted that if it should turn out that she was penniless he would still manage to marry her and would make it possible by a series of masterly financial skirmishings the chief of which would be the dismissal of the widow and the replacing of her dinginess her arrested effect of having been nipped in the bud although there was no bud by this incorporate sunshine the young lady's tact of which she had seen several instances would cause her to confine her sunshine to appropriate moments she would not overflow it into his working hours besides marriage was a great readjuster of values after it he had not a doubt his wife would fall quite naturally into her place which would though honourable be yet a little lower than the fertilizers if it were not so if marriage did not readjust the upset incidental to his preliminaries what a disastrous thing falling in love would be no serious man would be able to let himself do it but how interesting it was the way nature that old hostility that ancient enemy to man's thought did somehow manage to trip him up sooner or later and how still more interesting the ingenuity with which man aware of this trick and determined to avoid the disturbance of a duration of affection had invented marriage end of section one section two of the pastor's wife this librivox recording is in the public domain section two he gazed very benevolently at the little figure on the edge of the view why not marry her now and frugally convert the tail end of dent's excursion into a honeymoon with the large simplicity and obliviousness to bans and licenses of a man of scientific preoccupations he saw no reason against this course it was obvious it was desirable it would not only save her going back to england first it would save the extra journey there for him they would go straight home to east prussia together at the end of the week and as for doing it without her family's knowledge 
if she could run away from them as she had told him she had done just for the sake of a jaunt how much more readily with what increase of swiftness indeed would she run for the sake of a husband tell me little one he said when she rejoined him will you marry me chapter four ingeborg was astonished she stared at him speechless the gulf between even the warmest friendliness and marriage she had she knew been daily increasing in warm friendliness towards him characteristically expecting nothing back that he too should grow warm had not remotely occurred to her nobody had ever grown warm to her in that way there had always been judith that miracle of beauty to blot her into plainness it is true the senior curate of the redchester parish church had said to her once in his exhausted oxford voice you know i don't mind about faces will you marry me and she had refused so gingerly with such a fear of hurting his feelings is that for a week he had supposed he was engaged but one would not call that warmth as the sun puts out the light of a candle so did the radiance of judith extinguish ingeborg they were so oddly alike and ingeborg was the pale diminished shadow judith was ingeborg grown tall grown exquisite ingeborg wrought wonderfully in ivory and gold no man could possibly fall in love with ingeborg while there before his very eyes was apparently exactly the same girl only translated into loveliness from the first it had been the most natural thing in the world to ingeborg to be plain and passed over judith was always beside her whenever there was a pause in her work for her father it was filled by the chaperoning of judith she accepted the situation with complete philosophy for nothing was quite so evident as judith's beauty and she used in corners at parties to keep herself awake by a saying over bits of the psalms on which not being allowed to read novels her literary enthusiasms were concentrated it was then really a very astonishing thing to a person practised in this healthy and useful humility to have someone asking her to marry him that it should be herr dremmel seemed to her even more astonishing he didn't look like somebody one married he didn't even look like somebody who wanted to marry one he sat there his hands folded on the knob of his stick gazing at her with an entirely placid benevolence and asked her the surprising question as though it were a way of making conversation it is true he had not called her little one before but that she felt as she stood before him considering this thing that had happened to her was pretty rather than impassioned here was an awkward and odd result of her holiday enterprise it's very unexpected she said lamely yes he agreed it is unexpected it has greatly surprised me i am very sorry she said about what are you sorry little one i can't accept your your offer what there is someone else not that sort of someone but there's my father he made a great sweep with his arm fathers he said and pushed the whole breed out of sight he's very important important little one when will you marry me i can't leave him he became patient it has been laid down that a woman shall leave father and mother and any other related obstacle she may have the misfortune to be hampered with and cleave only to her husband that was about a man cleaving to his wife there wasn't anything said about a woman besides 
she stopped. She couldn't tell him that she didn't want to cleave. He gazed at her a moment in silence. He had not contemplated a necessity for persuasion. This, he then said with severity, is prevarication. She sat down on the grass and clasped her hands round her knees and looked up at him. She had taken off her hat when first she got to the top to fan herself and had not put it on again. As she sat there with her back to the glow of the sky, the wind softly lifted the rings of her hair, and the sun shone through them wonderfully. They seemed to flicker gently to and fro, little tongues of fire. Why, said Herr Dremmel, suddenly leaning forward and staring, you are like a spirit. This pleased her. For a moment her eyes danced. Like a spirit, he repeated, and here I am talking heavily to you as though you were an ordinary woman. Little one, how does one trap a spirit into marrying? Tell me, for very earnestly do I desire to be shown the way. One doesn't, said Ingeborg. Ah, do not be difficult. You have been so easy of such a comfortable response in all things up to now. But this began Ingeborg. Yes, this I well know. He was more stirred than he had thought possible. He was becoming almost eager. But, asked Ingeborg, exploring this new interesting situation, why do you want to? Want to marry you? Yes, because, said Herr Dremmel, immensely prompt, I have had the extreme good fortune to fall in love with you. Again she looked pleased. And I do not ask you, he went on, to love me, or whether you do love me. It would be presumption on my part, and not, if you did, very modest on yours. That is the difference between a man and a woman. He loves before marriage, and she does not love till after. Oh, said Ingeborg, interested. And what does he, the woman, continued Herr Dremmel, feels affection and esteem before marriage, and the man feels affection and esteem after. Oh, said Ingeborg, reflecting. She began to tear up tufts of grass. It seems chilly, she said. Chilly? he echoed. He let his stick drop, and got up and came and sat down, or rather let himself down carefully on the grass beside her. Chilly? Do you not know that a decent chill is a great preservative? Hot things decay. Frozen things do not live. A just measure of chill preserves the life of the affections. It is by a very proper dispensation of nature, provided before marriage by the woman, and afterwards by the man. The balance is, in this way, nicely held, and peace and harmony, which nourish best at a low temperature, prevail. She looked at him and laughed. There was no one in Redchester, and Redchester was all she knew of life, in the least like Herr Dremmel. She stretched herself in the roomy difference, happy, free, at her ease. But I cannot believe, burst out Herr Dremmel with a passionate vigor, that astonished him more than anything in his whole life, as he seized the hand that kept on tearing up grass. I cannot believe that you will not marry me. I cannot believe that you will refuse a good and loving husband, that you will prefer to remain with your father and solidify into yet one more frost-bitten virgin. Into a what? repeated Ingeborg, struck by this image of herself in the future. She began to laugh, then stopped. She stared at him, her grey eyes very wide open. She forgot Herr Dremmel, and that he was still clutching her hand and all the grass in it, while her mind flashed over the years that had gone and the years that were to come. They would be alike. They had not been able to frostbite her yet, because she had been too young. 
but they would get her presently. Their daily repeated busy emptiness, their rush of barren duties, their meagre moments of what, when she was younger, used to be happiness, but had lately only been relief, those rare moments when her father praised her, would settle down presently and freeze her dead. Her face grew solemn. It's true, she said slowly. I shall be a frost-bitten virgin. I'm doomed. My father won't ever let me marry. You infinitely childish one, he cried, becoming angry. When it is well known that all fathers wish to get rid of all daughters, you don't understand. It's different. My father, why, she broke out, I used to dose myself secretly with cod-liver oil so as to keep up to his level. He's wonderful. When he praised me, I usen't to sleep. And if he scolded me, it seemed to send me lame. Herr Dremmel sawed her hand up and down in his irritation. What is this irrelevant talk, he said. I offer you marriage, and you respond with information about cod-liver oil. I do not believe the father obstacle. I do not recognize my honest little friend of these last days. It is waste of time, not being open. Would you then, if it were not for your father, marry me? But Ingeborg flashed round at him, swept off her feet, as she so often was by an impulse of utter truth. It's because of him that I would and the instant she had said it, she was shocked. She stared at Herr Dremmel, wide-eyed with contrition. The disloyalty of it, the ugliness of telling a stranger, and a stranger with hair like fur, anything at all about those closely related persons she had been taught to describe to herself as her dear ones. Oh, she cried, dragging her hand away, let my hand go. Let my hand go. She tried to get on to her feet, but with an energy he did not know he possessed, he pulled her down again. He did not recognize any of the things he was feeling and doing. The dremel of his real nature, of those calm depths where lay happy fields of future fertilizers, gazed at this inflamed conduct going on at the top in astonishment. No, he said with immense determination, you will sit here and explain about your father. It's a dreadful thing, replied Ingeborg, suddenly discovering that, of all things, she did not like being clutched, and looking straight into his eyes, her head a little thrown back, that one can't leave one's home even for a week without getting into a scrape. A scrape! You call it a scrape when a good man hears a person who goes away for a little change, privately, and before she knows where she is, she's being held down on the top of the riggy and ordered by a strange man, by her future husband, cried Herr Dremmel, who was finding the making of offers more difficult than he had supposed, by a strange man to explain her father. As though anybody could ever explain their father, as though anybody could ever explain anything. God in heaven, cried Herr Dremmel. Do not explain him, then. Just marry me. And at this moment the snake-like procession of the rest of Dent's tour, headed by Mr. Askoff, watch in hand, emerged from the hotel where it had been having tea, onto the plateau, wiping its mouths in readiness for the sunset. With the jerk of a thing that has been stung, it swerved aside as it was about almost to tread on the two on the grass. Ingeborg sat very stiff and straight, and pretended to be staring intently at the view, forgetting that it was behind her. She flushed when she found there was no time to move far enough from Herr Dremmel for a gap to be visible between them. "'Look at those two now,' whispered the young lady last in the procession to the young man, brushing bread and butter out of his tie, who walked beside her. 
he looked and seemed inclined to linger she's very pretty isn't she he said oh do you think so said his companion i never think anybody's pretty who isn't you know what i mean really nice you know ladylike and she hurried him on because she said if he didn't hurry he'd miss the sunset chapter five ingeborg spent most of the night on a hard chair at her bedroom window earnestly endeavouring to think it was very unfortunate but she found an immense difficulty at all times in thinking she could keep her father's affairs in the neatest order but not her own thoughts there were so many of them and they all seemed to jump about inside her and want to get thought first they would not go into ordered rows they had no patience often she had suspected they were not thoughts at all but just feelings and that depressed her for it made her drop she feared to the level of the insect world and enter the category of things that were not going to be able to get to heaven and to a bishop's daughter this was disquieting most of her thoughts she was immediately sorry for they were so unlike anything she could with propriety say out loud at home to herr dremmel she had been able to say them all as far as speech a limping vehicle could be made to go and this was another of his refreshing qualities she did not of course know of that absorbed man's habit of listening to her with only one ear a benevolent ear but only one while with the other turned inwards he listened to the working out in his mind of problems in chilisalpetra and superphosphates she sat staring out of the window at the stars and chimney-pots her hands held tightly in her lap and told herself that the moment had come for clear consecutive thought consecutive thought she repeated severely aware already of the interlaced dancing going on in her brain what was she going to do about herr dremmel about going home about oh about anything they had come down the rigi soberly and in the train nobody as usual spoke to them and for the first time in their friendship neither had they spoken to each other they had had a speechless dinner he had looked preoccupied and when directly after she had said good-night he had drawn her out into the passage and solemnly adjured her while the hall potter pretended he was out of earshot to have done with prevarications what he would suggest he said was a comfortable betrothal next day it was too late for one that night he said pulling out his watch but next day and as she retreated sideways step by step up the stairs silent through an inability immediately to find an answer that seemed tactful enough he had eyed her very severely and inquired of her with a raised voice what then the ado was all about she had turned at that giving up the search for tact and had run up the remaining stairs rather breathlessly feeling that herr dremmel on marriage had an engulfing quality and he after a moment's perplexity on the mat at the bottom had gone to the reading-room a baffled man now she sat at the window considering her journey home was only two days off and the thought of what would be said to her when she got there and of what her answers would be like ran down the back of her neck and spine as though someone were drawing a light ice-cold finger over the shrinking skin she had been persuading herself that a little holiday was harmless and natural and now this business with herr dremmel would she felt do away with all that and justify a wrath in her father that she might else for her private solace and encouragement have looked upon as unreasonable 
it is a peculiarity of parents reflected ingeborg that they are always being justified however small and innocent what you are doing may be if they disapprove something turns up to cause them to have been altogether right she remembered little things small occasions of her younger days this was a big occasion and what had turned up on it was herr dremmel it was a pity oh it was a pity she hadn't considered before she left london so impulsively whether when she got back to redchester she was going to be untruthful or not she had considered nothing except the acuteness of the joy of running away now she was faced by the really awful question of lying or not lying it was ugly to lie at all it was dreadful to lie to one's father but to lie to a bishop raised the operation from just a private sin which god would deal with kindly on being asked to a crime you were punished for if it was a cathedral you did it to a real crime the crime of sacrilege impossible to profane a sacred and consecrated object like a bishop doubly and trebly impossible if you were that object's own daughter her tightly folded hands went cold as she realized she was undoubtedly going to be truthful she was every bit as valiant as her swedish grandmother had been that grandmother who was aware of the dangers of the things she did with her mountains and her gusty lakes and defied them but her grandmother knew no fear and ingeborg knew it very well hers was the real courage found only in the entirely terrified who terrified yet see the thing whatever it is doggedly through she was faint yet pursuing she saw much terror in her immediate future she dreaded having to be courageous she felt she was too small really for the bravely truthful answering of her magnificent father's questions he would have the catechism and the confirmation service on his side as well as the laws of right behavior and filial love it didn't seem fair one couldn't argue with a parent one couldn't answer back while as for a bishop one couldn't do anything at all with him except hastily agree there was just a possibility but how remote that her father would be too busy to ask questions she sighed as she reflected how little she could count on that and how the most superficial inquiry about her aunt or the dentist would bring out the whole story and here was herr dremmel who thought nothing at all of him even in regard to an enormous undertaking like his daughter's marriage there was something sublime in such detachment she felt the largeness of the freedom of it blowing in her face like a brisk invigorating wind there seemed to be no hedges round herr dremmel he was as untied up a person as she had ever met he cared nothing for other people's opinion that chief enslavement of her home and he was an orphan sad to be an orphan thought ingeborg sighing sad of course not to have any dear ones but it did seem to be a condition that avoided the dilemma whose horns were concealment by means of untruths and the screwing up of oneself to that clamily cold and forlorn condition having courage of course herr dremmel didn't know her father he hadn't faced that impressive personality would he be quite so detached and easily indifferent if he had she thought with a shiver of what such a meeting supposing just for the sake of supposing that she allowed herself to become engaged would be like would herr dremmel in that setting of carefully subdued splendor of wainscoting and aureoles seemed to her as free and delightful as he seemed on a tour of frugal backgrounds would she in the presence of the bishop's horrified disapproval be able to see him as she had been seeing him now 
she had not explored very far into her own resources yet but she had begun lately to perceive that she was pliable she bent easily she felt and deplored having to feel in the direction desired by the persons she was with and who laid hold of her with authority it is true she sprang back again as she had discovered so surprisingly in london the instant the hold was relaxed but it seemed that she sprang only to do as she now with a head shake admitted difficulty bringing things and her training in acquiescence and distrust of herself was very complete and back in her home would she not at once bend into the old curve again was it possible would it ever be possible in her father's presence to disassociate herself from his points of view what his view of herr drummel would be she very exactly knew did she want to disassociate herself from it she pushed back her chair and began to walk quickly up and down the narrow little room if she didn't disassociate herself it meant marriage and marriage in stark defiance of the whole of her world redchester would be appalled the diocese would grieve for its bishop the county would discuss her antagonistically at a hundred tea-tables well and while they were doing it where would she be her blood began suddenly to dance she was seized as she had been in london by that overwhelming desire to shake off old things and set her face towards the utterly new while all these people were nodding and whispering in their stuffy stale world she would be safe in east prussia a place that seemed infinitely remote a place herr dremmel had described to her as full of forests and water and immense stretches of waving rye the lakes were fringed with rushes the forests came down to their edges his own garden ended in a little path through a lilac hedge that took you down between the rye to the rushes and the water and the first great pines oh she knew it as though she had seen it she had lured him on so often to describing it to her he thought nothing of it talked indeed of it with disgust as a god-forsaken place well it was these god-forsaken places that her body and spirit cried out for space freedom quiet the wind ruffling the rye the water splashing softly against the side of the punt there was a punt she had extracted the larks singing up in the sunlight the shining clouds passing slowly across the blue she wanted to be alone with these things after the years of deafening hurry at redchester with a longing that was like homesickness she remembered somehow that once she used to be with them long ago far away and there used to be little things when you lay faced downwards on the grass little lovely things that smelt beautiful wild strawberry leaves and a tiny aromatic plant with a white flower like a star that you rubbed between your fingers she stood still a moment frowning trying to remember more it wasn't in england but even as she puzzled the vision slipped away from her and was lost she wanted to read and walk and think she was hungry to read at last what she chose and walk at last where she chose and think at last exactly what she chose was the christian year enough for one in the way of poetry and all those mild novels her mother read sandwiched between the biographies of more bishops and little books of comfort with crosses on them that asked rude questions as to whether you had been greedy or dainty or had used words with a double meaning during the day were they enough for a soul that had quite alone with no father giving directions presently to face its god 
her family held strongly that for daughters to read in the daytime was to be idle well if it was thought ingeborg lifting her head that head that drooped so apologetically at home with a defiance that distance encourages then being idle was a blessed thing and the sooner one got away to where one could be it uninterruptedly the better in that parsonage away in east prussia for instance one would be able to read and read herr drummel had explained a hundred times about his laboratory and he himself locked into it and only asking to be left locked surely that was an admirable quality in a husband that he kept himself locked up and the parsonage was on the edge of the village and the little garden at the back had nothing between it and the sunset and all god's other dear arrangements except a solitary and long unused windmill it was about one o'clock in the morning that her courage however altogether ebbed at the prospect of going home what would it be like taking up her filialities again and all of them henceforth so terribly tarnished she would be a returning prodigal for whom no calf was killed but who instead of the succulences of a more liberal age would be offered an awful opportunity of explaining her conduct to a father who would interrupt her the instant she began and do the explaining himself how was she going to face it all alone if only she could have been in love with herr dremmel with what courage she would have faced her family then if she had been in love with him and come to them her hand in his if only he looked more like the lovers you see in pictures like the one in leighton's wedded for instance a very beautiful picture ingeborg thought but not like any of the wedded in redchester so that if she couldn't be in love she could at least persuade herself she was if only he had proper hair instead of just beaver she liked him so much she had even at particular moments of his conversation gone so far as to delight in him but marriage what was marriage why did they never talk about it at home in the bishop's palace it might for all the mentioning it got be one of the seven deadly sins you talked there of the married and sometimes but with reserve of getting married but marriage itself and what it was and meant was never discussed she had received the impression owing to these silences that though it was god's ordinance as her father in his official capacity at weddings reiterated it was a reluctant ordinance established apparently because there seemed no other way of getting round what appeared to be a difficulty what was the difficulty she had never in her busy life thought about it marriage had not concerned her it would not be nice she had felt unconsciously adopting the opinion of her environment for a girl who was not going to marry to get thinking of it and it really had not interested her she had quite naturally turned her eyes away but now this question of facing her father this need of being backed up this longing to get away from things forced her to look besides she would have to give herr dremmel some sort of answer in the morning and the facing of herr dremmel required courage too of a different kind but certainly courage she was so reluctant to hurt or disappoint it had seemed all her life the most beautiful of pleasures to give people what they wanted to get them to smile to see them look content but suppose herr dremmel before he could be got to smile and look content wanted to clutch her again as he had clutched her on the top of the rigi she had very profoundly disliked it 
she had been able to resent it there and get loose but if she were married and he clutched could she still resent she greatly feared not she greatly suspected now she came to a calm consideration of it that that was what was the matter with marriage it was a series of clutchings her father had no doubt realized this as she was realizing it now and very properly didn't like it you couldn't expect him to that was why he wouldn't talk about it in this she was entirely at one with him but perhaps herr dremmel didn't like it either wasn't she rather jumping at conclusions in imagining that he did hadn't he after all clutched rather in anger up there than in anything else and what about his earnest wish so often explained to be left all day locked up in his laboratory and what about his praise that very afternoon of chill in human relationships at that moment her eye was arrested by something white appearing slowly and with difficulty beneath her door she sat up very straight and stared at it watching its efforts to get over and past the edge of her mat for an instant she wondered whether it were not a kind of insect ghost then she saw as more of it appeared that it was a letter she held her breath while it struggled in nobody had ever pushed a letter under her door before she grew happy instantly what fun her heart beat quite fast with excitement while she waited to hear footsteps going away before getting up to fetch it herr dremmel however must have been in his goloshes objects from which he was seldom separated for she heard nothing and after a few seconds of breathless listening she got up with immense caution and went on tiptoe to the letter and picked it up why she thought pausing for a moment with a sort of solemnity before opening it i suppose this is my first love letter there was nothing on the envelope and no signature and this was what it said little one i wish to tell you that before going to my room tonight i instructed the hall porter to order a betrothal cake properly iced and with what is customary in the matter of silver leaves to be in the small salon adjoining the smoking-room to-morrow morning at nine o'clock since no man can be betrothed alone it will be necessary that you should be there chapter six it was a perturbed betrothal there were so many people at it seven ladies besides ingeborg appeared in the small salon adjoining smoking-room next morning at nine o'clock what herr dremmel had done being ignorant which was ingeborg's room and after laborious thought deciding that to demand her number of the hall porter later than dusk might very conceivably cast a slur on her reputation young ladies being as he well knew of all living creatures the most easily slurred was to write as many copies of the letter as there were doors on her landing and thrust them industriously one by one beneath each door strong in the knowledge that she would in this manner inevitably get one of them he was greatly pleased with this plan it seemed of a beautiful simplicity and effectiveness being unaware of the context he reasoned no lady except the right one will be able to guess what the letter can possibly refer to she will therefore throw it aside as an obvious mistake and think no more about it but the ladies did think and none of the inhabitants of the third floor except mr ascough who never thought anything about anything having discovered that if once you begin to think there is no end to it and a dried and brittle little man lately pensioned off by the firm he had been clerk to and taking his first 
trip on the continent in a condition of profound uninterestedness threw it aside these two did but the seven ladies not only did not throw it aside they read it many times and instead of thinking no more about it thought of nothing else even mrs bawn who had been a widow for six months and was heartily tired of it was pleased she liked particularly being addressed as little one there was a blindness about this that suggested genuine feeling she had not been so much pleased since her little bawn now half a year in glory had told her one day before their marriage that he did not care what anybody said he maintained that she was handsome they all thought the letter very virile and that nothing could be more gentlemanly than its restraint four of them expected a different male member of the party to be waiting in the small salon the remaining three expected mr ascough mr ascough had a caressing way with pats of butter and the closing of the doors of filled flies that had before now led him on these tours into misapprehensions he was long since married but had omitted to mention it the ladies therefore when they arrived in the small salon at nine o'clock did not find mr ascough nor any of the other four friends they expected they found surprisingly each other and standing thick and black near a decorated table at the window and scowling in a fresh astonishment every time the door opened and another lady came in that very undesirable fellow tourist the german gentleman each one immediately knew it was ingeborg who had been written to and that the letter had gone astray each one also thought she knew that ingeborg had not got the letter and would not come but each one except mrs bawn was helped to cover up her shock by being sure the others did not know of it and the custom of life lying heavy on them they were able after one little start on first seeing herr dremmel to drift into the corners of the room and pretend that what they had come for was books except mrs bawn mrs bawn saw stared turned on her heel and went out again volcanically and the corridor shook to her departing footsteps and to the angry unintentional rhymes she was making aloud with words like hoax and jokes with astonishment and disgust herr dremmel saw the seven ladies accumulate it was most unfortunate that on that morning of all mornings the small salon so invariably empty should be visited his inexperienced mind did not connect their appearance with his letters it never occurred to him that his reasoning as to what they would do on receiving them could possibly be wrong nor did he as he watched the door open and shut seven times and seven times admit the wrong woman guess that their presence if ingeborg came would immensely help his betrothal the ladies fingering dusty tauchnitzes and magazines and eyeing the table in the window with heads as much averted as could be combined with the seeing of it gradually found the shock they had had being soothed by the interest they felt in what herr dremmel would do when he realized that that unladylike miss bullivant all unaware of what was waiting for her was not coming now that they were there they might as well stay and see the end of it it was really very interesting in its way so german so unlike thank goodness what english people ever did would he stand there all day they wondered with that really most improperly suggestive cake so very like a christening cake one or two of them sat down squarely on the sofas behind 
months-old magazines round whose edges they peeped making it clear to the unhappy man that they at least intended to stay there and they all coughed a little every now and then in the way a waiting congregation coughs in church then the door was pushed open with the jerk of somebody who is either in a hurry or has come to a sudden determination and who should appear but miss boulevant a thrill ran through the seven ladies and they instantly became behind their magazines stiff with excitement chance what a chance she had chanced to look in it was like a play dear me thought each of the seven and ingeborg who believed as lately as the last moment on the doormat outside that she had only come in order to tell herr dremmel she was not coming when she saw the cake very white and bridal on a white cloth with white flowers in pots round it and on either side of it a bottle with a white ribbon round its neck and on the other for the sake of symmetry two glasses was staggered how could she who so much loved to please to make happy cruelly hurt him spoil his little feast wipe out the glow the immense relief that beamed from his face when he saw her she turned round quickly realizing the presence of the seven ladies amazed she stared at them mechanically counting them how could she make him ridiculous humiliate him before all those women hesitating torn poised on the tip of flight she stood there her hand was on the door to open it again and run but Herr Dremmel's simplicity came to his help more effectually than the cunningest plans. He forgot the ladies, and, stepping forward, took her hand in his, and quite simply kissed her forehead, sealing her then and there, with the perfect frankness of his countrymen when engaged in legitimate courtship as his betrothed. He then slipped a ring he wore on his little finger onto her thumb that being the only bit of her hand he could find that it would stay on and he being free from prejudices in the matter of fingers and the thing at least so he supposed was done ingeborg in her bewilderment let these things happen to her her thoughts as she stood being betrothed were jerking themselves into a perfect tangle of knots. She was astonished at the tricks life stoops to. A cake and the eyes of seven women. Her whole future being decided by a cake and the eyes of seven women. Oh, no, it couldn't be. It was only that she couldn't stop now. Impossible utterly to stop now. She had never dreamt she wouldn't find him alone these women were all witnesses he had kissed her before them all his methods were really overwhelming suppose her father could see her but the kiss had been administered very ceremoniously it had been quite cooling such as one as even a bishop might feel justified in applying to the brow of a sick person or a young child later at a more convenient time when the pathetic cake was out of sight, when these women were out of earshot, she would tell him she hadn't meant. Amazingly, she found herself advancing towards the cake with Herr Dremmel, and standing in front of it with him hand in hand. Oh, the mischief people got into who came up to London to dentists! She now saw what provincial dentists were for. They kept you in pain, and pain kept you out of mischief. For the first time she understood what her spirit had till then refused to accept, the teaching so popular with the bishop that pain was a necessary part of the scheme of things. Of course, you were safe so long as you were in pain. In that condition, the very nearest you could get to the most seductive 
temptation was to glance at it palely with a sick taste. And you stayed at home, and were grateful for kindnesses. It was only when you hadn't anything the matter with you that you ran away from your family, and went to Lucerne, and took up with a strange man, positively to the extent of letting him promise to marry you. Somebody coughed so close behind her that it made her jump. She turned round nervously, Herr Dremmel still holding her hand, and beheld the seven ladies flocked about her for all the world like seven bridesmaids. They had hastily consulted together in whispers while she was being led away to the cake as to whether they ought not to congratulate her. Their hearts were touched by the respectful ceremony with which Herr Dremmel had conducted his betrothal. It had had the solemn finality of a marriage, and what woman can look on at a marriage unmoved? They had agreed in whispers that this was one of those moments in which one lets bygones be bygones. The two at the altar, they meant at the cake, had no doubt said many terrible and vulgar tillings, and had behaved in a way no lady and gentleman would, the girl, for instance, openly admitting she had run away from home. But what they were doing now, at least, was beyond reproach, and by uniting, two blacks were, after all, in spite of what people said about it, not being possible, going to make one white. At any rate, it was charitable to hope so. So they cleared their throats, and wished her joy. Thank you, said Ingeborg, a little faintly, looking from one to the other. It's so kind of you, but... Then they shook hands with Herr Drummel, and said they were sure they wished him joy, too, and he thanked them with propriety and bows. Such a thing has never happened on a dance tour before. Oh, no, never before at all, I'm sure, said the most elderly lady nervously with a number of nods. There isn't time enough. That's what I sometimes think, said the young lady who had hurried her companion away to the sunset the evening before. What's a week? And she stared at the cake and frowned. Dents had a funeral once, said a square small lady, who kept her hands plunged in the pockets of a grey jersey. Now, Miss Jukes, really, protested the elderly lady, one doesn't mention. Well, it wasn't their fault, Miss Andrews. They didn't want to have it, I'm sure. It was a gentleman from Gypsy Hill. What a beautiful, um, cake, hastily interrupted the elderly lady. Funny thing, I sometimes think, continued Miss Jukes, to go for a holiday and die instead. Those silver leaves, said the elderly lady, raising her voice, I call them dainty. It's like a wedding cake, isn't it? said the young lady of the sunset, peering close at it with a face of gloom. Will you not, Ingeborg, said Herr Dremmel, calling her for the first time by her name, cut the cake, and perhaps these ladies will do us the honor of tasting it. She did not recognize him in this persistent ceremoniousness. Every trace of his usual lax behavior was gone, his ease and familiarity of speech, and he was as stiff and correct and grave as if he were laying a foundation stone or opening a museum. They were the manners, though she did not know it, which all Germans are trained to produce on public occasions. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're really very kind. Oh, thank you very much, I'm sure. There was a murmur of awkward and reluctant thanks. The seven ladies were not at all certain that their cordiality ought to stretch as far as cake. They had been moved by an impulse that did honor to their womanliness to offer congratulations, but they did not for all that forget the dreadful things the couple had constantly been heard talking about, and the many clear proofs it had provided that it was what 
dense tours were accustomed to describe as no class and though they all liked cake and were getting steadily hungrier as the dent week drew to its close they were doubtful as to the social wisdom of eating it it would be very unpleasant if these people encouraged were later on to presume if they were to try to use the eaten cake as a weapon for forcing their way into english society if in a word when the tour got back to england they were to want to call so they took the cake reluctantly that ingeborg in a sort of dream cut and offered them and with even more reluctance they sipped the wine in which the german gentleman requested them to drink the newly betrothed couple's health but said ingeborg trying to rouse herself even at this eleventh hour true there are not enough glasses i will ring for more was the way herr dremmel finished her sentence for her the immense official promptness of him she felt numbed and when the glasses were brought there was another ceremony a clinking of herr dremmel's glass with each glass in turn his heels together as in the days of his soldiering his body stiff and his face a miracle of solemnity and before drinking he made a speech the asti held high in front of him in which he thanked the ladies for their good wishes on behalf of his betrothed miss ingeborg boulevant whose virtues he dwelt upon singly and at length in resounding periods before proceeding to assure those present of his firm resolve to prove by the devotion of the rest of his life the extremity of his gratitude for the striking proof she had given before them all of her confidence in him and every sentence seemed to set another and heavier seal on her as a creature undoubtedly bound to marry him dimly she began to realize something of the steely grip of a german engagement she wondered whether there were any more room left on her forehead for further seals she felt that it must be covered with great red things scrawled over with the inscription dremmels well she was after all not a parcel to be picked up and carried away by the first person who found her lying about and the minute she was alone with him she would she must tell him that what she had really come down for though appearances were certainly by this time rather against her was to refuse him she would be as gentle as possible but she would be plain and firm the minute these women left them alone she would tell him with a start she saw that the women were leaving them alone and that the minute had come she wanted them not to go she wanted to keep them there at any cost she even made a step after them as the last one nodding to the end went out and shut the door but herr dremmel still had hold of her hand when the door had finally shut she turned to him quickly her head was thrown back her eyes were full of a screwed-up courage but you know she began determined to clear things up however much it might hurt them both and again he promptly finished her sentence for her this time by enfolding her in his arms and kissing her with a largeness and abundance which no bishop her mind flashed as her body stood stiff with surprise and horror could possibly approve she felt engulfed she felt she must be disappearing altogether he seemed infinitely capacious and soft oh but i can't i won't oh stop oh stop it's a mistake she tried to get out of his grasps my little wife was all the notice herr dremmel took of that 
End of section 2「Section 3 of The Pastor's Wife」by Elizabeth von Arnim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 3. Chapter 7. It was raining at Redchester when Ingeborg got out at the station a week and a day after she left it. The soft, persistent, fine rain, hardly more than a mist, peculiar to that much-soaked corner of England. The lawns in the garden she passed as her fly crawled up the hill were incredibly green. The leaves of the lilac bushes glistened with wet. Each tulip was a cup of water. The roads were chocolate. And a thick grey blanket of cloud hung warm over the town, tucking it in all round and keeping out any draught that might bite and sting the inhabitants, she thought, into real living. The porter told her it was fine growing weather, and she wondered stupidly why, after the years she had had of the sort of thing, she had had not grown, then, more thoroughly herself. A retired colonel she knew, she knew all the retired colonels, waved his umbrella, and shouted a genial inquiry after her toothache and she looked at him with a dead, ungrateful eye. A passing postman touched his cap, and she turned the other way. The same sensible female figures she had seen all her life draped in the same sensible Macintoshes bowed and smiled, and she pretended she hadn't seen them. Everybody, in fact, behaved as though she were still good, which was distressing embarrassing, and productive of an overwhelming desire to shut her eyes and hide. There were the shops, with things in the windows unchanged since she left nine days ago, the same ancient novelties nobody ever bought, the same flies creeping over the same buns. There was the bookseller her Christian year had come from, his windows full of more of them, endless supplies of endless dieted daughters, vegetarians in literature, she called them to herself, forcibly vegetabled vegetarians. And there was the silversmith, who provided the bishop with the crosses, after a good Florentine fifteenth-century pattern he presented to those of his confirmation candidates, who were the daughters in the diocese of the Great. The Duke's daughter had one. The Lord Lieutenant's daughter had one. On this principle Ingeborg herself had been given one, and wore it continually night and day, as her father expected, under her dress, where it bruised her. It was pleasant to her father to be able to recollect in the stress and dust of much in his work that was unrefreshing, how there was a yearly increasing, though severely sifted, number of gentle virgin blouses belonging to the best families beneath which lay and rhythmically heaved this silver reminder of the wearer's bishop and of her god. Father, Ingeborg said, after she had worn hers for a week, may I take my cross off at night? Why, Ingeborg, he had inquired, adding quietly, Did our Saviour? No, but you see when one turns round in one's sleep it sticks into one. Sticks, Ingeborg? The bishop said gently, raising his eyebrows at such an expression applied to such an object. Yes, and I am getting awfully bruised. She was still in the schoolroom and still saying awfully, by his stripes we are healed, said the bishop, shutting up the conversation as one shuts up a book. In spite of the wet warmth, she shivered, as the silversmith's window reminded her of this. 
It had happened years ago, but even farther back, as far back as she could remember, every time she had asked leave of her father to do anything, it had been refused, and refused with bits of Bible, which were so peculiarly silencing. And now here she was about to face him covered with the leaves she had not asked for at all, but had so tremendously taken, and going to ask the most tremendous one of all, the leave to marry Herr Dremmel. For that was how the last two days of her dense tour had been spent, in being openly engaged to Herr Dremmel. She had found her attempts to explain that she was not so really availed nothing against his conviction that she was and public opinion the public opinion of the whole tour also never doubted but that she was had not seven of its most reliable members actually seen her in the act of becoming it in fact it not only did not doubt it, it was sternly determined that she should be engaged whether she liked it or not. It was the least, the tour felt, that she could do, so that there was nothing for it now but to face the bishop. She felt cold. No amount of the familiar moist stuffiness could warm her. Vainly she tried to sit up, to be proud and brave, to recapture something at least of the courage that had seemed so easy just at the end in Switzerland with Herr Dremmel to laugh at her doubts. Her head would droop, and her hands and feet were like stones. It was the place, the place, she thought, the hypnotic effect of it, of her old environment, the whole of Redchester, was heavy with recollections of past obediences. Not once had she ever in Redchester even dreamt of rebellion. She had questioned laterally, in the remoter and less filial corners of her heart, but she had never so much as thought of rebellion, and the moment she got away out of sight and hearing of home, things she knew here were wicked had appeared to be quite good and extremely natural. How strange that was! And how strange that now she was back everything was beginning to seem wicked again. What was a poor wretch to do, she asked herself with sudden passion, confronted by these shuffling standards that behaved as if they were dancing a quadrille? This was the place in which for years her conscience had been cockered to size and delicacy, and though it had become temporarily tough in Herr Dremmel's company, she felt it relapsing with every turn of the wheels more and more into its ancient softness. Yes, she undoubtedly, conscience-stricken and frightened or not, had to tell her father what she had done. She had got to be brave, and, if needs be, she had got to defy. She was bound to Herr Dremmel. He had only gone home to set his house in order, and then he announced, she meanwhile, having prepared the bishop, he was coming to Redchester to marry her. Prepared the bishop! She shivered. Herr Dremmel had tried to marry her in Lucerne. But the Swiss, it seemed, would not be hurried, so that here she was, and within the next few hours she was going to have to prepare the bishop. She shut her eyes and thought of Herr Dremmel, of Robert, as she was learning to call him. With all her heart she liked him, and he had been so kind when he found she really disliked being engulfed in embraces, and had restricted his exhibitions of affection to the kissing of her hand, telling her he could very well wait till later on, sure that she would after marriage warm, as he had explained to her on the Rigi all women did, to a just appreciation of the value of the caresses 
of an honest man. He had also produced a number of German love names from some hitherto fallow corner of his mind, and garnished his conversation with them in a way that made her who, nourished as she had been on the noble language of the Bible and the prayer book, was instantly responsive to the charm of words, laugh and glow with pleasure. She was his little heart, his little tiny treasure, his little sugar lamb, a dozen little sweet diminished German things translated straight away, just as they were into English. The freshness of it, the freshness of being admired and petted after the economies of these directions practised in her home and his ring at that very moment dangled beneath her dress on the same chain as her father's cross yes she was bound to him duty she perceived could be a very blessed thing sometimes if it protected one from some other duty it was herr dremmel now who had become her duty she put up her hand to get courage by feeling the ring, for her spirit was fainting within her. She had just caught sight of the cathedral. The ring had been slung on the chain alongside the confirmation cross, because it was impossible to wear it on her thumb. And out there in Switzerland, where one was simple, it had seemed a most natural and obvious place to put it yet now as the fly rattled over the cobbles of the close and the familiar cathedral rose before her like a menace she hung her head and greatly doubted but what the juxtaposition was wicked nobody was on the doorstep when she arrived beneath the great cedar that spread its shade an intensified bit of dripping gloom where all was gloom and dripping across from the lawn to the palace's entrance except the butler whose black clothes struck her instantly as very neat and smooth and his underling a youth kept carefully a little on the side of a suitable episcopal shabbiness she had telegraphed her train from paddington but that, of course, was no reason why anyone should be on the doorstep. It was she whose business lay with doorsteps. When people arrived or left, she was the one who welcomed and who sped, and since she could not welcome herself, there was nobody there to do it. She stole a nervous look at Wilson as he helped her out, but his face was a blank. The boy on her other side had an expression, she thought, as though under happier conditions he might have let himself go in a smirk, and she turned her eyes away with a little sick feeling. Did they know already, all of them, that she had left her aunts a week ago? But, indeed, that seemed a small thing now compared with the things she had done since. I'm a dead girl, thought Ingeborg, as she passed beneath her parents' porch. The servants brought in her luggage, off which in her newness at deceit she had not thought to scrape the continental labels, and she crossed the hall, treading on the dim splashes of lovely blurred color that fell from the vast stained-glass windows onto the stone flags of its floor. It was the noblest hall, as bare of stuffs and carpets as the cathedral itself, and she looked more than insignificant going across it to the carved oak door that opened into the wide panelled passage leading to the drawing-room, a little figure braced to a miserable courage, the smallest thing to be going to defy powers of which this magnificence was only one of the expressions. Her mother was as usual on her sofa near a fire whose heat that warm day was mitigated by the windows being wide open. 
Beside her was her own particular table with the usual flowers, needlework, devotional books, and biographies of good men. It was difficult to believe her mother had got off that sofa nine times to go to bed, had dressed and undressed, and had meals, thirty-six of them, counted Ingeborg mechanically, while she looked about for the bishop. If you excluded the before breakfast tea, forty-five if you didn't, since she saw her last. So immovable did she appear, so exactly in the same position and composed into the same lines as she had been nine days before. The room was full of the singing of thrushes, quite deafeningly full, as she opened the door, for the windows gave straight into the green and soppy garden, and it was a day of many worms. Judith was making tea as far away from the fire as she could get, and there was no sign of the bishop. "'Is that you, Ingeborg?' said her mother, turning her face, grown pale with years of being shut up to the door. Ingeborg's mother had found the sofa as other people find salvation. She was not ill. She had simply discovered in it a refuge and a very present help in all the troubles and turmoil of life, and in a special a shield and buckler when it came to dealing with the bishop. It is not easy for the married, she had found, when first casting about for one, to hit on a refuge from each other that shall be honourable to both. In a moment of insight she perceived the sofa. Here was a blameless object that would separate her entirely from duties and responsibilities of every sort. It was respectable. It was unassailably effective. It was not included in the commandments. All she had to do was to cling to it, and nobody could make her do or be anything. She accordingly got on to it, and had stayed there ever since, mysteriously frail, an object of solicitude and sympathy, a being before whose helplessness the most aggressive or aggrieved husband must needs be helpless too. And she had gradually acquired the sofa look, and was now very definitely a slightly plaintive but persistently patient Christian lady. "'Is that you, Ingeborg?' she said, turning her head. "'Yes, mother,' said Ingeborg, hesitating in spite of herself on the threshold. She looked round anxiously, but the bishop was not lurking anywhere in the big room. "'Come in, dear, and shut the door. You see the windows are open.' Judith glanced up at her a moment from her tea-making, and did not move. Even in the midst of her terrors, Ingeborg was astonished, after not having seen it for a while, at her loveliness. She seemed to have taken the sodden greys of the afternoon, the dullness and the gathering dusk, and made out of their gloom the one perfect background for her beauty. "'We thought you would have written,' said Mrs. Bullivant putting her cheek in a position convenient for the kiss that was to be applied to it. "'I I telegraphed,' said Ingeborg, applying the kiss. "'Yes, dear, but only about your train. I thought that was enough.' "'But, Ingeborg, dear, such a great occasion, one of the great occasions of life. We did expect a little notice, didn't we, Judith?' "'Notice,' said Ingeborg, faintly. "'Your father was wounded, dear. "'He thought it showed so little real love for your parents and your sister. "'But,' said Ingeborg, looking from one to the other, "'we wrote to you at once, directly we knew, didn't we, Judith?' "'Of course,' said Judith. 
Ingeborg stood flushing and turning pale. Had one of the dense tours people somehow found out where she lived and written about her engagement and the impossible had happened and they weren't going to mind? Was it possible? Did they know? And were taking it like this? If only she had called at her aunt's house on the way to Paddington and got the letters what miserable hours of terror she would have been spared but she began then the immense relief of it suddenly flooded her whole being with a delicious warm softness they did know somehow and a miracle had happened oh how kind god was she dropped on her knees by the sofa and began to kiss her mother's hand which surprised mrs bullivant and indeed it is a foreign trick picked up mostly by those who go abroad mother she said are you really pleased about it you don't mind then mind said mrs bullivant oh how glad how glad i am and father what does he say does he does he mind mind repeated mrs bullivant father is very pleased i think said judith with what in one less lovely would have been a slight pursing of the lips and she twisted a remarkable diamond ring she was wearing straight father is pleased echoed ingeborg quite awestruck by the amount and quality of these reliefs i must say i think it is really good of your dear father to be pleased when he loses began mrs bullivant oh yes yes interrupted the overcome ingeborg it's a wonder a wonder of god ingeborg dear her mother gently rebuked for this was excess and judith looked still more what would have been a little pursed in any other woman when he loses then resumed mrs bullivant with the plaintive determination of one who considers it the least she may expect as a sofa-ridden mother to be allowed to finish her sentences so much yes yes assented ingeborg eagerly whose appreciation of her parents attitude was so warm that she almost felt she must stay and bask in its urbanity for ever and not go away after all to the bleak distance of east prussia your father loses not only a daughter continued mrs bullivant but five hundred pound a year of his income would one call it his income inquired judith politely but yet if one could suspect a being with an angel's face of such a thing with some slight annoyance i thought our grandmother judith dear the five hundred pound a year your grandmother left to each of you was only to be yours when you married explained mrs bullivant also with some slight annoyance beneath her patience till you married it was to be mine your father's i mean of course and if you never did marry it would have been mine i mean his always ingeborg had heard of her swedish grandmother's will but had long ago forgotten it marriage being remote and money never of any interest to her who had no occasions for spending now her heart bounded with yet more thankfulness what a comfort it would be to robert how it would help him in his research extraordinary that she should have forgotten it when he told her of his stipend of five thousand marks two hundred fifty pound it was in english money he explained and there was the house and land free most of which went in his experiments but what was left being ample he said for the living purposes of reasonable beings if they approached it in a proper spirit it all depending he said on whether they approached it in a proper spirit 
and after all he had added triumphantly throwing out his chest just as she was about to inquire what the proper spirit was no man can call me thin to think she had forgotten the substantial help she was going to be able to bring him the full splendour of her father's generosity in being pleased at her engagement was now revealed to her the relief of it the glad warm relief so must one feel who is born again all new all clean from old mistakes and fears she felt lifted up extraordinarily happy extraordinarily good more in harmony with providence and the bible than she had been since childhood she would have been willing and indeed found it perfectly natural to kneel down with a mother and judith then and there and say prayers together out loud she would have been willing on the crest of her wave of gratefulness quite readily to give up herr dremmel in return for the family's immense kindness in not asking her to give him up she had felt nothing like this exultation before in her life this complete being in harmony with the infinite this confidence in the inherent goodness of things except on the afternoon her tooth was pulled out oh she exclaimed laying her cheek on her mother's hand oh i do hope you'll like robert robert said mrs bullivant and at the tea-table there was a sudden silence among the cups as though they were holding their breath his name's robert said ingeborg still with a cheek on her mother's hand her eyes shut her face a vision of snuggest safest contentment what robert ingeborg inquired mrs bullivant shifting her position to stare down more conveniently at her daughter herr dremmel it's his christian name he's got to have one you know said ingeborg still with her eyes shut in the blissfulness of perfect confidence herr who said mrs bullivant a sharper note of life in her voice than there had been for years here's your father she added quickly hastily composing herself into the lines of the unassailable invalid again as the door opened and the bishop came in ingeborg jumped up oh father she cried running to him with the entire want of shyness one may conceive in the newly washed and forgiven soul when it first arrives in heaven and meets its maker and knows there are going to be no more misunderstandings forever how good you've been and she kissed him so fervently in a room gone so silent that the kiss sounded quite loud the bishop was nettled was he then at any time not good his daughter's excessive gratitude really almost noisy gratitude for what after all had been inevitable the permission to go up to london and place herself in the hands of a dentist suggested that humaneness on his part came to her as a surprise he did feel he had been good to let her go but he also felt he would have been not good if he had not let her go certainly redchester opinion would have condemned him as cruel even if he himself who knew all the circumstances was not able to think so what had really been cruel was the terrible muddle his papers and letters had gotten into owing to her prolonged absence grave dislocations had taken place in the joints of his engagements several with far-reaching results and all because he could not help feeling ingeborg in spite of precept and example did not in her earlier years use her toothbrush with regularity and conscientiousness manifestly she did not or how could she have needed nine enormous days to be set in repair he himself who regarded his body as a holy temple which was the one solution of the body question that at all approached satisfactoriness and had accordingly brushed his teeth 
from the point of view of their being pillars of a sacred edifice after every meal for forty years had never had a toothache in his life let us hope now ingeborg he said reflecting on the instance she had provided of the modern inversion of the mosaic law which visited the sins of the fathers on the children the original arrangement of bishop felt being considerably healthier and gently putting her away in order to go over to the tea-table where he stood holding out his hand for the cup judith hastened to place in it let us now hope now you have had your lesson that in future you will remember cleanliness is next to godliness and this seemed to ingeborg an answer so surprising that she could only stare at him with her mouth fallen a little open there where he had left her in the middle of the carpet but the bishop had not done he went on to say another thing that surprised her still more nay smote her cold shook her to her foundations he said after a pause during which the silence in the room was remarkable his back turned to her while at the tea-table he carefully selected the particular piece of bread and butter he intended to eat and pray ingeborg why did you not write the moment you heard from us and congratulate your sister on her engagement chapter eight ingeborg was dumb her father's question was like a blow shocking her back to consciousness the warm dream that all was well that she was understood that there was love and kindliness for her at home after all and welcome and encouragement the warm feeling of stretching herself in her family's kind lap confident that it would hold her up and not spill her out onto the floor was gone in a flash she was hit awake hit out of her brief delicious sleep her family had not got a lap but it had an entirely unprepared mind and into that unprepared mind she had tumbled the name of dremel judith engaged she stammered faintly on the bishop's wheeling round cup in hand to examine into the cause of her prolonged silence your incredulity is not very flattering to your sister he said and judith's eyelashes as she concentrated her gaze on the teapot were alone sufficiently lovely the curved dusky golden soft things to make incredulity simply silly mrs bullivant avoided all speech and clung to her sofa it's so sudden faltered ingeborg much may happen in a week said the bishop yes murmured ingeborg who knew that terribly too you never can tell what a day may bring forth said the bishop and ingeborg deeply convinced drooped her head acquiescent no man began the bishop habit being strong within him knoweth the hour when the bridegroom but he stopped recollecting that ingeborg was not engaged and therefore could not with propriety be talked to of bridegrooms instead he inquired again why she had not written and eyeing her searchingly asked himself if it were possible that a child of his could be base enough to envy i didn't get the letters said ingeborg her head drooping you did not that is very strange your mother wrote at once let me see it was on friday it happened it was friday was it not judith you ought to know judith blushed obediently and to-day is tuesday ample time ample time my dear he said turning to his wife who at once twitched into a condition of yet further relaxed defencelessness do you think it possible your letter was not posted quite herbert murmured mrs bullivant closing her eyes and endeavouring to imagine herself unconscious 
Ah, then that's it, that's it. Wilson is growing careless. This last week there have been repeated negligences. You will make inquiries, Ingeborg, and tell him what I have said. Yes, father. And you will discharge him if he goes on like this. Yes, father. Unfaithful servant, unfaithful servant. He that is unfaithful in a few things, the bishop, frowning at it, took a second piece of bread and butter, and went over to the hearthrug, where he stood from force of habit, in spite of the warmth of the day, drinking his tea, and becoming vaguely and increasingly irritated by the action of the fire behind him. Then he said, looking at Ingeborg, you know nothing about it. She shook her head. She was the oddest figure in the middle of the splendid old room, travel-stained, untidy, her face white with fatigue, her hat crooked. Judith glanced at her every now and then, but it was impossible at any time to tell what the delicate white rose at the tea-table was thinking. So impossible that the young men who clustered round her like bees when they first saw her gave it up and went on presently to more communicative flowers. The local duchess had hoped her firstborn would marry him, a creature so lovely, so entirely respectable, with that knight's bishop for a father, and so happily adapted in the perfection of her proportions for the successful production of further dukes, and she pointed out various aspects of the girl's exquisiteness to her son, and told him he would have the most beautiful wife in England. But the young man, after a reproachful look at his mother, for supposing he could have missed noticing even the humblest approach to a pretty woman, let alone Judith Bullivant, said he didn't want to marry a picture, but something that was alive, and anyhow, something that talked. She's right enough, of course, he remarked, and I like looking at her. I'd be blind if I didn't, but Lord, dull? The girl hasn't got a word to say for herself. I never met any woman who looked so ripping, and then somehow wasn't. She won't talk, she won't talk, he almost wailed. She ain't got the remotest resemblance to anything approaching kick in her. You might end by being thankful for that, said his mother. He would not, however, be persuaded, and went his way, and married, as the Duchess had feared, a young lady from the halls, a young lady nimble, not only of toes, but of wits, nimble, that is to say, as he proudly pointed out to his mother, at both ends, with whom he lived in great contentment, for she amused him, which is much. "'I have not observed you offer any congratulations, Ingeborg,' said the bishop, becoming more and more displeased by her strange behaviour, and not at all liking her crumpled and forlorn appearance. He again thought of envy, but that alone could not crumple clothes. And yet your sister, he said, getting a little further away from the fire, which had begun to scorch him unpleasantly, is to be the wife of the master. The master, repeated Ingeborg stupidly, for a moment her tormented brain supposed Judith must be going to be a nun. There is only one master, said the bishop, in his stateliest manner. Everyone knows that. The master of Ananias. Ingeborg knew this was a great thing. The master of Ananias, the most celebrated of Oxford colleges, was in every way, except perhaps that of age, desirable. But what was age when it came to all the other desirabilities? Her father had rebuked her once for speaking of him as old Dr. Abbott, and had informed her that the master was only sixty, and that everybody was sixty, that is, said the bishop, everybody of any sense. He was not a widower, he was pleasant to look at in his shaven iron-grey way, he was 
brilliantly erudite and extremely well off apart from his handsome salary one of the handsomest salaries in the gift of the crown several years before when judith was still invisible in a pinafore he had stayed at the palace it was then ingeborg spoke of him as old and had been treated by her father with every attention and respect he had on that occasion seemed glad to go now it appeared he had been again and must have fallen immediately and overwhelmingly in love with judith for his short visit to bridge the distance between a first acquaintance and an engagement who however knew better than herself how quickly such distances can be bridged she wanted to go and kiss judith and say sweet things to her but her feet seemed unable to move she wanted to congratulate everybody with all her heart if only they would be kind and congratulate her a little too for judith had heard what she said before her father came in and her mother had heard it and the room was heavy with the uttered name of dremel she looked round at them her father waiting for her to show at least ordinary decency and feeling judith so safe in the family's approval so entirely clear from hidden things her mother lying with closed eyes and expressionless face and she suddenly felt intolerably alone oh oh she cried holding out her hands doesn't anybody love me this was worse than her toothache her family had endured much during those days but at least there was a reason then for the odder parts of her behavior now they were called upon to endure the distressing spectacle of a hitherto reserved relative letting herself go to unbridledness ingeborg was going to make a scene and a scene was a thing that had never yet anyhow not during the entire bullivant period been made in that house mrs bullivant shut her eyes tighter and tried to think she was not there at all judith turned red and again became absorbed in the teapot the bishop after the first cold shock natural to a person called upon to contemplate nakedness where up to then there had been clothes put down his cup on the nearest table and with an exaggerated calm stared they all felt intensely uncomfortable as uncomfortable as though she had begun in the middle of the drawing-room to remove her garments one by one and cast them from her this is very sad ingeborg said the bishop isn't it oh isn't it was her unexpected answer tears in her eyes she was so tired so frightened she had been travelling hard since the morning of the day before she had had nothing to eat for a time that seemed infinite and yet this was the moment just because she had betrayed herself to her mother and judith in which she was going to have to tell her father what she had done it is the most distressing example said the bishop i have ever seen of that basest of sins envy envy said ingeborg oh no that's not what it is oh if it were only that and i do congratulate judith judith i do i do my dear but father i have been doing it too it was out now and she looked at him with miserable eyes prepared for the worst doing what ingeborg i'm engaged too engaged my dear ingeborg the bishop was alarmed for her sanity she really looked very strange had they been giving her too much gas his tone became careful and humouring how can you he said quietly have become engaged in these few days much may happen in a week said ingeborg it jumped out 
She did try not to say it. She was unnerved. And always when she was unnerved she said the first thing that came into her head. And always it was either unfortunate or devastating. The bishop became encased in ice. This was not hysteria. It was something immeasurably worse. Be so good as to explain, he said sharply and waves of icy air seemed to issue from where he stood and heave through the room. "'I'm engaged to somebody called Dremel,' said Ingeborg. "'I do not know the name. Do you, Marion?' "'No, oh, oh, no,' breathed Mrs. Bullivant, her eyes shut. "'Robert Dremel,' said Ingeborg. "'Who are the Dremels, Ingeborg? "'There aren't any.' there aren't any i never heard of any she said twisting her fingers together we usedn't to talk about about things like more dremels what is this man a clergyman oh where is he living in east prussia in where ingeborg east prussia it it's a place abroad thank you I am aware of that. My education reaches as far as and includes East Prussia. Mrs. Bullivant began to cry, not loud, but tears that stole quietly down her face from beneath her closed eyelids. She did not do anything to them, but lay with her hands clasped on her breast and let them steal. What was the use of being a Christian? if one were exposed to these scenes. Pray, why is he in East Prussia? asked the bishop. He belongs there. Again, the room seemed for an instant to hold its breath. Am I to understand that he is a German? Please, father. A German pastor? Yes, father. Not by any chance attached in some ecclesiastical capacity to the Kaiser. No, father. There was a pause. Your aunt, what did she say to this? She didn't say anything. She wasn't there. I beg your pardon? I haven't been at my aunt's. Judith, my dear, will you kindly leave the room? Judith got up and went while she was crossing to the door, and until she had shut it behind her there was silence. Now, said the bishop, Judith being safely out of harm's way, you will have the goodness to explain exactly what you have been doing. I think I wish to go to bed, murmured Mrs. Bullivant, without changing her attitude or opening her eyes. Will someone please ring for Richards to come and take me to bed? But neither the bishop nor Ingeborg heeded her. I didn't mean to do anything, father, began Ingeborg. Then she broke off and said, I can explain better if I sit down, and dropped into the chair nearest to her, for her knees felt very odd. She saw her father now only through a mist. She was going to have to oppose him for the first time in her life, and her nature was one which acquiesced and did not oppose. In her wretchedness a doubt stole across her mind as to whether Herr Dremmel was worth this, was anything, in fact, worth fighting about, and with one's father, and against one's whole bringing up. Was she going to be strong enough? Was it a thing one ought to be strong about? Would not true strength rather lie in a calm continuation of life at home? What, when one came to think of it, was East Prussia really to her? and those rye fields and all that water she wished she had had at least a piece of bread and butter she thought perhaps bread and butter would have helped her not to doubt she looked round vaguely so as not to have to meet her father's eye for a moment and her glance fell on the tea-table i think she said faintly getting up i'll have some tea to the bishop this seemed outrageous. He watched her in a condition of icy indignation, such as he had not yet in his life experienced. His daughter, his daughter for whom he had done so much. 
the daughter he had trained for years, sparing no pains, to be a helpful, efficient Christian woman. The daughter he had honored with his trust, letting her share in the most private portions of his daily business. Not a letter had he received that she had not seen and been allowed to answer. Not a step in any direction had he taken without permitting her to make the necessary arrangements. Seldom, he supposed bitterly, had a child received so much of a father's confidence, his daughter, that crumpled and disreputable yes now he knew what was the matter with her appearance disreputable looking figure cynically pouring itself out tea while he her father whom she had been deceiving was left to wait for her explanations until such time as she should have sated her appetite positively she had succeeded he said to himself bitterly enraged that he should be forced to be bitterly enraged in making him feel less like a bishop should feel than he had done since he was a boy it's because i've had nothing to eat since paris ingeborg explained apologetically holding the teapot in both hands because one by itself shook too much and feeling, too, that the moment was not exactly one for tea. The bishop started. Since where? he said. Paris, said Ingeborg, adding tremulously, having quite lost her nerve, and only desiring to fill up the silence. It, it's a place abroad. Mrs. Bullivant murmured a more definitely earnest request that Richards might be rung for to take her to bed. Ingeborg, said the bishop in a voice she did not know. Paris? Yes, father. Last night. Ingeborg, come here. He was pointing to a chair, a yard or two from the hearth rug, on which he stood, and his voice was very strange. She put down the cup with a shaking hand and went to him. Her heart was in her mouth. What have you been doing? he said. I told you, father. I'm engaged to her. How did you get to Paris by train? Will you answer me? What were you doing in Paris? Having dinner? She was terrified. Her father was talking quite loud. She had never in her life seen him like this. She answered his questions quickly, her heart leaping as he rapped them out. But her answers seemed to make him still angrier. If only he would let her explain, hear her out. But he hurled questions at her, giving her no time at all. Father, she said hurriedly, seeing that after that last answer of hers, he did for a moment say nothing, but stood looking at her very extraordinarily. Please let me tell you how it all happened. It won't take a minute. It won't really. And then you see, you'll know. I didn't mean to do anything, I really didn't, but the dentist pulled my tooth out so quickly that very first day, and so instead of coming home I went to Lucerne. To, yes, she nodded, in a frenzy of haste to get it all said, to Lucerne. I couldn't tell you why, but I did. I seemed pushed there, and after a while, while I got engaged, and I didn't in the least mean to do that, either. Really, I didn't. But somehow, was there any use trying to tell him about the white and silver cake and the seven witnesses and the undoubting kind Herr Dremmel and all the endless small links in the chain? Would he ever, ever understand? Somehow I did, you see, she added helplessly, looking up at him with eyes full of an appeal for comprehension, for mercy. One thing leads to another. And as he still said nothing, she added even more helplessly, Herr Dremmel sat opposite me in the train. You picked him up casually, like any servant girl in a train. He was one of the party. He was there from the beginning. Oh, yes, I forgot to tell you. It was one of Dent's tours. You went on a Dent's tour, yes, and he was one of it, 
too, and we all, of course, always went about together, rather like a school, two and two, I suppose because of the pavement, she said, now saying in her terror anything that came into her head. And as he was the other one of my two, the half of the couple I was the other one of, you know, father, we... we got engaged. Do you take me for a fool? was the bishop's comment. Ingeborg's heart stood still. How could her father even think? Oh, father, was all she could say to that. And she hung her head in the entire hopelessness, the uselessness of trying to tell him anything. She knew she had been saying it ridiculously, tumbling out a confusion of what must sound sad nonsense. But could he not see she was panic-stricken? Could he not be patient and help her to make her clean breast? I'm stupid, she said, looking up at him through tears, and suddenly dropping into a kind of nakedness of speech, a speech entirely simple and entirely true. Stupid with fright. Do you suggest I terrorize you? inquired the incensed bishop. Yes, she said. This was terrible. It was peculiarly terrible because it made the bishop actually wish he were not a gentleman. Then, indeed, it would be an easy matter to deal with that small defying creature in the chair. When it comes to women, the quickest method is, after all, to be by profession a navvy. He shuddered and hastily drew his thoughts back from this abyss. To what dread depths of naturalness was she not by her conduct dragging him? Father, said Ingeborg, who had now got down to the very bottom of the very worst, a place where once one had reached it, an awful sincerity takes possession of one's tongue. Do you see this? Look at them. And she held up her hands and showed him, while she herself watched them as though they were somebody else's, how they were shaking. Isn't that being afraid? Look at them. It's fear. It's fear of you. It's you making them do that. And think of it. I'm twenty-two. A woman. Oh, I... I'm ashamed. But whether it was proper shame for what she had done, or a shocking shame for her compunctions in sinning, the bishop was not permitted that afternoon to discover, because when she had got as far as that, she was interrupted by being obliged to faint. There was a moment's confusion, while she tumbled out of the chair and lay, a creased, strange object on the floor, owing to Mrs. Boulevant's having produced an exclamation and this to the bishop after years of not having heard her more than murmur was almost as disconcerting as if flinging self-restraint to the winds she had suddenly produced fresh offspring he quickly however recovered the necessary presence of mind and the bell was rung for richards who when she came knelt down and undid ingeborg's travel-worn blouse and something on a long chain fell out jingling it was her father's cross and herr dremmel's ring metallically hitting each other the bishop left the room without a word end of section three Section 4 of The Pastor's Wife by Elizabeth Arnim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 4. Chapter 9. A pall descended on the palace and enveloped it blackly for four awful days, during which Mrs. Boulevant and her daughters, and the chaplain and the secretary and all the servants did not so much live as feel their way about with a careful solicitude for inconspicuousness 
This pall was the pall of the bishop's wrath. There was so much of it that it actually reached over into the dwellings of the dean and chapter and blackened those white spots, and it got into the hitherto calm home of the mayor, who had the misfortune to have business with the bishop the very day after Ingeborg's return and an edge of it, but quite enough to choke an old man, even invaded the cathedral, where it extinguished the head verger, a sunny octogenarian privileged to have his little joke with the bishop, and who had it unfortunately as usual, and was instantly muffled in murkiness, and never joked again. That the bishop should have allowed his private angers to overflow beyond his garden walls, he who had never been anything in public but a pattern in his personal beauty, his lofty calm, and his biblically flavoured eloquence of what the perfect bishop should be, shows the extreme disturbance of his mind. But it was not that he allowed it. It was that he could not help it. He had, thanks to his daughter, lost his self-control, and for that alone, without anything else she had done, he felt he could never forgive her. Self-control gone, and with it self-respect. He ached, he positively ached, during those first four black days in which his natural man was uppermost, a creature he had forgotten. So long was it since he had heard of him thoroughly to shake his daughter, and the terribleness of that in a bishop, the terribleness of being aware that his hands were twitching to shake, hands which he acutely knew should be laid on no one except in blessing, consecrated hands, divinely appointed to bless and then dismiss in peace. That small unimportant thing, that small weak thing, the thing he had generously endowed with the great gift of life, and along with that gift the chance it would never have had except for him of re-entering eternal blessedness, the thing he had fed and clothed, that had eaten out of his hand and been all bright tameness, to bring disgrace on him, disgrace outside before the world, and inside before his abased and humiliated self. And she had brought it not only on a father, but on the best-known bishop on the bench, the best-known also and most frequently mentioned. He had sometimes surmised, with a kind of high humility, in the, how could one put it with sufficient reverence, holy gossip of the angels, for in his highest moods he had humbly dared to believe he was not altogether untalked about in heaven. And here, at the moment of much thankfulness and legitimate pride, when his other daughter was so beautifully betrothed, came this one, and with impish sacrilegiousness dragged him, her father, into the dust of base and furious instincts, the awful dust in which those sad animal men sit who wish to and do beat their women folk. He could not bring himself to speak to her. He would not allow her near him. Whatever her repentance might be, it could never wipe out the memory of these hours of being forced by her to recognize what, after all the years of careful climbing upwards to goodness, he was still really like inside, terrible to be stirred not only to unchristianity but to vulgarity, terrible to be made to wish not only that you were not a Christian but not a gentleman. He, a prince of the church, was desiring to be a navvy for a space during which he could be unconditionally active. He, a prince of the church, was rent and distorted by feelings that would have disgraced a curate. He could never forgive her. But the darkest hours pass, and just as the concerned diocese was beginning to fear 
appendicitis for him, unable in any other way to account for the way he remained invisible, he emerged from his first indignation into a chillier region in which, still much locked in his chamber, he sought an outlet in prayer. A bishop, and indeed any truly good and public man, is restricted in his outlets. He can with propriety have only two, prayer and his wife, and in this case the wife was unavailable because of her sofa. For the first time the bishop definitely resented the sofa. He told himself that the wife of a prelate, however ailing, and he believed, with a man's simplicity on such points, that she did ail, had no business to be inaccessible to real conversation. With no one else on earth except his wife can a prelate or any other truly good and public man have real conversation without losing dignity, or, if the conversation should become very real, without losing office. That is why most prelates are married. The best men wish to be real at times. When Ingeborg stripped off her deferences, and, after having most scandalously run away, and most scandalously entangled herself with an alien clerical rogue, had the face to hold up her hands at him and accuse him, accuse him, her father, of being the cause of her shaking, the bishop had been as much horrified as if his own garden path on which he had trodden pleasantly for years had rent itself asunder at his feet and gaped at him he had made the path he had paid to have it tidied and adorned and he required of it in return that it should keep quiet and be useful to have it convulsed into an earthquake and its usefulness interrupted must be somebody's fault, and his instinct very properly was to go to his wife and tell her it was hers. But there was the sofa. He desired to converse with his wife. He had an intolerable desire for even as few as five minutes real conversation with her. He wanted to talk about the manner in which Ingeborg must have been brought up about the amount of punishment she had received in childhood. He wished to be informed as to the exact nature of the participation her mother had taken in her moral education. He wished to discuss the responsibility of mothers and to explain his views on the consequences of maternal neglect and he wanted, too, to draw his wife's attention to the fact she easily apparently overlooked, that he had bestowed a name grown celebrated on her, and a roof that, through his gifts and God's mercy, was not an ordinary but a palace roof, and that in return the least he might expect. In short, he wanted to talk. But when driven by his urgencies, he went to her room, to break down the barricade of the sofa, he found not only Richards hovering there tactfully, but the doctor. For Mrs. Bullivant had foreseen her husband's probable desire for conversation, and the doctor, a well-trained man, was in the act of prescribing complete silence. It was then that, thwarted and debarred from the outlet a man prefers, he sought his other outlet, and laid all these distressful matters in prayer at the feet of heaven. On his knees in his chamber he earnestly begged forgiveness for his descent to naturalness, and a restoration of his self-respect. Without his self-respect what would become of him? He had lived with it so intimately and long, Fervently he desired the molten moments in which his hands had twitched, wiped out, and forgotten. He asked for help to conduct himself henceforth with calm. He implored to be given patience. He implored to be given self-control. 
and presently after two days of his spare moments spent in this manner he was sitting upon a chair and telling himself that the main objection to praying if one might say so with all due reverence is that it is one-sided it is a monologue said the bishop also with all due reverence and in troubles of the kind he was in one needs to be sure one is being attended to he did not think he could possibly be being attended to because pray as he might withdraw and wrestle as he might he continued to want to shake his daughter for there was the constant irritation going on of the affairs of the diocese getting into a more hopeless disorder all that time she was away guiltily gadding and now all this time she was not away but unavailable till she should have utterly repented his letters were piling themselves up into confused heaps and his engagements were a wilderness in which he wandered alone in the dark the chaplain and the typist did what they could but they had not been with him so long as his daughter and were not possessed of the mechanical brainlessness that makes a woman so satisfactory as a secretary his daughter not having what might be called actual brains was not troubled by thought the distresses of possible alternatives did not disturb her she did not therefore disturb him by suggesting them she was mechanically meticulous she respected detail she remembered she knew not only what had to be done which was easy but what had to be done exactly first and both the chaplain and the typist were men with ideas and instead of assisting him along one straight and a narrow path which is the only way of really getting anywhere including remembered the bishop to heaven they were constantly looking to the right and the left doubting weighing hesitating the chaplain had as many eyes for a question as a fly and saw it from as many angles fairness desirability the probable views of the other side their equal tightness these things faltered interminably round each letter to be answered were hesitated over interminably in the mellow intonations of that large-minded well-educated young man's voice and he was echoed and supported by the typist who was also from oxford and had been given this chance of nearness to the most distinguished of bishops at such a youthful age that the undergraduate milk had not yet dried on the corners of his eloquent and hesitating mouth and gave a peculiarly sickly flavour thought the irritated bishop to whatever came out of it the bishop felt that if this went on much longer the work of the diocese would come to a standstill in ten days the easter recess would be over and he was due in the house of lords where he had been put down for a speech on the home rule bill from the point of view of simple faith and how was he to leave things in this muddle at home and how was he to have the peace of mind the empty clarity appropriate to a proper approach of the measure if his inward eye went roving away to redchester all the time and to the increasing confusion on his study table the trail of ingeborg was over all his day when warm and ruffled from prayer he plunged down into his work again he could not do a thing without being reminded she was not there he was forced to think of her every moment of his time it was ignoble but without her he was like an actor who has learned not his part but to lean on the prompter and who finds himself on the stage with the prompter gone dead in his box she was dead to him dead in obstinate sin and dignity demanded she should continue dead until she came of her own accord and told him she had done with that terrible affair of the east prussian pastor 
he did not know whether he would then forgive her he would probably defer forgiveness as a disciplinary measure after having implored heaven's guidance but he would allow a certain amount of resurrection sufficient to enable her to sit up at her desk every day and disentangle the confusion her wickedness alone had caused in the evenings she would he thought at any rate for a time be best put back in her grave at this point he began to be able to say poor girl and to feel that he pitied her but it was not till the end of the week as sunday drew near that his prayers did after all begin to be answered and he regained enough control of his words if not of his thoughts to be able to reappear among his family and show nothing less becoming than reserve he even succeeded though without speaking to her in kissing ingeborg's forehead night and morning and making the sign of the cross over her when she went to bed as he had done from her earliest years she seemed smaller than ever hardly there at all and made him think of an empty dress walking about with a head on it contemplating her when she was not looking his desire to shake her became finally quenched by the perception that really there would be nothing to shake it would be like shaking out mere clothes garments with the body gone out of them there would be dust but little satisfaction she had evidently been feeling he was slightly soothed to observe for not only was her dress empty but her face seemed diminished and she certainly was remarkably pale she struck him as very unattractive entirely designed by providence for a happy home life and to think that this nothing this amazing littleness well well poor girl on sunday afternoon he determined to help her by getting into touch with her from the pulpit on that day he several times assured himself before preaching that his only feeling in the sad affair was one of concern for her and grief the pulpit he knew from experience was a calm and comfort bringing place when he was in it it was indeed his way with a pulpit that had brought the bishop to the pinnacle of the church on which he found himself he was at his best in it knowing it for a blessed spot free from controversy pure from contradiction a place where personal emotions could find no footing owing to the wise custom that prevented congregations from answering back put into common terms the terms of his undergraduate days he could let himself rip in the pulpit and the bishop was in a ripped condition altogether at his greatest he spoke that sunday specially to ingeborg and he told himself that what had come straight from his heart must needs go straight to hers the bible was very plain it did not mince matters as to the dangers she was running the punishment for her class of sin right through it was various and severe not that the ravens of another age and the eagles of a different climate he had taken as his text that passage or rather portion of a passage he described it as remarkable in the proverbs the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall eat it were likely ever miraculously to appear in redchester though even on that point the bishop held that nothing was certain but there were he explained spiritual ravens and eagles provided by an all-merciful providence for latter-day requirements whose work was even more thorough and destructive he earnestly implored those members of his flock who knew themselves guilty of the particular sin the passage referred to to seek forgiveness of their parents before heaven interfered he pointed out that what is most needed 
if people are to live with any zest and fine result at all is encouragement and what encouragement could equal full and free forgiveness the bible he said understood this very well and the prodigal son's father never hesitated in his encouragement it seemed difficult to suppose one could equal the lavishness of the best robe the ring the shoes and the fatted calf yet he felt certain he knew there were fathers at that very moment there in that town nay in that cathedral ready with all and more than that who would wish to punish his dear child the soul given into his hands to be whitened for heaven one knew from one's own experience all who had once been children must know how sorry one was for having done wrong how bleeding one felt about it and just then just at that moment of sorrow of heart's blood was not what one needed so that one might get on one's feet again quickly and do better than ever not punishment but forgiveness a frequent and free forgiveness said the bishop and his voice was beautiful as he said it was one of the chief necessities of life what poor children want poor frail children so infinitely apt to fall so infinitely clumsy at getting up is a continual wiping out and never thinking again of the yesterdays a daily presentation by authority to yesterday's stumblers of that most bracing object the cleaned and empty slate why it was as necessary he declared his fine face aglow if one was to work well and add one's cheerful contribution to the world's happiness as a nourishing and sufficient breakfast the congregation thrilled at this homely touch and to numb a human being's powers of cheerful contribution by punishment was waste how cruel then to force a father by one's stubbornness to punish how cruel and how sinful to hinder him by not seeking out at once what he so freely offered to hinder him from bringing forth his best robe his ring his fatted calf what a heavy responsibility towards their fathers did children bear said the bishop who had ceased himself being anybody's child many years before this he said is a sermon to children to erring children to those sad children who have gone astray we are all children here he explained and if life has been with us so long that we can no longer find any one we may still with any certainty call father we are yet to the end children of the kingdom but he continued though every single soul in this cathedral is necessarily someone's child not every single soul in it is inevitably someone's father and he would say a few words to the fathers and remind them of the infinite effect of love to punish your child is to make its repentance go sour within it do not punish it love it love it continuously generously if needs be obstinately smite its hardness as once a rock was smitten with the rod of generosity give it a chance of gushing forth into living repentance generosity begets generosity love begets love show your love show your generosity forgive freely magnificently oh my brothers oh my children my little sorry children what could not one what would not one do in return for love the bishop's face was lifted up as he finished to the light of the west window his voice was charged with feeling he had forgotten the ravens and eagles of the beginning for he never allowed his beginnings to disturb his endings well knowing his congregation forgot them too he was an artist at 
reaching into the hearts of the uneducated. Everything helped him, his beauty, his voice, and the manifest way in which his own words moved him. And the typist, as he walked back to the palace with the chaplain across the daisies of the close, was unable to agree with the chaplain that a course at Oxford, even now in close reasoning, might help the bishop. The typist thought it would spoil him, and offered to lay the chaplain twenty to one that Redchester that afternoon would be full of erring children upsetting their father's Sunday by wanting to be forgiven. It was, and Ingeborg was one of them. CHAPTER Ten. She waylaid him after tea on the stairs, father, she said timidly, as he was passing on in silence. Well, Ingeborg, said the bishop, pausing, and gravely attentive. I want to tell you how sorry I am. Yes, Ingeborg, so sorry, so ashamed, that I, I went away like that on that tour. It was very wrong of me, and I went with your money. Oh, it was ugly. I hope you'll forgive me, father. Freely, Ingeborg, it would be sad indeed if I lagged behind our great exemplar in the matter of forgiveness. Then I may come back to work when you tell me you have broken off your clandestine engagement. But, father, there are no buts, Ingeborg. But you said in your sermon the bishop passed on. In her eagerness, Ingeborg put her hand detainingly on his sleeve, a familiarity hitherto unheard of in that ordered and temperate household. But your sermon, you said in your sermon, father, why, how can free forgiveness have conditions. They didn't do it that way in the Bible. This to him, who was by the very nature of his high office, a specialist in forgiveness. Poor girl, poor girl, you said yourself about the prodigal son. His father forgave everything, and perhaps he'd done worse things even than going to Lucerne. We are not told, Ingeborg, of any clandestine engagement, said the bishop, pursuing his way hampered, but, as he was glad to remember afterwards, calm. But you know about it. How can it be clandestine when you know about it? Once more, Ingeborg, there are no buts, but why shouldn't I marry a good man? She was actually following him up quite a number of the stairs, still with her hand on his arm, and her face, so unattractive in its unwomanly eagerness, quite close to his. Why should I have to be forgiving for wanting to marry a good man? Everybody marries good men. Mother did, and you never told her she wasn't to. Oh, oh, she went on as his dressing-room door was quietly closed upon her. That isn't free forgiveness at all. It isn't what you said. It isn't what you said. It's conditions. And her voice from the doormat became quite a cry, regardless of possible listening Wilsons. How glad he was that he had been able to put her aside quietly and get himself, still controlled, into his dressing-room. How strange and new were these reckless outbreaks of unreserve! And her reasoning, how wholly deplorable! She wished, unhappy girl, to enjoy the advantages and privileges of the forgiven state while continuing in the sin that had procured the forgiveness. She wished, he reflected, though in educated language, to eat a cake and have it too. Yet was it not clear that a free forgiveness could only be bestowed on an unlimited penitence? There could be no reservations of particular branches of sin. All must be lopped, and the East Prussian pastor was a branch that must be lopped with the cleanest final cut 
before real submission could be said to have set in. But the bishop in his dressing-room, though he retained his apparent calm, was sore within him. His sermon had failed. The girl must be a stone. It wasn't, he thought, profoundly worried, as if he hadn't given her nearly a week for undisturbed thought, and hadn't approached her that day with all the helpfulness in his power from the pulpit. Both these things he had done, and she was no nearer recovery than before. Was training then nothing? Was environment nothing? Was blood nothing? Was the blood of bishops? That blood which of all bloods must surely be most potent in preventing its inheritors in all their doings. Nothing? On the following afternoon there was a party at the palace arranged by Mrs. Bullivant. In the confident days before she knew what Ingeborg was really like, it was a congratulatory party for Judith, and all Redchester and all the county had been invited. Nothing could stop this party but a death in the household. Any death, even Richard's, might do, but nothing short of death, thought the afflicted lady wondering how she was to get through the afternoon. And as she crept on to her sofa at a quarter to four to be put by Richards into the final folds, and knew that as four struck a great surge of friends would pour in over her, and that for three hours she would have to be bright and happy about Judith, and sympathetically explanatory about Ingeborg, who looked altogether too odd to be explained only by a long past dentist. She felt so very low that she was unable to stop herself from thinking it was a pity people didn't die a little oftener, especially maids, especially maids who were so clumsy with the cushions and the master of Adanius had been there since before luncheon, and how exhausting that was! She had had to do most of the entertaining of him, the bishop being unavoidably absent from the meal, and Ingeborg, who did the conversation in that family, not being able to now because she was in disgrace, and Judith, dear child, never saying much at any time. And the master had been very exuberant, and his vitality, delightful of course, but just a little overwhelming at his age, had reminded her that she needed care. How difficult it had been to get him out into the garden, to somewhere where she wasn't. She hadn't got him there till half-past two, by which time he had been vital without stopping since twelve. And even then she had had to invent a pear tree in full blossom that she wasn't at all sure about, and tell him she had heard it was a wonderful sight, and ought not to be missed. But how difficult it had been! Judith had not seemed to want to show him the pear tree and he would not go and look at it unless she went too. Judith had gone at last, but with an expression on her face, as though she thought she was going to have to bear things, and no girl should show a thought like that before marriage. And then there had been an immense number of small matters to see to because of the party, matters Ingeborg had always seen to, but couldn't now, because she was in disgrace, and how difficult all that was. Still Mrs. Bullivant felt deeply, if vaguely, that nobody temporarily evil should be allowed to minister to anybody permanently good. Such persons, she felt, should be put aside into a place made roomy for repentance, by the clearing out of all claims. During the whole of the week, since her daughter's return, she had not let her even pour out tea, even when the Riven family was by itself, 
or when congratulatory callers came poor ingeborg isn't very well she had murmured quenching the inquisitiveness natural to callers she had made up her mind that first evening when the full horror of what her daughter had done became clear to her that she would ask nothing of her not even tea but it did make difficulties she felt entirely low quite damp with the exertion of meeting them when she crept into position on the sofa at a quarter to four and waited with closed eyes for the next wave of life that would wash over her and it all happened as she had feared she was perpetually having to explain ingeborg guest after guest came up with the expressions of rejoicing proper to guests invited to rejoice over judith and the smiling laudations of what was indeed a vision of beauty each ended with a question about ingeborg what had she been doing the awful innocence of the question how perfectly miserably seedy she looked poor little ingeborg was it really just that tiresome tooth mrs bullivant as she murmured what she could in reply to this ceaseless flow of sympathy from the retired officers and their wives and daughters and the cathedral dignitaries and their wives and daughters and the wives and daughters of the county who came without their men because their men wouldn't come felt vaguely but deeply that it was somehow wrong that ingeborg should both sin and be sympathized with she had no right her injured mother felt to look so small and stricken her family had quite properly removed her outside the pale of their affection till she should announce her broken-off engagement to that dreadful german and ask to be forgiven for ever having been engaged at all but she ought not to look like somebody who is outside a pale she seemed positively to be advertising the pale it was really the worst of taste when you were the sinner to look like the sinned against to look ill-used to droop openly yet never could a girl who had done such horrible such detestably deceitful and vulgar things have been treated so gently by her family it had been mrs bullivant felt the only good thing in a wretched affair the perfect breeding with which the bullivants had met the situation not one of them had even remotely alluded to the scene she had made the first afternoon no one had questioned her no one had troubled her in any way she had been left quite free and no one had exacted the smallest sacrifice of her time to any of their needs her father had given her a complete holiday not allowing her at all in his study and whenever she had attempted to do anything for her mother or in the house richard had been rung for judith dear child seemed instinctively to do the right thing and without a word from her mother avoided ingeborg she was so delicate about it so fine in her feeling that here was something not quite nice that she turned red each time ingeborg during the first day or two tried to talk to her and quietly went into another room all the last part of the week ingeborg had spent in the garden quite free quite undisturbed not a claim on her and yet here she was standing about at the party or sitting alone in foolish corners thin and pale and unsmiling like a reproach through a gap in the crowd mrs bullivant presently saw her being talked to by one who had once been a general but now in retirement wreaked his disciplines on bees she just had time to notice how her daughter started and flushed when this man suddenly addressed her such bad manners to start and flush before the crowd closed again 
She shut her eyes for a moment, and felt very helpless. Who knew to what lengths Ingeborg's bad manners might not go, and what she might not be saying to the man? What the general was telling her, with the hearty kindliness fathers of other daughters use to daughters of other fathers, will use, indeed, commented the bishop, observing the incident from afar, and allowing himself the solace of an instant's bitterness, to any created female thing, if only she will oblige them by not being their own, was that he couldn't have her looking like this. Oh, like what? asked Ingeborg, quickly starting and flushing for her week as an outcast, had lowered her vitality to such an extent that she was morbidly afraid her face might somehow have become a sort of awful crystal in which everybody would be able to see the reeky and herself being proposed to on its top. Shocking white about the gills, said the hearty man standing over her cup in hand and seesawing on his toes and heels because his boots creaked and it gave him a vague pleasure to make them go on doing it you must come round and have a good game of tennis with dorothy some afternoon you've been shut up working too hard at that letter-writing business that's what you've been doing young lady i wish i had oh i wish i had said ingeborg pressing her hands together, and looking up at this stray bit of kindliness with a quick gratefulness. We always think of you as sitting there writing, writing, the hearty man went on, more intent on what he was saying than on what she was saying. Father's right hand, mother's indispensable, you know. I tell Dorothy, Ingeborg twisted on her chair, oh, she said, don't tell Dorothy, don't tell her. Tell her what? You don't know what I was going to say. Yes, I do. About that how daughters ought to be like me. And Dorothy's so good and dear. And wouldn't ever in this world have gone off to... She stopped. But only just in time and looked at him, frightened. She had all but said it. The general, however, was staring at her with kindly incomprehension. Her head drooped a little, and she gazed vaguely at his toes, as they rhythmically touched and were lifted up from the carpet. Nobody knows what anybody else is really like inside, she finished forlornly. "'You come up and have some tennis,' said he, patting her on the shoulder and later on to the bishop he remarked, in his hearty desire to have everything trim and in its proper place, the young in the fresh air, older persons at desks in studies, white faces reserved for invalids, roses blooming in the cheeks of girls, that he mustn't overwork that little daughter of his. Overwork! exclaimed the bishop, full of bitter memories of an empty week. "'Turn her out into the sun, bully, my boy,' said the general, whose fag the bishop had been at Eton. "'Into the sun!' exclaimed the bishop, having for six mortal days observed her from windows horribly idling in it. "'If you keep em shut up, you can't expect girls any more than you can expect a decent bee,' To provide you with honey. Honey! exclaimed the bishop. That duchess, who had wanted her eldest son to marry Judith, tapped Ingeborg on the arm with her umbrella as she passed her, followed by her daughter, and said, Little pale child, little pale child, and shook her head at her, and frowned, and smiled, and whispered to Pamela that it looked very like jealousy and Pamela said nonsense to that, and tried to linger and 
talk to Ingeborg, but her mother, filled with a passion for refreshment that seizes all persons who go to parties, dragged her along with her to where it could be found, and on the way she was seen by the bishop, who at once left the old lady who was talking to him to enfold Lady Pamela in his care, and compass her about with a cloud of little attentions, chairs, ices, fruit. For not only had he confirmed her, but he felt a peculiar interest in her particular kind of clean-limbed, intelligent beauty. Of all the confirmation crosses he had given away, he liked best to think of Lady Pamela's. Certainly, in that soft cradle beneath the muslin and lace of propriety, he could be sure it would not jangle against an illicit and alien ring. "'You still wear it?' he said, his beautiful voice lowered to suit the subject, charged with feeling as with his own hands he brought her tea, and he felt a little checked, a little disappointed, when she said, smiling at him, her grey eyes level with his, so well grown was she. Where what? And another thing this young woman did that afternoon that checked and disappointed him, she showed a disposition to take care of him, and no bishop of sixty, or indeed any other honest man of sixty, likes that. She thinks me old, he thought, with acute and pained surprise, as she charmingly made him sit down, lest he might be tired standing, and charmingly shut a window behind him, lest he should be in a draught, and charmingly, later on, when he took her down the garden to show her the pear tree, turned her pretty head, and asked him over her shoulder whether she was walking too fast. She thinks me old, he thought. And it was an amazement to him, for only last year he was still fifty-nine, still in the fifties, and the fifties, once one was used to them, were nothing at all. He became very grave with Lady Pamela. He felt that the showing of the pear tree had lost a good deal of its savour. He felt it still more when, turning the bend in the path that led to the secluded corner that made the pear tree popular as a resort, he perceived Ingeborg sitting beneath it. She was alone. Why is she always by herself? asked Lady Pamela, who was, the bishop could not help thinking, being rather steadily tactless. He made no answer. He was too seriously nettled, apart from everything else, to have one's daughter cropping up. Ingeborg, called Lady Pamela, waving her sunshade to attract her attention, as they walked on towards her, for Ingeborg, under the tree, was sitting with her chin on her hand, looking at nothing and once more advertising, by her attitude, Mrs. Bullivant would have considered, that she was outside the pale. I think, said the bishop, pausing, we ought perhaps to go back. Ought we? Oh, why, it's lovely here. Ingeborg! I think, said the bishop, now altogether annoyed at this persistent determination to include his daughter, as though one could ever satisfactorily include daughters, in what might have been a poetic conversation between beauty and youth on the one side, and the prestige and more than common gifts on the other. Beauty, too, if you come to that, and as great in its male ripe way as hers in her girlishness, I think that I, at any rate, must go back. My wife. Ingeborg, wake up. What are you dreaming about? Positively, Lady Pamela was not listening to him. He turned on his heel, and left her to go on waving her sunshade at his daughter, if that was what she liked. 
and went back towards the house, reflecting that women really are quite sadly deficient in imagination, and that it is a great pity. And that it is a great pity. Even this one, this well-bred, well-taught, bright being, was so unimaginative that she actually saw no reason why a man's grown-up daughter really a deficiency of imagination amounted to stupidity he hardly liked to have to admit that lady pamela was stupid but anyhow women ought not to have the vote he went away back into the main garden along the path by the great herbaceous border then in a special splendour of tulips and all the clean magnificence of may thinking with his eyes on the ground how different things would have been if when he was a curate he had been sane enough not to marry the clearness now in his life if only he had not done that nobody sofa ridden in it no grown-up thwarting daughters and himself vigorous distinguished entirely desirable as a husband choosing with the mellow yet not too mellow wisdom of middle life exactly who was best fitted to share the advantages he had to offer even lady pamela would not then have been able to think of him as old it was his family that dated him his grey-haired wife his grown-up daughters the folly of curates the black incurable folly of curates and he forgot for a gloomy instance what he as a rule with a sigh acknowledged that it had been providence even then restlessly at work guiding him and that mrs bullivant and the girls merely constituted one of its many inscrutable ends the baser portion of the bishop's brain was about to substitute another word for guiding when he was saved providentially the nobler portion of his brain instantly pointed out by encountering the duchess she was coming slowly along examining the plants in the border with the interest of a garden lover and pointing out by means of her umbrella the various successes to a man the bishop took to be one of her party he was a big man in ill-fitting shiny black with something of the air of one of the less reputable cabinet members and was in fact herr dremmel but no one except herr dremmel knew it he had arrived that afternoon a man animated by a single purpose which was to marry Ingeborg as soon as possible and get back quickly to his work. And he had come straight from the station to the palace and walked in unquestioned with all the others. And after a period of peering about in the drawing-room for Ingeborg had drifted out into the garden where he had at once stumbled upon the Duchess who was being embittered by a prebendary of servile habits who insisted on agreeing with her as to the latin name of a patch of prophet flower when she knew all the time she was wrong you tell me she said turning to herr dremmel who was peering at them what shall i tell you madam he inquired politely sweeping off his felt hat and bowing beautifully this what is its name i've forgotten Herr Dremmel, who took a large interest in botany, immediately told her. Of course, said the Duchess, I knew it was Arnebia, even when I said it was something else. It's a borage. Arnebia echinoides, madame, said Herr Dremmel, peering closer, a native of Armenia. Of course, they'll conquer us, remarked the Duchess to the prebendary oh of course he agreed though he did not take her meaning for he had been a prebendary some time and was a little slow intellectually at getting under way then the duchess dropped him 
and turned entirely to Herr Dremmel, who, though he had never seen a herbaceous border in his life, by sheer reasoning was able to tell her very intimately what the bishop, who he supposed did the digging, had been doing in the previous autumn, and the exact amount and nature of the fertilizers he had put in. She was suggesting he should come back with her that afternoon to Coop's and stay there indefinitely, so profound and attractive did his knowledge seem of what her own garden and her farm needed in the way of a treatment he alluded to as cross-dressing. When he interrupted her, a thing that had never happened to her before, while inviting somebody to Coop's, to inquire why there were so very many people in the drawing-room and on the lawn. The Duchess stared. It's a party, she said, to celebrate the betrothal. Don't you know? I am gratified, said Herr Dremmel, to find the parents so evidently pleased. It adds a grace to what was already full of charm. But would it not have been more complete if they had invited me? I quite agree with you, said the Duchess. Much more complete. Well, anyhow, here you are. So you think my soil wants nitrogen? Certainly, madam, in the form of rape cape and ammonia salts, but combined with organic manure. Artificial manure alone will not, in hot weather. Who is that? he broke off, pointing with his umbrella to the bishop advancing along the path, his eyes on the ground, sardonically meditating. What? said the duchess intent on the notes she was making of his recommendations in her notebook that said herr dremmel the duchess looked up why the bishop of course go on about the hot weather her father said herr dremmel and he advanced hat in hand and the other held out in friendliest greeting to meet him the duchess went after him bishop she said this is a man who knows all the things worth knowing. And the bishop, taking this to be her introduction of a friend, cordially returned Herr Dremmel's handshake. He was never cordial again. Sir, said Herr Dremmel, I am greatly pleased to make your acquaintance. My name is Dremmel, Robert Dremmel. The bishop had just enough self-control not to snatch his hand away but to let Herr Dremmel continue to hold and press it. His mind began to leap about. How to get the Duchess away, how to get Herr Dremmel turned noiselessly out of the house, how to prevent Ingeborg's coming at any moment along the path behind them with Lady Pamela. We have every reason, sir, said Herr Dremmel, holding the bishop's hand in a firm pressure, to congratulate each other. I, you, on the possession of such a daughter, you, me. Isn't she a lovely girl, said the Duchess, for whom only Judith existed in that family. Would rape cake and the other things help my flowers at all, or is it only for the mangles? Mangles, thought the bishop, rape cake, and swiftly glanced behind him down the path. Sir, said Herr Dremmel, desiring to be very pleasant to the bishop, and slightly waving the duchess aside, permit me also to congratulate you. Have you any tea? inquired the bishop desperately of the duchess, turning to her and getting his hand away. Thank you, yes. Well, Mr. Dremmel, don't interrupt him, bishop. He's most interesting. On the results, continued Herr Dremmel to the bishop, of your autumnal activities, this blaze of flowers is sufficient witness to the devotion, the assiduity. You don't suppose he did it himself, do you? said the Duchess. And your costume, sir, said Herr Dremmel, concentrated on the bishop, and earnestly desiring to please, suggests a quite particular and familiar interest in what this lady rightly calls the things really worth knowing. But he can't help wearing that, said the Duchess. Again Herr Dremmel, and with some impatience, waved her aside. 
"'It is a costume most appropriate in a garden,' he continued. "'Even the gaiters are horticultural, "'and the apron is pleasantly reminiscent of the innocence of our first parents, "'so Adam might have dressed. "'Oh, but you must come to Coop's,' cried the Duchess Bishop. "'He's to come back with me.' sir said herr dremmel with something of severity for he was beginning to consider the duchess forward is this lady mrs bishop oh oh screamed the duchess while herr dremmel watched her disapprovingly and the bishop struggled not to seize him by the throat my dear bishop said the duchess wiping her eyes i never had such a compliment paid me the best-looking bishop on the bench do come indoors he implored i can't really let you stand about like this thank you i am not in the least tired go on mr dremmel sir can i see you alone said herr dremmel now without any doubt as to the duchess's forwardness on such an occasion as this before we begin together openly to rejoice it seems fitting we should first by ourselves unless this lady is your daughter's mother oh oh again screamed the duchess the bishop turned on him in a kind of blaze, quite uncontrollable. "'Yes, sir, you can,' he said. "'Come into my study.' "'What? Are you going to take him away from me?' cried the Duchess. "'My dear Duchess, if he has business with me,' said the bishop, "'I'll take you indoors first, he said, offering her his arm. "'This gentleman,' he glared at him sideways, and Herr Dremmel, all unused, as he was to noticing hostility, yet was a little surprised at the expression of his face. We'll wait here. No, no, he won't, he'll come too. For approaching round the bushes behind which grew the pear tree, the bishop had caught sight of skirts. Come on, sir. But, said the duchess, as the bishop drew her hand hastily through his arm, and began to walk off with her more quickly than she had been walked off for years. "'Come on, sir,' the bishop flung back, almost hissed back at Herr Dremmel. "'One moment,' said Herr Dremmel, holding up his hand, his gaze fixed on what was emerging from the bushes. "'Come on, sir,' cried the bishop. "'I can only see you alone if you come at once.' But Herr Dremmel did not heed him. He was watching the bushes." "'Will you come?' said the bishop, pausing and stamping his foot while he held the duchess tight in the grip of his arm. "'Why?' said Herr Dremmel, without heeding him. "'Why, yes, why, it is. Why, here at last appears the little sugar-lamb.' "'The little what?' said the duchess, resolutely pulling out her hand from the bishop's arm and putting up her eyeglass. "'Heavens above us!' He can't mean Pamela, but nobody answered her, and indeed it was not necessary for Herr Dremmel, gone down the path with a swiftness amazing in one of his appearance, was already in the sight of all Redchester and most of the county, enfolding Ingeborg in his arms. Of course, was the Duchess's comment to the bishop, as she watched the scene with her eyeglass up and the placidity of relief of course they will conquer us end of section four section five of the pastor's wife by elizabeth von arnim this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 5. Chapter 11. And so it came to pass that Herr Dremmel, armed only with simplicity, set aside the resistances of princes, potentates, and powers, and was married to Ingeborg by her father, the bishop, in his own cathedral, and it was done as quickly as the law allowed, not only because Herr Dremmel was determined it should be, but because the enduring of his daily arrival for courting purposes from Coops, where he was staying, became rapidly impossible for the bishop. 
Also there was the master of Ananias, spurred to a frenzy of activity by Herr Dremmel's success in getting things hurried on, insisting that he had been engaged long enough, and demanding to be married on the same day. In the end he was, and Ingeborg's wedding, being Judith's as well, was unavoidably splendid. All along the line the bishop's hand was forced. The very wedding dress had to be as beautiful for the one as for the other of his daughters. And absurdly and wickedly he was obliged to spend as much on her trousseau who was going into pauperdom and obscurity for the rest of her days as on hers who would no doubt be soon though of course only in god's good time the most magnificent of widows he never afterwards was able to feel quite the same to the duchess without knowing anything of the circumstances of the secret disgrace of the affair of the blank undesirability in any case of such a son-in-law of the extraordinary inconvenience and pecuniary loss of ingeborg's marrying at all she had taken up herr dremmel to an extent that was positively near making her ridiculous supposing that humanly speaking were possible and had rammed him down the county's throat till at last it believed that of the two husbands ingeborg had secured the better and this gossip filtered through into the palace and judith who never did speak spoke less than ever but edging away more and more decidedly from the blandishments of the master who had not been invited to coops spent most of her time in her own room engaged in not looking at her trousseau and the palace became such an uncomfortable place what with one thing and another and the strain of remaining calm and becoming in conduct to the duckily protected Herr Dremmel was so great that at last the bishop was as eager as anyone to get the wedding over and feverishly furthered any scheme that would, by hastening it, deliver him. To Ingeborg he never spoke, but turned away with the same cold horror that came over the rest of the family when from windows he or it beheld her being quartered with what seemed a terrible German thoroughness in places like the middle of the lawn. He could no longer walk round his own garden without meeting an interlaced couple and though he suggested to Herr Dremmel, with what he felt was really admirable self-restraint, that these public endearments might give rise to comment, Herr Dremmel merely replied that, as Ingeborg was his brout, it ought to give rise to much more comment, even to justifiable complaints, if his manner to her were less warm in england we do not began the bishop but broke off for fear of losing his self-restraint and herr dremmel and ingeborg continuing to perambulate the garden slowly with a frequent readjusting of their steps to each other's for it is a difficult method the interlaced one of getting along a path the bishop and mrs bullivant retreated for refreshment and comfort to the delicacy of judith to her lovely withdrawals that the master should blandish was natural because a man is natural but they knew that a woman if she is to approach any ideal of true womanhood cannot be too carefully unnatural and should she be persuaded or betrayed into some expression of affection for her lover some answering caress at least she must not like it and there was ingeborg progressing round the garden as described or in the middle of the lawn openly having her hand held and looking pleased it was rank ingeborg in fact was pleased 
she was more she was extremely happy here she was suddenly no longer a disgraced and boycotted and wicked girl but that strangely encouraging object that odd restorer of faith in oneself a little sugar lamb the coziness of being a sugar lamb she had been so very miserable she had dragged through such cold anemic days she had had such a horrible holiday forced upon her on the very scene of her activities and had had it brought home to her so freezingly so blightingly that she had done too dreadful a thing to be allowed apparently ever again to associate with the decent and robert she quickly began calling him that to herself under the influence of her family's methods of reclaiming her had not written a single letter but he came said herr dremmel for whose enlightenment she was picturing the week she had had and her father would not speak to her at all would not look at her old sheep said herr dremmel good-naturedly and judith had seemed entirely horrified and used to blush if she tried to speak to her foolish turkey said herr dremmel placidly but now somehow it did seem as if she needn't have been quite so miserable and might have had more faith what ought the little one to have had more of asked herr dremmel for his thoughts had not much time to spare and he profitably employed them while she talked in working out the probable results of say the treatment of three acres of sugar beet with sulphate of potash sulphate of ammonia and nitrate of soda respectively all of them receiving four hundred pounds of basic slag as well would not sulphate of ammonia be more effective as a nitrogenous manure than nitrate of soda in the case of sugar beets whose roots grew smaller and nearer the surface than mangles that is what little women should constantly have more of he said breaking away from sugar beets to a zestful embracing for on this occasion they were under the pear tree a place she seldom went to because she had not yet acquired in spite of his assurances that she undoubtedly would any real enthusiasm for embracings keeping by preference to the only immune place in the garden which was the middle of the lawn i wonder she thought while it was being done if this will really grow on me and while it was still being done mother must have been kissed too and she still alive and presently while it was still being done but mother isn't much alive there's the sofa perhaps that's why well he loved her somehow she did not now care how whether it was a spiritual affection or one that would go on requiring at frequent intervals to enfold her capaciously did not matter any more for it was a warm thing a warm human thing he was offering her and she had been half dead with cold what did it matter if she herself was not in love it was the dream of a schoolgirl to want to be in love life was not like that life was a thing full of friendliness and happy affection and love anyhow on the woman's side was not a bit necessary the bishop would have been surprised if he had known how nearly she approached his ideal of womanhood she was going to be so good she said to herself and to herr dremmel too her heart full of gratitude and glad relief oh so good she was never going to be dejected or beaten out of hope and courage again she would work over there work hard at all sorts of happy things in the parish and among the poor and sick and she would help robert in his work if he would let her and if he wouldn't then she'd help him when he had done help him to play and rest 
they would laugh together and talk together and walk together and he would explain his experiments to her and teach her to understand and the first thing she would do would be to learn german very thoroughly so as to be able to write all his letters for him and even his sermons if needs be and save his precious time those said herr dremmel who in the lush meadows of dalliance had forgotten that what had first attracted him to her had been a certain bright baldness of brain would be pretty little nonsense sermons the small snail would produce you'll see said ingeborg confidently and she suddenly flung out her arms and turned her face up to the sun and the blue through the little leaves and all the light and promise of the world and stretched herself in an immense contentment oh she sighed isn't it all good isn't it all good it is agreed herr dremmel but it is nothing to how good it will be presently when we are surrounded by our dear children children said ingeborg she dropped her arms and looked at him she had not thought of children then indeed my little wife will not wish to write letters or compose sermons why said ingeborg because you will be a happy mother but don't happy mothers you will be entirely engaged in adoring your children nothing else in the world will interest you ingeborg stood looking at him with a surprised face oh she said shall i then she added but i've never had any children it was not to be expected said herr dremmel then how do you know nothing else in the world will interest me foolish little one he said taking her in his arms his eyes moist with tenderness for he knew that here against his breast he held in her slender youth the mother of all the dremmels and the knowledge profoundly moved him foolish little one is not throughout all nature every mother solely preoccupied by interest in her young is she said ingeborg doubtfully quite a number of remembered family snapshots dancing before her eyes still she was very willing to believe she looked at him a moment thinking but she said gently pushing herself a little away from him both hands on his chest but what then small snail wouldn't they be german children undoubtedly said herr dremmel proudly all of them all of them he echoed it wouldn't be like roman catholics and protestants marrying and half the children be german and half english certainly not said herr dremmel emphatically but robert continue little herr what are german children like it was now herr dremmel's turn to say confidently you'll see a week later they were married and the bishop inscrutably watching ingeborg from the doorstep as she was being tucked by deft hands into the rugs of the car that was to take her to the station observing how cushions were put in the right places at her back how a footstool was carefully inserted under her feet how her least movement was interpreted and instantly attended to made his farewell remark to his daughter the last remark as it happened that he ever did make to her you will miss wilson he said and re-entered the palace a slightly comforted man she never saw him again part two chapter twelve on her honeymoon which was only as long as it took to get from redchester to conkensee except for a day in holland where a brief and infinitely respectful visit or rather waiting on was made to the eminent de Vries, ingeborg said to herself at frequent intervals as she had said to herself under the pear tree in what now seemed a remote past perhaps this will grow on me 
but even before they reached Cokensee, on the fourth day after their marriage, she was deciding, though a little reluctantly, for she had always heard them praised, that probably she had no gift for honeymoons. Robert, luckily, was apparently liking his, and was quite happy and placid, and slept sonorously in the trains. The meals were invariably cheerful. From Bromberg, as he woke up, and became attentive to the country they were passing through, and once in his own part of the world, he expanded into much talk, pointing out and explaining the distinctive features of the methods employed on the different farms along the line. Ingeborg drank it in eagerly. She was zealous to learn, resolute to be a help meet. Had he not delivered her from the immense suffocation of Redchester? She was obsequious with gratitude. It was a country of an exhilarating spaciousness, no hedges, no shutting off of one field from another, no shutting off indeed of the sky itself or of the blue delicious distance by little interfering hills like those they had round Redchester. It was all one great sweep, one great roll of earth up to heaven and of heaven down to earth, fresh and free, and with a quality in the air of clear bright hardness she thought adorable after the wadded effect of the climate at home. And once, when the train pulled up in the open, she could hear from far away up in the blue the cry of a hawk. From Allenstein they went on by a light railway with toy carriages and a tiny engine through an infinity of rye-fields and seemingly uninhabited country to the nearest station to Cokensee, a place called Muck, of some pretension to being a little town with an enormous church rising out of its middle and containing among other objects of interest explained herr dremmel his mother oh said ingeborg surprised have you got one for he somehow produced a completely motherless impression invariably my treasure said herr dremmel with patience do people have mothers Yes, she said, reaching down his hat for him and putting it carefully on his head, but then they say so, perhaps sooner or later. I well remember, however, informing you that my father was dead. From that it was possible to reason that my mother was not. She is a simple woman, no longer young. We will visit her on her way through the town. Outside the station, a high vehicle drawn by two long-tailed horses, one of which reached a head and a neck further than the other, so that when you looked at them sideways and could not see that they both began at the same place, it seemed to be perpetually winning a race, was in readiness to take them to Cokensee. This, said Herr Dremmel, introducing it with a wave of the hand, is my carriage, and this, he continued, similarly introducing the driver, is my faithful servant Johann. He has been with me now nearly a year. Ingeborg shook Johann's hand when he had carefully clambered down over the sacks of canit that filled the front part of the carriage very politely. "'Do they all stay as long as that?' she murmured to Herr Dremmel. "'All? There is but my widow, and she is adjusting her feathers for flight. She will wing her way to some other bachelor nest as soon as my little one has been inducted.' "'But does she like that?' asked Ingeborg for she had acquired a habit, due to much repetition of the litany, of regarding widowers as brittle, needing special care. There was an instant's vision before her eyes of this one flapping blackly athwart the fields of East Prussia, turned out, desolate and oppressed, and with perhaps some cackling trail of curses stridulously marking her course. 
No doubt she will feel it. She, too, has been very faithful. She has been with me now nearly eight months, but if it were less, she would still feel it. Widows, he continued abstractly, peering among the stacks of kynet in search of some chilla saltpetre that was not there, are in a constant condition of feeling. Johann explained. He was a shabby man, grown grey and frayed, Ingeborg supposed, in service, that the previous stuff did not seem to have caught its train, and Herr Dremmel went off to make anxious inquiries of the stationmaster, while Ingeborg stood smiling with an excessive friendliness at Johann, to make up for her want of words, and wondering how her luggage would get on to a carriage already so much occupied by sacks. In the end, most of it did not, and was left at the station till some future time and clutching her dressing-bag with one hand and the iron rail of the carriage with the other she was rattled away over the enormous cobbles of muck with a great crackling of johann's whip and barking of dogs and kickings of the horses whose tails were long and kept on getting over the reins the planks of the carriage's bottom heaved and yawned beneath her feet the horses shied in and out of the gutters her hat wanted to blow off and she did not dare let either of her hands go free to hold it she bent her head to try to keep it on her skin pricked and tingled from the shaking she had an impression of red houses flush with the street railless dwellings giving straight on to it of a small shop or two of people stopping to stare of straw and paper and dust dancing together in the wind herr dremmel chose these flustered moments to expand conversationally and raising his voice above the tumult explained in shouts that the three sacks in front were not so much stacks as mysterious stomachs filled with the future she strained to catch what he said, but only heard a word now and then when she bumped against him. Divine maws, richly furnished banquet, potential energy. She found it difficult to answer with any sort of connected intelligence, more especially because he kept on breaking off to lean forward and hit the horseflies that alighted on the back of Johann's neck. When he did this, Johann started, and the horses kicked. Faithful servant, he shouted in her ear, nearly a year, must not be stung. It was a disorganized and breathless Ingeborg, trying to rub things out of her eyes, who found herself finally in the passage of the elder Frau Dremmel's house. A door stood ajar, and her husband pushed it open, and called loudly on his mother to appear. She lurks, she lurks, he said, impatiently looking at his watch, and redoubled his cries. Does she expect us? asked Ingeborg at last, who was trying to pin up her loosened hair. She is a simple woman, he said, consequently she never expects anything. And he pulled open a door out of which came nothing but darkness and a great cold smell that is not my mother he said shutting it again does she know we're coming home to-day asked ingeborg a doubt beginning to take hold of her she is a simple woman consequently she never knows anything mother mother does she know you're married asked ingeborg the doubt growing bigger she is a simple woman Consequently, he broke off and stared down at her, reflecting. "'Is it possible that I forgot to tell her?' he said. It evidently was possible, for at that moment Frau Dremmel came slowly up some steps at the beginning of the passage from a lower region, and, perceiving her son, 
and a strange young woman stood still and said nothing whatever mother this is my wife said herr dremmel taking ingeborg's hand and leading her to the motionless figure ach said frau dremmel without moving kiss her little one directed herr dremmel yes yes said ingeborg blushing a vivid red and going a convulsive step nearer frau dremmel was regarding her with sombre unblinking eyes eyes that had the blankness of pebbles from her waist downwards she wore a big dark blue apron she was entirely undecorated her black dress ended at the neck abruptly in its own binding and a hook and eye her hair was drawn back into the smallest of knobs ingeborg felt suddenly that she herself was a thing of falals a showy thing bedizened with a white collar and a hat she had till then considered neat but that she now knew for a monstrous piece of frippery crushed on to insufficiently pinned up hair you are married to her asked the elder frau dremmel turning her pebble eyes slowly from one to the other undoubtedly said herr dremmel and to ingeborg in english kiss her little one and we will go on home he himself put his arm around his mother's shoulder and gave her a hasty kiss my wife is english he said she does not yet either speak or understand our tongue kiss her mother and we will go on home but it did not seem possible to get the two women to kiss ingeborg went another shy step nearer frau dremmel remained immobile this said frau dremmel moving her slow eyes over ingeborg and then fixing them on her son is a pastor's wife undoubtedly i regret i omitted to tell you mother but one does occasionally omit and in english to ingeborg she is a simple woman consequently but i heard said frau dremmel through your housekeeper and others thus i heard of my only son's marriage i a widow ingeborg not understanding stood smiling nervously she thought on such an occasion somebody ought to smile but she did not like doing it the immobility of frau dremmel who moved nothing but her eyes the dank bare passage the rush of cold smell that had escaped out of the one door in it the bleak air of poverty about her mother-in-law the poverty in some strange way regarding itself as virtuous for no reason except that it was poor did not make her smiling easy but she was a bride just coming home just being introduced to her husband's people somebody she felt on such an occasion must smile and trained as she had been by her father to do the things no one else wanted to do she provided all the smiling for the homecoming entirely herself please robert tell your mother how sorry i am i can't talk she said do tell her i wish i weren't so dumb how much has she frau dremmel was asking across this speech enough enough said her son putting on his hat and making movements of departure ah i am not to know more secrets it is all to go in further unchristian tampering with god's harvests herr dremmel bestowed a second abstracted kiss somewhere on his mother's head he had not listened to anything she said for a quarter of a century nothing for the mother she went on no no the mother is only a widow she is of no account yet your sainted father farewell and god be with you said herr dremmel departing down the passage and forgetting in his hurry to get his bride home as quickly as possible to take her with him for a moment she was left alone confronting her new relation she made a great plunge into filialness and swiftly blushing picked up her mother-in-law's passive hand 
She had meant to kiss it, but looking into her eyes, she found kissing finally impossible. She shyly murmured an English leave-taking, and got herself, infinitely awkwardly, out of the house. One has to have them, was Herr Dremmel's only comment. Kokensee lay three miles along the high road between Muck and Weisenhausen, and they could see the spire of its little church over the fields on the left the whole way. The road, made with as few curves as possible, undulated gently up and down between the rye fields. It was carefully planted on each side with mountain ashes on that day in full flower, and was white and hard as though there had been no rain for a long while. The wind blew gaily over the rye. The sky was flecked with small white clouds. Ingeborg could see for miles, and there were dark lines of forest and flashes of yellow where the broom grew, and shining bits of water and larks quivering out joy, and everywhere on the higher places busy windmills, and the whole world seemed to laugh and flutter and sing. It's beautiful, oh, beautiful, she said. Beautiful? I tell you what is beautiful, little one. The fat red soil of your girlhood's home. The fat red soil and the steady drip, drip, of the heavens. And he bent forward, and inquired of Johann when it had rained last, and became very gloomy on hearing that it was three weeks ago, and said things to himself in German. They seemed to be unpastoral things, for Ingeborg saw Johann's ears lifted up by what was evidently in front of his face being a grin. A weather-beaten signpost with one bent arm pointed crookedly down a field track at right angles to the road, and with a lurch and a heave they tilted round the corner. There was an immediate ceasing of sound. She could now hear all sorts of little birds singing besides larks, chaffinches, tits, yellow hammers, black caps. The carriage ploughed along slowly through the deep sand between rye that grew more reluctantly every yard. The horses were completely sobered and covered with sweat. Before them, on an upward slope, was Kokensee, one long straggling street of low cottages lying up against the sunset, its church behind it, and near the church two linden trees, which were the trees she knew, for she had often made him tell her, in front of her home. Ingeborg felt a quick tug at her heart. Here was the place containing all her future. There was nothing left to her to feel, she supposed, that she would not feel here. The years lay spread out before her, spacious, untouched, canvases on which she was presently going to paint the picture of her life. It was to be a very beautiful picture, she said to herself, with an extraordinary feeling of proud confidence, not beautiful because of any gifts or skill of hers, for never was a woman more giftless, but because of all the untiring little touches, the ceaseless care for details, the patient painting out of mistakes, and every touch and every detail was going to be aglow with the bright colours of happiness. Exulting bits out of the prayer book, the book she knew altogether best, sang in her ears, Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord our God. Oh, the beautiful words, the beautiful world, the wonder, and the radiance of life! "'When the devil,' said Herr Dremmel, who had been scanning the crops on either side of the track, with deepening depression, took our Saviour up on to a high place, 
to tempt him with the offer of the kingdoms of the earth he was careful to hide cocency by keeping his tail spread out over it it was so ugly and so undesirable oh the devil said ingeborg shrugging her shoulder in a splendid contempt her face still shining with what she had been thinking she turned to him and laughed you can't expect devils to know what's what she said slipping her hand through his arm and throwing up her head in a kind of proud glee he smiled down at her little treasure he said for a moment becoming conscious that this was a very bright thing he had got and was bringing home with him the carriage was hauled up through an opening between two cottages out of the sand onto the stones of the village street by a supreme last effort of the horses and was dragged in great bumps across various defects through an open gate on the opposite side there was a yard with sheds a plough a manure heap some geese some hens a pig the two linden trees and in between the linden trees behind wire netting a one-storied house with a venerable bungalow which herr dremmel on their drawing up in front of it introduced to her my house he said with a wave of the hand chapter thirteen there followed a time of surprising happiness for ingeborg it was the happiness of the child escaped from its lessons and picnicking gloriously in freedom and unrebukedness the widow it is true slightly smudged the brightness of the beginning by as it were dying hard her body clung to life the life she had known she lamented for eight long months she was the last she explained of Herr Pastor's widows, who reached back in a rusty row to the days when he first came, elastic with youth, to cure the souls of Kokensi, and as she had stayed the longest, it was clear she must be the best. She remained at the parsonage, dingily persistent, for several days on the pretext of initiating Ingeborg into the ways of the house and each time herr dremmel who seemed a little shy of embarking on controversy with her mentioned trains she burst in his presence into prayer and implored aloud on his behalf that he might never know what it was to be a widow she did ultimately however become dislodged and once she was gone there was nothing but contentment ingeborg was young enough to think the almost servantless housekeeping a thing of charm and humour herr dremmel was of the easiest unconcern as to what or when or if he ate it was early summer and there was only delight in getting up at dawn and pottering about the brick-floored kitchen before the daily servant came a girl known to kokensee as Mueller's Ilsa, and heating water and making coffee and preparing a very clean little breakfast table somewhere in the garden and decorating it with freshly picked flowers and putting the butter on young leaves and arranging the jar of honey so that a shaft of sunlight between the branches shone straight through it turning it into a miracle of golden light it was the sort of breakfast table one reads about in story-books and on its fragility herr dremmel would presently descend like some great geological catastrophe and the whole in a few convulsed moments would be just crumbs and coffee stains then he would put on leggings and go off with johann to his experimental fields and she would give herself up eagerly to the duties of the day she could not talk at first to ilsa a square girl with surprisingly thick legs because though she went about always with a german grammar in one hand she found that what she had learned was never what she wanted to say ilsa whose skirt was short 
did not wear stockings, and when Ingeborg, by pointing and producing a pair, had conveyed to her that it would be well if she did, Ilsa raised her voice and said that she had no money to get a husband with, but at least the Gutzeldank. She had these two fine legs, and if the Frau Pastor demanded that she should be hiding them, give up her chances. Then Frau Pasta had best seek some girl on whom they grew crooked or lean, and who for those reasons would only be too glad to cover them up. Ingeborg, not understanding a word, but apprehending a great objection, smiled benevolently and put the stockings away, and Ilse's legs went on being bare. They worked together in great harmony, for there could be no argument. Cut off from conversation, they sang, and Ingeborg sang hymns because her memory was packed with them, and Ilse sang long, loud ballads, going through them slowly, verse by verse, in a sort of steady howl. The very geese paused on their way to the pond to listen anxiously. Dinner, which Ingeborg found convenient to prepare entirely in one pot, simmered placidly on the stove from twelve o'clock onwards. Anybody who was hungry went and ate it. You threw in potatoes and rice and bits of meat and carrots and cabbages and fat and salt, and there you were. What are these mysterious difficulties of housekeeping, she asked herself, that people shake their heads over? Her dinners were wholesome always, delicious if one were hungry, and quite amazingly hot. They stayed hot as persistently as poultices, and once when Ilsa had the misfortune to be stung by a wasp on one of her admirable legs, Ingeborg, with immense presence of mind, seized the dinner, and emptying it into a fair linen cloth, bound it over the swollen place, so that when Herr Dremmel arrived, as it happened hungrily that day about two o'clock, and asked for his dinner, he was told it was on Ilse's leg, and had to eat sandwiches. He could not but admire the resourcefulness of Ingeborg but it was not until he had eaten several sandwiches that he was able still to say, as he patted her shoulder, little treasure. It was the busiest, happiest time. Every minute of the day was full. It was life at first hand, not drained dry of its elemental excellences by being squeezed first through the medium of servants. To have a little kitchen all to yourself, to be really mistress of every corner of your house, to watch the career of your food from its very beginning, to run out into the garden and pull up anything you happened to want, to stand at the back door with your skirt full of grain, and call your own chickens round you, and feed them, to go yourself and look for eggs, to fill the funny little dark rooms with flowers and measure the stone-floored passage for a drugget you would presently order in the only carpet shop you had faith in which was the one in redchester what pleasures did the world contain that could possibly come up to these things were a little untidy but what did that matter it was possible to become the slave of things, possible to miss life in preparation for living. And the weather was so beautiful, at least Ingeborg thought it was. There was the hottest sun and the coolest wind, and bright, clear-skied, starry nights. It is true, Robert, when he scanned the naked heavens the last thing at night, and peered at the thermometer outside his window the first thing in the morning, said it was the devil's own weather, and that if there was not soon some rain, all his fertilizers, all his activities, all his expenditure would be wasted. 
but though this would throw a shadow for a moment across her joy in each new wonderful morning she found it impossible not to rejoice in the light out in the garden for instance down there beyond the lime trees at the end where you could stand in the gap in the lilac hedge and look straight out across the rye fields the immense unending rye fields dipping and rising delicate grey delicate green shining in sunlight dark beneath the cloud restlessly waving on and on till over away at the end of things they got to the sky and were only stopped by brushing up against it out there with one's hand shading one's eyes from the too great brightness who could find fault with anything who could do anything but look and see that it was all very good oh but it was good it made one want to sing the te deum or the magnificat or still better that hymn of exultation we praise thee we bless thee we worship thee we glorify thee we give thanks to thee for thy great glory whenever there was a spare half hour such as between where dinner ended and tea began she would run out to the lime trees and pacing up and down that leafy place with the gooseberry bushes and vegetables and straggling accidental flowers of the garden lying hotly in the sun between her and the back of the house she learned german words by heart she learned them aloud from her grammar saying them over and over again glibly mechanically while her thoughts danced about the future from the immediate future of what she would do to-morrow the future of an afternoon in the punt among the reeds and perhaps paddling along to where the forest began to the more responsible vaguer future of further down the months when armed with german she would begin among the poor and go out into the parish and make friends with the peasants and be a real pastor's wife particularly she wished to get nearer her mother-in-law it seemed to her to be her first duty to get near her ceaselessly she trotted up and down repeating the german for giants umbrellas keys spectacles wax fingers thunder beards princes boats and shoulders ceaselessly her lips moved while her eyes followed the movements of the birds darting in and out of the lilac hedge and hopping among the crumbs where breakfast had been and through her giants umbrellas keys spectacles and wax she managed not to miss a word the yellow hammers were chirping to each other in cheerful strophe and antistrophe a little bit of bread and no cheese a little bit of bread and no cheese at four she would go in and make some coffee by the simple method of uniting the coffee to hot water and leaving them to settle down together on the mat outside the laboratory's locked door herr dremmel did not wish to be disturbed once he was in there and she would steal down the passage on tiptoe biting her under lip in the intentness of her care that no rattling of the things on the tray should reach his ears when he was in the house all singing ceased she arranged that ilsa should do her outdoor duties then clean out the hen-house milk the cow whether it wanted to be milked or not and minister to the pig johann was away all day at the experiment ground and ilsa waded about the farmyard mess with her bare legs thoroughly enjoying herself for no one ever scolded her whatever she did and the yard was separated from the village street only by a low fence and the early manhood of kokensee as it passed could pause and lean on this and learn from her manner of solacing the pig the comfortableness of the solacements awaiting her husband at seven ilsa went home 
and Ingeborg prepared a supper so much like breakfast that nobody could have told it was evening or not morning except that the ray of sunshine fell through the honey from the west instead of the east and there was cheese at this meal herr dremmel full of his fertilizers was mostly in a profound abstraction he drank the coffee with which he was becoming saturated and ate great slices of bread and cheese in an impenetrable silence ingeborg sat throwing crumbs to the birds and watching the sky at the edge of the world grow first a mighty red then fade then light up into clear green and long after the shadows beneath the lime trees were black and the stars and the bats were out and the frogs down in the reeds of the lake and the occasional creaking of the village pump were all that one could hear outside the immense stillness they would go on sitting there herr dremmel silently smoking ingeborg silently making plans sometimes she would get up and cross over to him and bend her face down close to his and try in the dark to explore his eyes with hers the noise you make she would say brushing a kiss so much used does marriage make one to what once has seemed impossible across the top of his hair and he would wake up and smile and pat her shoulder and tell her she was a good little wife then she felt proud it was just what she wanted to be a good little wife she wanted to give satisfaction to be as helpful to him as she had been to her father in the days before her disgrace and more helpful for he was so much kinder he was so dear for this extraordinary happiness for this delicious safety from disapproval from these free fearless wonderful days she would give in return all she had all she was all she could teach herself and train herself to be nearly always herr dremmel went back to his laboratory about ten and worked till after midnight and she would lie awake in the funny bare bedroom across the passage as long as she could so as not to miss too much of life by being asleep smelling with the delight delicate sweet smells gave her the various fragrances of the resting garden and the stars blinked in through the open window and she could see the faint whiteness of a bush of gulda roses against the curtain of the brooding night when herr dremmel came in he shut the window on sundays there was a service at two o'clock once a fortnight on the alternating sundays herr dremmel was driven by johann to another village three miles distant which was part of his scattered parish and here he preached the sermon he had preached to kokensee the sunday before he practised a rigorous economy in sermons and it had this advantage that an enthusiast only there was no enthusiast by waiting a week and walking three miles most of which was deep sand might hear again anything that had struck him the previous week by waiting a year indeed the same enthusiast supposing him there could hear everything again for herr dremmel's sermons numbered twenty-six and were planned to begin on january first with the circumcision and leaping along through the fortnights of the year ended handsomely and irregularly with an extra one at christmas however inattentive a member of the congregation might be as the years passed over him he knew the sermons there were sermons weighty according to the season either with practical advice or with wrathful expositions of duty there was one every year when the threshing time was at hand on the text micah 
Chapter 4, verse 13, Arise and Thresh, explaining with patient exactitude the newest methods of doing it. There was the annual harvest Thanksgiving sermon on Matthew chapter 13, part of verse 26, Tares. After yet another year of the congregation's obstinate indifference to chemical manure, there was the sermon on Jeremiah, chapter 9, verse 22, Is there no physician there? Preached yearly on one of the later Sundays in Trinity, when the cold, continuous rains of autumn were finding out the weak spots in the parish's grandparents and the peasants having observed that once one called in a doctor the sick person got better and one had to pay the doctor into the bargain evaded calling him in if they possibly could inquiring of each other gloomily how one was to live if death was put a stop to and there was the advent sermon when the annual slaughter of pigs drew near on isaiah sixty five part of the fourth verse swine's flesh this sermon filled the church in spite of the poor opinion of pigs in both the old and new testaments where herr dremmel found on searching for a text they were hardly mentioned except as convenient receptacles for devils in his parishioners lives they provided the nearest indeed the only approach to the finer emotions to gratitude love wonder the peasant watching this pink chalice of his future joys this mysterious moving crucible into which whatever dreary dregs and leavings he threw uttermost dregs of uttermost dregs that even his lean dog would not touch they still by christmas emerged as sausages could not but feel at least some affection at least some little touch of awe while his relations were ill and having to have either a doctor or a funeral and sometimes rousing him to fury both or if not ill were well and requiring food and clothing his pig walked about pink and naked giving no trouble needing no money spent on it placidly transmuting into the fat of future feastings that which without it would have become in heaps a source of flies and corruption herr dremmel on pigs was full of intimacy and local warmth he was more he was magnificent it was the sermon in the year which never failed to fill every seat and it was the one day on which kokensee felt its pastor thoroughly understood it ingeborg went diligently to church whenever there was church to go to she explained to Herr Dremmel that she held it to be her duty as the pastor's wife to set an example in this matter, and he pinched her ear and replied that it might possibly be good for her German. He seemed to think nothing of her duty as a pastor's wife, and when she suggested that perhaps she ought to begin and go the rounds of the cottages and not wait for greater stores of language he only remarked that little women's duty is to make their husbands happy but don't i she asked confidently seizing his coat in both her hands of course see how sleek i become and i can do something besides that nothing so good nothing half so good but robert one thing doesn't exclude herr dremmel had already however ceased to listen his thoughts had slid off again she seemed to sit in his mind on the top of a slope up which he occasionally clambered and caressed her eagerly on these visits she would buttonhole him with talk and ask him questions so that he might linger but even while she buttonholed his gaze would become abstracted and off he slid leaving her peering after him over the edge filled with a mixture of affection respect for his work pride in him and amusement end of section five
Section 6 of The Pastor's Wife by Elizabeth von Arnim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 6. You might as well try, she thought, to buttonhole water. And she would laugh and go back to whatever she was doing with a blithe feeling that it was very ideal, this perfect independence of one another, this spaciousness of freedom to do exactly what each one liked. The immense tracts of time she had, how splendid this leisure was after the close detail of every hour at home in her father's study. When she had got over the first difficulties of German, and need no longer devote most of her day to it, she would get books from England and read and read. All the ones she had wanted to read, but had not been allowed to. Oh, the magnificence of marriage, thought Ingeborg, beating her hands together, the splendor of its liberations. She would go off in the morning with the punt full of books, and spend long glorious days away in the forest, lying on the green springy carpet of whortleberries, reading. She would most diligently work at furnishing her empty mind. She would sternly endeavor to train it not to jump. All the books she possessed she had brought with her, and spread over the living room. The wedding presents, which had enriched her with Hardy and Meredith and Kipling and Tennyson and Ruskin and her own books she had had as a girl. These were three, the Christian year given to her on her confirmation by her father, Longfellow's poems given her on her eighteenth birthday by her mother, and Dumas' Tulipe Noir given her as a prize for French because Judith did not know any, one summer when a French governess was introduced, thoughtlessly, the bishop said afterwards, into the palace. This lady had been removed from the palace again a little later with care, every corner of her room being scrupulously disinfected by the searching of Richards who found, however, nothing except one book in a yellow paper cover called Bibi et Lulu, Mère de Montparnasse, and even this was not in her room at all, but in Judith's, beneath some stockings. Herr Dremel took up one of the wedding volumes, when first he saw them in the sitting-room, and turned its pages. It was the shaving of Shagpat. Tut, tut, he said presently, putting it down. Why, Robert? asked Ingeborg, eager to hear what he thought. But he patted her abstractedly, already slid off again down into regions of reality, the regions in which his brain incessantly worked out possible chemical combinations, and forgot with completeness that sometimes even surprised himself that he had a wife. Invariably, however, he found it pleasant on re-emerging to remember her. She asked to be shown his experimental fields, and he took her with him very amiably one hot morning, promising to explain them to her. But instantly on reaching them he became absorbed, and after she had spent an hour sitting on a stone at the edge of a strip of lupins beneath a haggard little fir tree which gave the solitary bit of shade in that burning desert watching him going up and down the different strips examining apparently every single plant with johann she began to think she had better go home and look after dinner and waving good-bye to him which she did not see she went a day or two later she asked whether it would not be good and pleasant that his mother should come over to tea with them soon. He replied amiably that it would be neither good nor pleasant. She asked whether it might not be a duty of theirs to invite her. He replied after consideration, perhaps. She asked whether he did not love his mother. He replied unhesitatingly, no. 
she then went and sat on his knee and caught hold of his ears and pulled his head up so that he should look at her but robert she said well little sheep since their marriage he had instinctively left off calling her a lamb the universe which for a time she had managed to reduce into just a setting for one little female thing had arranged itself into its proper lines again the lamb had become a sheep a little one but yet no longer and never again a lamb he was glad he had been able to be so thoroughly in love he was glad he had so promptly applied the remedy of marriage his affection for his wife was quite satisfactory it was calm it was deep it interfered with nothing she held the honourable position he had always even at his most enamoured moments known she would ultimately fill the position next best in his life after the fertilizers his house so long murky with widows was now a bright place because of her approaching poetry he likened her to a little flitting busy bird in spring always he was pleased when she came and perched on his knee well little sheep he said smiling at her as she looked very close into his eyes her face seen so near was charming in its delicate detail in its young perfection of texture and colouring scrutinizing her eyes he was glad to notice once again how intelligent they were presently there would be sturdy boys tumbling about the garden with eyes like that grey and honest and intelligent his boys carrying on far more efficiently the work he had begun well little sheep he said suddenly moved oughtn't one to love one's mother she asked perhaps but one does not do you oh poor mother said ingeborg quickly her mother far away was already becoming a rather sad and quite tender memory all those days and years on a sofa and all the days and years still to come now she knew better now that she was married herself what it must have been like to be married to the bishop to have twenty years of unadulterated bishop she no longer wondered at the sofa she was full of understanding and pity one does no doubt at the beginning said herr dremmel and then leaves off is that all children are born for that they may leave off loving us he became cautious he talked of the general and the individual of many mothers and some mothers of the mothers of the present generation he called them the gavizina and the mothers of the generation to be born he called them the verdende and presently as she sat rather enigmatically silent on his knee he developed affection for his mother explaining no doubt that it had always been there but like many other good things when life was busy and a man had little time to go back and stir them had lain dormant and he now thought indeed he recognized that it would be excellent to urge her to come over soon and spend an afternoon or still better a morning but you're not here in the morning said ingeborg ah that is true i am present however at dinner but nobody ever knows when i might perhaps arrive early in this way the elder frau dremmel who had her pride to consider as the widow of her neglectful son's traditionally appreciative father and who would consequently never have taken what she called in her broodings the first step did about seven weeks after the marriage cross the threshold of her daughter-in-law's home chapter fourteen the visit was arranged to begin the following friday at four for ingeborg thought the afternoon feeling was altogether more favourable to warmth 
than anything you were likely to get before midday, and Johann drove in to Munich to fetch Frau Dremmel in time for that hour. There was to be tea out in the garden the first thing, because tea lubricates the charities, and then, with the aid of a dictionary, conversation. Ingeborg had had time to think out her mother-in-law, and was firm in her resolve that no artificial barrier, such as language, should stand in the way of the building up of affection. If necessary, she might even weave the German for giants, umbrellas, bees, and spectacles into a sentence as a conversational opening, and try her mother-in-law with that. And if Frau Drummel showed the least responsiveness to either of these subjects, she might go on to wax, fingers, thunder, and beards, and end with princes, boats, and shoulders. That would be three sentences. She could not help thinking they would be pregnant with conversational possibilities. There would be three replies, and Frau Dremmel, being in her own language, would, of course, enlarge. Then Ingeborg would open her dictionary and look up the words salient in the enlargement, and when she had found th them, smile back, brightly comprehending and appreciative. This, including having tea, would take, she supposed, about fifty minutes. Then they would walk a little up and down in the shade, pointing out the rye field to each other and that would be another ten minutes, perhaps. Then at five, she supposed, Frau Dremmel would ask for and obtain the carriage and go away again. Ingeborg made up her mind to kiss her at the end when the visit had reached the doorstep stage. It would not be difficult, she thought. The doorstep, she well knew, was a place of enthusiasms. She and Ilsa were immensely active the whole morning preparing, both of them imbued with much the same spirit with which, as children, they prepared parties for their dolls. But this was a live doll who was coming, and they were making real cakes which she would actually eat. The cakes were of a variety of shapes, or rather contortions. The coffee was of a festival potency. Sandwiches meant to be delicate and slender were cut, but under the very knife grew bulky. It must be the strong German air, Ingeborg thought, watching them, perplexed by this conduct, and there were the first gooseberries. When the table was set out under the lime trees and finished off with a jug of roses, she gazed at her work in admiration and the further she got away from it, the more delightful it looked. Nearer it was still attractive, but more with the delusive attractiveness of tables at a school treat. Perhaps there was too much food, she thought. Perhaps it was the immense girth of the sandwiches, but down from the end of the path it looked so charming that she wished she could paint it in watercolors. The great trees, the tempered sunlight, the glimpse of the old church at one end, the glimpse of the embosomed lake at the other, and in the middle, set out so neatly with such a grace of spotlessness, the table of her first tea-party. Frau Dremmel arrived in a black bonnet with a mauve flower in its front to mark that ten years had been at work upon the mitigation of a grief. Her son came out of his laboratory when he heard the crashes of the carriage among the stones and holes of the village street, and he was ready at the door to help her down. He was altogether silent, for he had been torn from the middle of counting and weighing the grains in samples of different treated rye, and would have to begin the last saucerful all over again. Beside this brevity, Ingeborg, in a white frock and wearing the buckled shoes of youth, with the sun shining on her freckled fairness, 
and bare neck and her mouth framed into welcoming smiles looked like a child she certainly did not look like anybody's wife and the last thing in the world that she at all resembled was the wife of a german pastor again frau dremmel as she had done that day at Muck, turned her eyes slowly all over her while she was receiving her son's abstracted kiss but she said nothing except to her son guten tag and passively submitted to ingeborg's shaking both her hands which were clothed in the black cotton of decent widowhood do say something robert murmured ingeborg say how glad i am say all the things i'd say if i could say things herr dremmel gazed at his wife a moment collecting his thoughts why should one say anything he said she is a simple woman no longer young my wife he said to his mother desires me to welcome you on her behalf ach said frau dremmel ingeborg began to usher her along the passage towards the back door and the garden frau dremmel however turned aside halfway down it into the living room oh not in there cried ingeborg we're going to have tea in the garden robert please tell her but looking round for help she found robert had gone and there was the sound of a key being turned in a lock frau dremmel continued to enter the living room before she could be stopped she had arranged herself firmly on its sofa but tea said ingeborg following her and gesticulating tea you know out there in the garden she pointed to the door and she pointed to the window frau dremmel slowly took off her gloves and rolled them together and undid her bonnet strings and looked at the door and at the window and back again at her daughter-in-law but did not move then ingeborg making a great effort at gay cordiality and determined that when words failed affectionate actions should fill up the gaps bent over the figure on the sofa and took its arm won't you come she said adding a sentence she had taken special pains to get by heart liebe schwiegermutter and smilingly but yet when it came to touching her rather gingerly and certainly with her heart in her mouth she gently pulled at her sleeve frau dremmel stared up at her without moving liebe schwiegermutter tea garden better said ingeborg still smiling but now quite hot she could not remember a single german word except liebe schwiegermutter frau dremmel urged and encouraged was finally got out of the house and into the garden and along between the gooseberry bushes to where the tea-table stood and an armchair for her with a cushion on it she went with plain reluctance she did not cease to stare at her daughter-in-law especially her gaze lingered on her feet becoming aware of this ingeborg tried to hide them but you cannot hide feet that are being walked on and when she sat down to pour out the coffee she found her short skirt was incapable of hiding anything lower than above her ankles she grew nervous she spilt the milk and dropped a spoon beside the rigid figure in the armchair she seemed and felt terribly fluid and uncontrolled the cheek that was turned to her mother-in-law flushed hotly she acutely knew her mother-in-law was observing this and that made it hotter if only thought ingeborg she would look at something else or say something over the rim of her cup however frau dremmel's eyes moved up and down and round and through the strange creature her son had married the rest of her was almost wholly motionless ingeborg had nervously swallowed three cups of the black stuff before frau dremmel was half through one 
At last a German word flashed into her mind, and she flung herself on it. Sohn wunderschön, she cried, waving her hands comprehensively over all the scenery. For an instant Frau Dremmel removed her eyes from her daughter-in-law's warm and quivering body to follow her gesture, but seeing nothing soon got them back again. She made no comment on the scenery. Her face remained wholly impassive, and Ingeborg realized that the rye field would be no use as a means of entertainment. She could not again say shown, and the meal went on in silence. Frau Dremmel's method of eating it was to begin a piece of each of the cakes and immediately leave it off. This afflicted Ingeborg, who had supposed them to be very lovely cakes. Frau Dremmel's place at the table, she had pulled her chair close up to it, was asterisked with begun and abandoned cakes. On the other hand, she ate many of the sandwiches, and they drew forth the only word she said to Ingeborg during the whole of tea. Fleisch, said Frau Dremmel, removing her eyes for one moment from Ingeborg to the sandwiches that were being offered her, and with a dingy, investigating forefinger, lifting up that portion of each sandwich which may be described as its lid. Ja, ja, said Ingeborg responsibly, delighted at this flicker of life. It was, however, the only one. After it, silence, complete and impenetrable, settled down on Frau Dremmel. She did not even speak to her son when half an hour later he came out in search of the coffee he had failed to find on his doormat. Her manners prevented her, in his house, on this first visit after his marriage, from uttering the unmanageable truths that come so naturally from the mouths of neglected mothers. And except for those she had nothing to say to him. Herr Dremmel expected nothing. His deeply engaged thoughts left no room in him for anything but a primitive simplicity. He was hungry and he ate, thirsty and he drank. The silent figure at the table, of whose presence every nerve in Ingeborg's body was conscious, produced no impression on him whatever. Robert, do tell your mother how I really do want to talk to her if only I could, said Ingeborg, pressing her hands together in her lap and tying and untying her handkerchief into knots. There were little beads on her upper lip. The rings of her hair on her temples were quite damp. He glanced at his mother, drawn up and taut in her chair, and immediately she turned her eyes on to him and stared back at him steadily. Little one, he said, I have told you she is a simple woman, not used to or capable of wielding the weapons of social arts. Be simple, too, and all will be well. But I am being simple, protested Ingeborg. I'm dumb. I'm blank. What can I be simpler than that? Then all is well. Give me coffee. He ate and drank in silence and got up to go away again. Frau Dremmel looked at him and said something. Is it the carriage? asked Ingeborg. She wants to go indoors, said Herr Dremmel. Indoors? She says she does not like mosquitoes. He went away into the house. There was nothing for it but to follow. As they reached the back door, the church clock struck five. But Ingeborg, glancing at her mother-in-law's impassive face, saw the sound meant nothing to her. She followed her into the living room and watched her helplessly as she arranged herself once more on the sofa. When the clock struck half-past five, she was still on it. She seemed to be waiting. For what was she waiting? Ingeborg asked herself, whose handkerchief was now rubbed 
into a hard ball between her nervous hands impossible either to move her or communicate with her rigidly she sat her eyes examining the room and each object in it but yet not for an instant missing the least of her daughter-in-law's movements ingeborg seized her dictionary and grammar and made a final effort to build a bridge out of them across which their souls might even now go out to meet each other but frau dremmel did not seem to understand the nature of her efforts and only stared with a deepened blankness when ingeborg read her out a sentence from the grammar that dealt with whether they were not that day having what was she waiting for seven o'clock struck and still she waited the clock in the room ticked through the minutes and every half hour they could hear the church clock striking ingeborg brought her a footstool brought her a cushion brought her in extremity a glass of water began to sew at a torn duster left off sewing at it fluttered nervously among the pages of her grammar poured in her dictionary and always frau dremmel watched her she found herself struggling against a tendency to think of her mother-in-law as it at seven she heard ilsa go home singing happy ilsa able to go away soon afterward she finally faltered into immobility giving up sitting now quite still herself in her chair the flush faded from her cheek pale and crumpled it was her and robert's supper time soon it would be their bedtime quite soon it would be to-morrow and then it would be next week and then there would be winter coming on was this visit never to end at eight it at last became plain to her that what frau dremmel was waiting for must be supper this was terrible for there was none at least there was only that repetition of tea and breakfast that made her and robert's lives so wholesome she had calculated the visit on the basis of tea only and had prepared only and elaborately for that for half an hour she sat on and hoped she was mistaken she did not know that in east prussia if you are invited to tea you also stay to supper but at half past eight she realized that there was nothing for it but to go and fetch it in when the ruins of the same meal that had been offered her once already were produced a second time and set out clumsily on the unaccustomed living-room table among the pushed-aside merediths and kiplings the bones of this skeleton being slowly put together under her very eyes and ingeborg at last by ceasing to go in and out fetching things and sinking into a chair indicated that that was all frau dremmel after waiting a little longer opened her mouth and startled her daughter-in-law by speech brett Kotoffel said frau dremmel ingeborg sat up quickly after the hours of silence it was uncanny brett Kotoffel said frau dremmel did you did you speak said ingeborg staring at her brett Kotoffel said frau dremmel a third time ingeborg jumped up and ran across the passage to the laboratory door robert robert she cried twisting the handle come come quickly your mother she's talking she's saying things there was the same excitement and wonder in her voice as there is in that of a parent whose baby has suddenly and for the first time said papa herr dremmel came out at once from the sound of her he felt something must have happened she seized him and pulled him into the living-room now listen she said holding him there facing the sofa herr dremmel looked perplexed what is it little one he asked listen she'll say it again soon said ingeborg eagerly what is it mother he asked in german frau dremmel without moving her head ran her eyes over the table 
are there not even not even she began but stopped she was evidently combating an emotion thunder of heaven said herr dremmel looking from one woman to the other what is it but frau dremmel was not able after hours of waiting for a supper that seemed to her in every detail a studied insult on her daughter-in-law's part to bear harshness from her son drawing out a handkerchief that had no end and that reached to her eyes while yet remaining in her pocket she began to cry ingeborg was appalled she ran to her and kneeling down begged her in english to tell her what was the matter she called her liebe Swagermutter over and over again she stroked her sleeve she patted her she even laid her head on her lap but frau dremmel for the first time did not notice her she was saying detached things into her handkerchief and they were all for her son a widow wept frau dremmel a widow for ten years when i think of your dear father how much he thought of me my first visit my visit on your marriage treated as though i were anybody forced to drink coffee out of doors like a homeless animal no sofa no real table flocks of mosquitoes no supper no supper at all nothing prepared for me for the mother for your sainted father's wife his cherished wife long before you were thought of if it had not been for me you would not have been here at all nor she and i am to go home unfed uncared for not even the least one has a right to expect given one not even what the poorest peasant has each night not even again she said the magic word brat kartoffel there there said ingeborg soothingly stroking her anxiously there there robert what is brat kartoffel but never mind never mind said frau dremmel wiping her eyes only to weep afresh soon i shall be with him with him again with your dear father and this this is nothing oh nothing it is only the will of god there there said ingeborg anxiously stroking her chapter fifteen it was not until some days later that she discovered the reason for her mother-in-law's tears she could get no information from herr dremmel his thoughts were not to be pinned a minute to such a subject he swept her questionings away with the wave of the arm of one who sweeps his surroundings clear of rubbish and the most that could be extracted from him was a general observation as to the small amount of good to be obtained from proximities but ingeborg one afternoon walking longer than usual facing the hot sun and the flies and sand of the road beyond the village to see where it led to instead of as she generally did exploring footpaths in the forest came after much heat and exertion to a thicket of trees that were not firs or pines but green cool things oaks and acacias and silver birches and going through them along a grass-grown road fanning herself with her hat as she walked in the pleasant shade found herself stopped by a white gate a notice telling her she was not to advance further and a garden beyond the flower-beds and long untidy grass of this garden she saw a big steep-roofed house built high on a terrace on the terrace a dog was lying panting with its tongue out nothing else alive was in sight and there were no sounds except the rustling of the leaves over her head and such faint chirping as birds make in july who lives in that big white house way over there she asked herr dremmel when next she saw him which was not till that evening at supper and she nodded her head her hands being full of the coffee-pot in the direction of the north herr dremmel was ruffled he had been plunged in parish affairs 
since breakfast for it was the day appointed by him and recurring once a fortnight into which by skilful organizing he packed them all the world in consequence on every second tuesday appeared to him a place of folly people were born and lived embedded in ancient folly the folly of their parents already stale when they got it was handed down to them intact not shot at all thought herr dremmel on these alternate tuesdays with the smallest ray of perception of different and better things the school children were still learning about bismarck's birthday the schoolmaster was still laboriously computing attendances and endeavouring to obey the difficult law which commanded him to cane the absent the elders of the church were still refusing to repair the steeple in time the confirmation class was still meeting explanations and exhortations with thick inattention the ecclesiastical authorities were still demanding detailed reports of progress where there was not and could not be progress couples were still forgetting marriage until the last hurried moment and then demanding it with insistent cries infants were still being hastily christened before the same neglects that killed those other infants who else might have been their proud and happy grandparents carried them off and peasants were still slinking away at the bare mention of intelligence and manure he was exceedingly ruffled for while he had been wrestling with these various acquiescences and evasions his real work was lying neglected out there in the sun in there in the laboratory and a whole day of twelve precious hours was gone for ever and when ingeborg said who lives in that big white house herr dremmel with his wasted day behind him and the continued brassiness of the heavens above him and the persistence in that place of trees of mosquitoes stared at her a moment and then said bringing his hand down violently on the table hell and devils who said ingeborg we must call on them at once what my patron he will be incensed that i have not presented you sooner i forgot him that will be another day lost these claims these social claims he got up and took some agitated steps about the table no sooner he said frowning angrily at the path has one settled one thing then there appears another to-day all day the poor to-morrow all day the rich do we call continuously all day both equally obstinate both equally encased from head to foot in the impenetrable thick armour of intellectual sloth how he inquired turning to her with all the indignant wrath of the thwarted worker is a man to work if he lives in a constant social whirl ingeborg sat regarding him with astonishment he can't she said but do we whirl robert would one call what we do here whirling what when my work has been neglected all day to-day on behalf of the poor and will be neglected all day to-morrow on behalf of the rich but why will it take us all day a man must prepare he cannot call as he is he must said herr dremmel with irritable gloom wash and he added with still greater irritation and gloom there has to be a clean shirt but began ingeborg he waved her into silence i do not like he said with a magnificent sweep of his arm clean shirts she stared at him with the parted lips of interest i am not at home in them i am not myself in a clean shirt for at least the first two hours don't let's call said ingeborg we're so happy as we are nay said herr dremmel immediately brought to reason by his 
wife's support of his unreason but we must call there are duties no decent man neglects and i am a decent man i will send a messenger to inquire if our visit to-morrow will be acceptable i will put on my shirt early in order to get used to it and i will endeavour by a persistent amiability so long as the visit lasts to induce my patron to forget that i forgot him herr dremmel had for some time past been practising forgetting his patron he had found this course after divers differences of opinion simplest and most convenient the patron baron glombeck of glombeck was a serious real christian who believed that the poor should like some vast pudding that will not otherwise turn out well be constantly stirred up and he was unable to approve of a pastor who except in church and on every alternate tuesday forbore to stir it was for this forbearance however that herr dremmel was popular in the parish before his time there had been a constant dribble of pastor all over it making it never a moment safe from intrusion here pastor dremmel might be fiery in the pulpit but he was quite quiet out of it he was like a good watchdog savage in its kennel and indifferent when loose kokensee had as one man refused to support the patron when he had wished some time before to bring about herr dremmel's removal its pastor did not go from house to house giving advice its pastor was invisible and absorbed these were great things in a clergyman and should not lightly be let go nothing could be done in the face of the parish's opposition and kokensee kept its pastor but baron glombeck ceased to patronize divine service in kokensee and until herr dremmel brought ingeborg to make his wedding call he had had no word with him for three years the dremmels had announced themselves for four o'clock and when they drove up to the house along the shady grass road and through the white gate they were met on the steps of the terrace by a servant who if he had been in redchester would have been wilson on the top of the steps stood baron glambeck tightly buttoned up in black formal grave further back beneath the glass roof of the terrace stood his wife tightly buttoned up in black formal grave they were both if ingeborg had known it extremely correct according to the standards of their part of the country they were unadorned smoothed out black she abundant in her smoothness he spare in his and they greeted ingeborg with exactly the cordiality suitable to the reception of one's pastor's new wife who ought to have been brought to call long ago but was not in any way responsible for those bygones which studded their memory so disagreeably in connection with her husband a cordiality with the chill on dignity and coats of arms pervaded the place monograms with coronets were embroidered and painted on everything one sat on or touched the antlers of deer shot by the baron with the dates and places of their shooting affixed to each bristled thickly on the walls they saw no servant who was not a man please take your hat off said the baroness in english carefully keeping her voice slightly on the side of coldness ingeborg was very nearly frightened she would have been quite frightened if she had been less well trained by the bishop in unimportance she had however owing to this training left off being shy years before she had so small an opinion of herself that there was no room in her at all for self-consciousness and she arrived at the glambecks in her usual condition of excessive naturalness ready to talk 
ready to be pleased and interested. But it was conveyed to her instantly on seeing the baroness, there was an astonishment in the way she looked at her, that her clothes were not right, and just the request or suggestion or demand, she did not know which of these it really was, that she should take off her hat, made her realize she was on new ground, in places where the webs of strange customs were thick about her feet. She was, for a moment, very nearly frightened. "'You will be more comfortable,' said the Baroness, without your hat. She took it off obediently, glancing beneath her eyelashes, as she drew out the pins at the Baroness's smooth black head and unwrinkled black body, perceiving with the clearness of a revelation that that was how she ought to look herself. Skimpier, of course, for the years had not yet had their will with her, but she ought to be a version of the effect done in lean. She resolved, in her thirst after fulfilled duty, to get a black dress and practice. She thought it wisest not to think what her hair must be looking like when her hat was off, for she had not expected to be hatless, and well did she know it by nature for a straggler, a thing inclined to wander from the grasp of hairpins and go off on its own account into wantonings and rings which were all the more conspicuous because of their lurid approach in colouring to the beards of her ancestors, sun-kissed Scandinavians who walked the earth in their strength hung, according to the way the light took them, with beards that were either the colour of flames or of apricots or of honey. Well, if they would make her take her hat off, by the time she was on the sofa, she was presently put on in the inner hall, she had caught up with her usual condition of naturalness again, and sat on it, interested and forgetful of self. The Baroness's eyes wandered over her, and they wandered over her with much the same quality in their look that had been in her mother-in-law's. And always when they got to her feet they lingered. Her skirt again reached only to her ankles. All her outdoor skirts did that. But I can't help having feet, thought Ingeborg, noticing this. They were small by nature, and the artful shoes of the London shoemaker who had shared in providing her and Judith's trousseau made them seem still smaller. She did not try to hide them as she had tried when Frau Dremmel stared. It was Frau Dremmel's heavy silence that had unnerved her. These people talked, and the Baroness's English was reassuringly good. Nobody, the Baroness was thinking, and also simultaneously the Baron, who was fit to be a pastor's wife, had feet like that. Little, incapable feet. Nobody, indeed, who was a really nice woman had them. One left off having them when one was a child, and never had them again. The errands of domesticity on which one ran, the perpetual up and down of stairs, the hours standing on the cold stone floor of servants' quarters, seeing that one was not cheated, the innumerable honourable activities that beautified and dignified womanhood necessitated large loose shoes. A true wife's feet should have room to spread and flatten. Feet were one of those numerous portions of the body that had been devised by an all-wise creator for use and not show. As for the rest of Frau Pastor's appearance, there were, it is true, some young ladies in the country who dressed rather like that in the summer, but they were ladies in the Glambeck set, ladies of family or married into family, that the person who had married one's pastor, a man 
whose father had been of such obscure beginnings and indeed continuations that even his having been dead ten years hardly made him respectable should dress in this manner was a catastrophe already they had suffered too much from the conduct of their loose-talking unchristian pastor and now instead of bringing a neat woman in black to be presented to them a neat woman with a gold chain perhaps round her high black collar it being a state occasion and she after all newly married but only a very light chain and inherited not bought and a dress so sufficient that it reached beyond and enveloped anything she might possess in the way of wrist or ankle or throat here was the most unsuitable wife he could have chosen short of course of marrying among jews while as for her hair when it came to her hair their thoughts ceased to formulate that small and flattened and disordered head like a boy's head run wild like something on fire which emerged when she took off her hat coffee was served on the big table in front of the sofa the baroness sat beside ingeborg and the baron and herr dremmel drew up chairs opposite the coffee was good and there was one excellent cake no gooseberries no flowers no unwieldy sandwiches just plainness and excellence the two men talked to each other not to the women the baron stiffly and on his guard herr dremmel taking immense pains to be amiable and not offend between them hung the memories of altercations between them also hung the knowledge of the three years during which the baron and his wife as a result of the last and hottest difference of opinion had attended divine service in a church that did not belong to them they had altogether cut kokensee for three years their private gallery in the church in which their ancestors had once a fortnight feared god had been a place where mice enjoyed themselves its chairs were covered with dust its hymn books growing brown still lay open on the place the glambacks had praised god out of last such a withdrawal of approval would have made any other pastor's life a thing of chill and bleakness herr dremmel hardly observed it he had no vanities he was pleased that the rival pastor should be gratified he cared nothing for comment and had no eye for shrugs and smiles his eyes his thoughts were wanted for his work and he found it a relief a release from at least one interruption when his patron took to leaving him frigidly alone indeed when he drove up to the glambeck's house and remembered he had not had to go there for three peaceful years he felt really grateful and he showed his gratitude by performing immense feats of social pleasantness during the visit he agreed gigantically with everything the baron said whatever subject was touched upon very cautiously for the baron mistrusted all subjects with herr dremmel he instantly dragged it off the dangerous shoals of the immediate and close up to a cosmic height and distance a height and distance so enormous that even what the kaiser said last became a negligible tinkling and conscience and dogma quavered off into silence and he explained to the baron who guardedly said perhaps that though people's opinions might and did vary seen near if one spread them out wide enough pushed them back far enough took them up high enough bored them down deep enough got them away from detail and loose from foregrounds one would come at last to the great mother opinion of them all in whose huge lap men curled themselves up contentedly like the happy identities they indeed were and went after kissing each other 
in placidest agreement to sleep. Perhaps, said the Baron, personalities, immediate interests, duties, daily life, were swamped in the vast seas in which, with politeness but determination, Herr Dremmel took the Baron swimming. One only needed, he repeated, warm with the wish to keep in roomy regions, to trace back any two opinions, however bitterly different they now were, far enough to get at last to the point where they sweetly kissed. Perhaps, said the Baron, one only needed, went on Herr Dremmel, making all embracing movements with his arms. But the Baron cleared his throat and began to enumerate contrary facts. Herr Dremmel agreed at once that he was right just there, and pushed the point of kissing back a little further. The Baron went after him with more facts. Herr Dremmel again agreed, and went back further. In this way, they came at last to the Garden of Eden, beyond which the Baron refused to budge, alleging that further back than that no Christian could go, and even in that he repudiated the kiss. He was convinced, though he concealed it, that at no period of human thought could his and Herr Dremmel's opinions, for example, have kissed. But it was an amiable view, and Herr Dremmel was extremely polite, and was bent evidently on peace, and the Baron, recognizing this, became less distrustful. He even contributed a thought of his own at last, after having been negatively occupied in dissecting Herr Dremmel's, and said that in his opinion it was details that made life difficult. The Baroness, who loved him and overheard him, was anxious he should have more coffee with plenty of milk in it after this. Men, she explained to Ingeborg in careful English as she poured it out, need much nourishment because of all this headwork. I suppose they do, said Ingeborg. When I was first married, I remembered it was my chief pride and joy that at last I had some one of my very own to nourish. Oh, said Ingeborg. It is an instinct, said the Baroness, who had the air of administering a lesson in a true woman. She wishes to nourish, and naturally the joy of nourishing two is double the joy of nourishing one. I suppose it is, said Ingeborg, who did not quite follow. When my first born, oh, yes, said Ingeborg, glad to understand. When my firstborn was laid in my arms, I cannot express, Frau Pastor, what happiness I had in being given yet another human being to nourish. I suppose it was delightful, said Ingeborg, politely sympathetic. The Baroness's eyes drooped a moment inquiringly from Ingeborg's face to her body. For six years, she went on, after a pause, I had a fresh reason for happiness regularly at Christmas. I suppose you have the loveliest Christmases here, said Ingeborg, like the ones in books, with trees. Trees? Naturally we have trees, but I had babies as well. Every Christmas for six years, regularly, my Christmas present to my dear husband was able to be a baby. What? said Ingeborg, opening her eyes. A fresh one? Naturally it was fresh. One does not have the same baby twice. No, of course not, but how did you hide it till Christmas Day? It could not, naturally, said the Baroness stiffly, be as much a surprise as a present that was not a baby would have been. But it was for all practical purposes hidden till Christmas. On that day it was born, Oh, but I think that was very wonderful, said Ingeborg, genuinely pleased by such neatness. She leaned forward in her enthusiasm, and clasped her hands about her knees. Yes, said the Baroness, relaxing a little before this flattering appreciation. Yes, it was. Some people would call it chance, but we at Christmas knew it was heaven. 
but how punctual said ingeborg admiringly how tidy yes yes mused the baroness relaxing still more in the warm moisture of remembrance they were happy times happy happy times one's little ones coming and going oh did they go as well as come asked ingeborg lowering her voice in condolence about one's knees i mean and the house oh yes said ingeborg relieved every year the christmas candles shining down on an addition to our treasures every year the gifts of past christmases gathered about the tree again bigger and stronger instead of being lost or broken as they would have been if they had been any other kind of gift but what happened when there weren't any more to give then i gave my husband cigar cases oh after all most women have to do that all their lives i d did not grumble when heaven ceased to provide me with a present for him i knew how to bow my head and went and bought one there are excellent cigar cases at wertheim's in konigsberg if you wish to give one to herr pastor next christmas they do not come unsown at the corners by july or august in the way those one buys in other shops do ah yes happy years happy happy years first the six years of great joy collecting my family and then the years of happiness bringing it up of course you are fond of children end of section six Section 7 of The Pastor's Wife by Elizabeth von Arnim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 7. I've never had any. Naturally you have not, said the Baroness, stiffening again. So I don't know, said Ingeborg. But every true woman loves little children, said the Baroness. But they must be there, said Ingeborg. One has God-implanted instincts said the baroness but one must see something to practice them on said ingeborg a true woman is all love said the baroness in a voice that sounded very like scolding i suppose she is said ingeborg who felt that she never could have met one she had a vision of something altogether soft and squelchy and humid and at the same time wonderful are any of your children at home she asked thinking she would like to test her instincts on the younger glambecks they are grown up and gone out into the world some far away in other countries ah yes one is lonely the baroness became loftily plaintive it is the lot of parents lonely lonely i had five daughters it was a great relief to get them all married there was naturally the danger where there were so many of some of them staying with us always but then you wouldn't have been lonely said ingeborg but then frau pasta they would not have been married no and then said ingeborg interested you wouldn't have been able to feel lonely the baroness gazed at her these things are nice you know said ingeborg leaning forward again in her interest one does like it somehow being sad you know and thinking how lonely one is of course it's much more delicious to be happy but not being happy has its jolliness there's a perfume she sought about in her mind it's like a wet day it looks gloomy and miserable compared to what yesterday was like but there is an enjoyment and things she hesitated groping things seem to grow different ones yet they are beautiful too but the baroness who did not follow and did not want to for it was not her business to listen to her pastor's wife drooped an inquiring eye again over ingeborg's body and cut her tendency to talk 
more than was becoming in her position short by remarking that she was still very thin when they had sat there till the coffee was cold ingeborg in a pause of the talk got up to go the three others stared at her without moving even her own robert stared uncomprehending it seemed a lame thing to have to explain that she was now going home but that was what she did at last murmur down to the motionless and surprised baroness are you not feeling well inquired the baroness what is it ingeborg asked herr dremmel the baron went over to a window and opened it a little faint no doubt he said adding something about young wives the baroness asked her if she would like to lie down herr dremmel became alert and interested what is it little one he asked again getting up i think it would be good if the frau pastor rested a little before supper said the baroness getting up too certainly said herr dremmel quite eagerly and with a funny expression on his face ingeborg gazed from one to the other but robert she said wondering why he looked like that oughtn't we to go home dear frau pastor said the baroness quite warmly you will feel better presently believe me there is an hour still before supper come with me and you shall lie down and rest but robert said ingeborg astonished she was however taken away it seemed a sort of sweeping of her away through glass doors down a carpetless varnished passage into a spare bedroom and commanded to put herself on the high white bed with her head a little lower than her feet but she said why you will be better by supper time oh i know all these things said the baroness who was opening windows and had grown suddenly friendly do you feel sick sick she wondered whether the amount of cake she had eaten had appeared excessive she had had two pieces perhaps there was a rigid local custom prescribing only one she felt again that she was in a net of customs with nobody to explain the baroness seemed quite disappointed when she assured her she did not feel sick at all ought guests to feel sick was it a subtle way of drawing attention to the irrepressibleness of the host's food it then occurred to her that it might very possibly be the custom in these country places to put callers to bed for an hour in the middle of their call and that her omission to put her mother-in-law in there was one of the causes of her tears next to going home as quickly as one did in england she felt going to bed was altogether the best thing this thought that it must be the custom made her instantly pliable with every gesture of politeness she hastened to clamber up on to the billows of feathers and white quilt there was a smell of naphthalin as she sank downwards a smell of careful warfare carried on incessantly with moth the baroness came away from letting in floods of air and looked at her i am sure she said you do feel sick i think i do a little said ingeborg anxious to give every satisfaction it was evidently the right thing to say for her hostess's face lit up she went out of the room quickly and came back with some eau de cologne and a fan ingeborg watched her with bright alert eyes over the edge of a billow of feathers while she fetched a little table and brought it to the bed and arranged these things on it how odd it was she thought greatly interested was the baron simultaneously putting robert to bed in some other room she felt she had grown suddenly popular that she was doing all the right things at last contrasted with its loftiness during the first part of the call the baroness's manner was quite human and warm 
she put the table close to her side and told her the best thing she could do quite the best thing would be to try and sleep a little if she wanted anything she was to ring and the maid tina would appear ah yes she said in conclusion standing for a moment looking down at her and heaving a great sigh that seemed to ingeborg somehow to be pleasurable ah yes when one has said a dear frau pastor one must say b ah yes and she went out again on tiptoe softly closing the door and leaving ingeborg in a state of extreme and active interest and interrogation when one has said a one must say b why must one and what was b what indeed if you came to that was a she listened a moment raised on her elbow her bright head more ruffled than ever after its descent into the billows then she slid down onto the slippery floor and ran across in her stockings to one of the big open windows it looked on to a tangle of garden a sort of wilderness of lilac bushes and syringa and neglected roses and rough grass and hemlock at the back of the house there was nobody anywhere to be seen and she got up on to the sill and sat there in great enjoyment swinging her feet for it all smelt very sweet at the end of the long hot day till she thought the hour the blessed hour must be nearly over then she stole back and rearranged herself carefully on the bed but this is the way of paying calls she thought pulling the quilt up tidily under her chin and waiting for what would be done to her next chapter sixteen they did not get away till nine o'clock there was supper at seven an elaborate meal and they sat over it an hour and a half then came more coffee served on the terrace by servants in white cotton gloves and half an hour later just before they left tea and sandwiches and cakes and fruit and beer ingeborg was now quite clear about the reason for her mother-in-law's tears she saw very vividly how dreadful her behaviour must have seemed that groaning supper-table that piling up as the end of the visit drew near of more food and more and more and the refreshment of bed in the middle i shall invite her all over again she said suddenly determined to make amends when she said this the carriage had finally detached them from sight and sound of the now quite cordial glombex and was heaving through the sand of the dark wooded road beyond their gate whom will the little one invite asked herr dremmel bending down he had got his arm round her and at the bigger joltings tightened his hold and lifted her a little his voice was tender and when he bent down there was an enveloping smell of cigars and wine mixed with the india rubber of his mackintosh ingeborg knew that for some reason she could not discover she had made herself popular there was the distinct consciousness of having suddenly halfway through the visit become a success and she was still going on being a success she felt but why robert was extraordinarily attentive too attentive really for oh what a wonderful night of stars and warm scents it was once they were in the open what a night what a marvel of a night and when he bent over her it was blotted out dear robert she did love him but away there on that low meadow far away over there where a white mist lay on the swampy places and the leaves of the flags that grew along the ditch stood up like silver spears in the moonlight one could imagine the damp cool fragrance 
rising up as one's feet stirred the grass the perfect solitariness and the perfect silence except for the bittern there was a bittern she had discovered in those swamps if she were over there now lying quite quiet on the higher ground by the ditch quite quiet and alone she would hear him presently solemnly booming whom will the little one invite asked herr dremmel bending down across the whole of the milky way and every single one of all the multitude of scents the night was softly throwing against her face he kissed her very kindly and at unusual length it lasted so long that she missed the smell of an entire clover field your mother said ingeborg when she again emerged heavens and earth said herr dremmel i know now what i did or rather didn't do i know now why she kept saying bratkatoffel oh robert she must have been hurt she must have thought i didn't care a bit and i did so want her to be happy why didn't you tell me tell you what little sheep about their having to be supper and about her having to go to bed to bed did the baron put you put me to bed herr dremmel bent down again and looked a little anxiously at as much of her face as he could see in the moonlight it seemed normal not in the least flushed or feverish he touched her cheek with his finger it was cool little one he said what is this talk of beds only it would save rather a lot of awful things happening if you would just give me an idea beforehand of what is expected it wouldn't take a minute i wouldn't disturb you at your work or anything but at some odd time breakfast for instance or while you're shaving if you would say about beds and things like that one couldn't guess it you know in redchester one didn't do it you see and it's such a really beautiful arrangement oh she suddenly flung her arms round him and held him tight i am glad i married one of you one of me herr dremmel again peered anxiously at her face one of you wonderful people you magnificent spacious people in redchester we got rid of difficulties by running away you face them and overcome them there isn't much doubt is there which is the finer he transferred his cigar to the hand that was round her shoulder and spread his right one largely over her forehead it was quite cool who went on ingeborg enthusiastically jerking her head away from his hand would have a custom that makes calls last five hours without rebelling you are too splendidly disciplined to rebel you don't you just set about finding some way of making the calls endurable and you hit on the nicest way i loved that hour in bed if only i'd known that the other day when your mother came the relief of it but my mother began herr dremmel in a puzzled voice then he added with a touch of severity your remarks my treasure are not in your usual taste you forget my mother is a widow oh don't widows do not widows what go to bed now kindly tell me he said with an impatience he concealed beneath calm for he had heard that a husband who wishes to become successfully a father has to accommodate himself to many moods what is it you are really talking about why about your not explaining things to me in time what things about your mother having to go to bed why should my mother have to go to bed oh robert because it's the custom it is not why do you suppose it is the custom what when i've just been put there and you saw me go ingeborg oh don't call me ingeborg ingeborg this is levity i am prepared for much accommodating of myself to whims in regard to food and kindred matters but am i to endure levity for nine months she stared at him 
you went to bed because you were ill he said i wasn't she said indignantly did he too think she did not know how to control herself in the presence of cake what you were not there was a note of such sharp disappointment in his voice that in her turn she peered at his face now kindly tell me robert she said giving his sleeve a slight pull what is it you are really talking about you did not feel faint you feel quite well you do not feel ill after all again the note of astonished disappointment but why should i feel ill then why did you ask to be taken home almost before we had arrived for the first time she heard anger in his voice anger and a great aggrievedness almost before we'd arrived we'd been there hours you hadn't told me a call meant supper almighty heaven he cried am i to dwell on every detail of life am i personally to conduct you over each of the inches of your steps do you regard me as an elementary school can you not imagine can you not calculate probabilities can you not construct some searchlight of inference of your own and illuminate with it the outline of at least the next few hours she gazed at him a moment in astonishment well she said if her father had asked her only one of these questions in that sort of voice she would have been without an answer beaten down and crushed but robert had not had the steady continuous frightening of her from babyhood he could not hold over her like an awful rod that she owed her very existence to him he could not claim perpetual gratitude for this remote tremendous gift bestowed on her in the days of her unconsciousness he was a kindly stranger appointed by the church to walk hand in hand with her along the path of grown-up life he had admired her and kissed her and quite often during their engagement had abased himself at her feet also she had seen him at moments such as shaving i believe she said after another astonished pause that you're scolding me and you're scolding me because you're angry with me and you're angry with me robert is it possible you're angry with me because i'm not ill he threw away his cigar and seized her in his arms and began to whisper voluminously into her ear what she kept on saying what you're tickling me what i can't hear but she did in the end hear and drew herself a little back from him to look at him with a new interest it seemed the oddest thing that he so busy so nearly always somewhere else in thought so deeply and frequently absent from the surface of life so entirely occupied by his work that often he could hardly remember he had a wife should want to have yet another object of the kind added unto him a child and that she who lived altogether on the surface who knew as it were the very taste of each of the day's minutes and possessed them all who never lost consciousness of the present and never for an instant let go of her awareness of the visible and of the now should be without any such desire but she said we're so happy we're so happy as we are it is nothing compared to what we would be but i haven't even begun to get used to this happiness yet to the one i've got you will infinitely prefer the one that is yet to come but robert don't rush me along don't let us rush past what we've got let us love all this thoroughly first he looked at her very gravely we have now been married two months he said i become anxious to-night i cannot tell you how glad i was and then it was nothing after all she gazed at him with a feeling of a new incumbency he had said the last words in a voice she did not know with a catch in it robert she said quickly putting out her hand and 
touching his with a little soft stroking movement she wished above all things to make him perfectly happy always she had loved making people happy and she was so grateful to him so grateful for the freedom she had got through him that just her gratitude even if she had not loved him would have made her try to do and be everything he wished but she did love him she certainly loved him and here was something he seemed to want beyond everything and that she alone could provide him with he turned his head away and as he did this did she see something actually glistening in his eyes glistening like something wet in an instant she had put her arms round him of course i do of course i want one she said rubbing her cheek up and down his mackintosh some heaps of course will have them everybody has them of course i'll soon begin don't mind my not having been ill to-night i'm so sorry i will be ill dear robert i don't know i had to be ill but i will be soon i'm sure i will be i i feel quite like soon being ill now he patted her face her face still turned away good little wife he said good little wife she felt nearer to him than she had ever felt so close in understanding and sympathy she had seen tears a man's tears of what tremendous depths of feeling were they not the signal the sentence a strong man's tears floated up from somewhere and hung about her mind she pressed him to her in a passion of desire to make him altogether happy to protect him from feeling too much she held him like that her cheek against his arm rubbing it up and down every now and then to show how well she understood till they got home when he lifted her down from the carriage at their door she slipped her hand round the back of his neck and kept it there a moment with the tenderest lingering touch dear robert she whispered her lips on his ear while he lifted her down and implicit in the words was the mother assurance the yearning mother promise oh little thing little man thing i'll take care of you she hung about the parlour and the passage while he went as he said for a moment into his laboratory for a final look around waiting for him in a strangely warmed exalted state entirely at one with him suddenly very intimate sure that after letting her see things so sacred as tears he would only want to spend the rest of the evening with her being comforted and reassured held close to her heart talking sweetly with her in the quiet dark garden but there were six saucerfuls of differently treated last year's rye ready on the laboratory table for counting and weighing herr dremmel beheld them and forgot the world he began to count and weigh he continued to count and weigh he ended by counting and weighing them all and it was dawn before satisfied and consoled for his lost afternoon it occurred to him that perhaps it might be bedtime chapter seventeen the winter came before ingeborg after many false alarms due to her extreme eagerness to give robert the happiness he wanted was able to assure him with certainty that he would presently become a father and i she said looking at him with a kind of surprised awe now that it had really come upon her i suppose i will be a mother herr dremmel remarked with dryness that he supposed in that case she would and refused to become enthusiastic until there was more certainty he had been disappointed during the summer so often her zeal to meet his wishes made her pounce upon the slightest little feeling of not being well and run triumphantly to his laboratory 
daring its locked door, defying its sacredness, to tell him the great news. She would stand there radiantly, saying things that sounded like paraphrases of the scripture, and almost the first German she really learned and used was the German so familiar in every household for being of good hope, for being in blessed circumstance. For some time Herr Dremmel greeted these tidings with emotion and excitement, but as the summer went on he had become so incredulous that she fainted twice in December before he was convinced. Then, indeed, for nearly a whole day, his joy was touching. One cannot, however, keep up such joy, and Ingeborg found that things after this brief upheaval of emotion settled back again into how they were before, except that she felt extraordinarily and persistently ill. Well, she had had the most wonderful summer. She had got that anyhow tucked away up the sleeve of her memory, and could bring it out and look at it when the days were wet and she felt cold and sick. The summer that year in East Prussia had been a long drought, a long bath of sunshine, and Ingeborg lived out in it in an ecstasy of freedom. Her body, light and perfectly balanced, did wonders of exploration in the mighty forests that began at the north of the Kokensee Lake, and went on without stopping to the sea. She would get Robert's dinner ready for him early, and then put some bread and butter and a cucumber into a knapsack with her German grammar, and paddle the punt down the lake, tie it up where the trees began and start. Nothing seemed to tire her. She would walk for miles along the endless forest tracks, just as much suited to her environment, just as harmonious and as much a creature of air and sunshine as the white butterflies that fluttered among the enormous pine trunks. Every now and then, for sheer delight in these things, she would throw herself down on the springy delicious carpet of whortleberries and lie still, watching the blue-green tops of the pine trees delicately swaying backwards and forwards far away over her head against the serene northern sky. They made a gentle sighing noise in the wind. It was the only sound, except the occasional cry of a woodpecker or the cry immensely distant of a hawk. Nobody but herself seemed to use the forests. It was the rarest thing that she met a woodman or children picking whortleberries. When she did, she was much stared at. The forests were quite out of the beat of tourists or foreigners, and the indigenous ladies were too properly occupied by indoor duties to wander, even if they liked forests, away from their home anchorage. And for those whose business sent them into these lonely places to come across somebody belonging to the class that can have dinner every day regularly in a house if it likes, and to the sex that ought to be there cooking, it was an amazement. The young lady, however, seemed so happy that they all smiled at her when she looked at them. They supposed she must be someone grown white in a town and come to stay the summer weeks with one of the crown foresters. That would explain her detachment from duty, her knapsack, and the color of her skin. Anyhow, just her passing made their dull day interesting, and they would watch her glinting in and out of the trees till at last, hardly distinguishable from one of the white butterflies, the distance took her. When she was quite hot, she would sit down in a carefully chosen spot where, if possible, a deciduous tree, a maple, or a bird cherry splashed its vivid green exquisitely against the peculiar misty bloom of the pink and grey that hung about the pine trunks, a tree that looked quite little down among these giants, 
hardly as if it reached to their knees and yet when she stood under it it was almost as big as the lime trees in the kokensee garden she did not sit in its shade she went some distance away where she could look at it quivering in the light and leaning her back against a pine tree she would eat her bread and cucumber and feel utterly filled with the love and glory of god impossible to reason about this feeling it was there it seemed in that summer to go with her wherever she went and whatever she did she walked in blessing it was in the light she thought looking round her the wonderful light the soft radiance of the forest it was in the air warm and fresh scented and pungent it was in the feel of the pine needles and the dry crisp last year's cones she crushed as she went along it was in the cushions of moss so green and cool that she stopped to pat them or in the hot lichen that came off in flakes when her feet brushed a root it was in being young and healthy and having had one's dinner and sitting quiet and getting rested and knowing the hours ahead were roomy it was in all these things everywhere and in everything she would pick up her german grammar in a quick desire to do something in return something that gave her real trouble shall one not say somehow thank you and she engulfed huge tracts of it on these expeditions learning pages of it by heart and repeating them aloud to the pine trees and the woodpeckers when the sun began to go down she set out for home sometimes losing her way for quite a long while and then she would hurry because of robert's supper and then she would get very hot and the combined heat and hurry and cucumber to which presently was added fatigue would end in one of those triumphal appearances later on in his laboratory to which he was growing so much accustomed in january when she was just a sick thing she thought of these days as something too beautiful to have really happened there was from the first no shyness about her on the subject of babies she had not considered it during her life at home for babies were never mentioned at the palace of course she thought remembering this omission because there were none and it would be as meaningless to talk about babies when there were none as it would be in kokensee to talk about bishops when there were none she arrived therefore at kokensee with her mind a blank from prejudice and finding the atmosphere thick with babies immediately with her usually uninquiring pliability adopted the prevailing attitude and was not shy either the neighborhood did not wait till they were born to talk about its own children it did not think of its children as unmentionable until they had been baptized into decency by birth they were important things the most important of all in the life of the women and it was natural to discuss them thoroughly the childless woman was a pitied creature the woman who had most children was proudest she might be poor and tormented by them but it was something she possessed more of than her neighbors ilsa had early inquired which room would be the nursery that obvious pattern of respectability baroness glambeck talked of births with a detail and interest only second to that with which she talked of deaths it seemed to her a most proper topic of conversation with any young married woman and on her returning the dremel call a fortnight after it had been made she was quite taken aback and annoyed to find it had become irrelevant owing to ingeborg's being perfectly well indeed this failure of ingeborg's entirely spoilt the visit the baroness who had arrived friendly withdrew into frost 
with the manner of one who felt she had been thawed on the last occasion on false pretenses impossible to meet one's pastor's wife and such an odd-looking and free-mannered one too with any familiarity except on the christian footing of impending birth or death a pastor's wife belonged to the class one is only really pleasant with in suffering or guilt offended yet forced to continue the call the baroness confined such conversation as she made to questions that had a flavour of hostility where was it possible to get such shoes and did the frau pastor think toes so narrow good for the circulation and the housework ingeborg could not believe this was the motherly lady who had fussed round her bed that day at glambeck she felt set away at a great distance from her on the other side of a gulf for the first time it was borne in upon her that her marriage made a difference to her socially that here in germany the gulf was a wide one she was a pastor's wife and when asked about her family which happened early and searchingly in the call could only give an impression of more pastors ah that is the same as what we call superintendent said the baroness nodding several times slowly on learning that ingeborg's father was a bishop and after a series of questions as to the frau pastor's sister's marriage nodded her head slowly several times again and informed ingeborg that what her sister had married was a schoolmaster like herr schultz said the baroness herr schultz being the village schoolmaster there was a photograph of judith on the table that caught and kept the baroness's eye and also in an even greater but more careful degree the baron's it was judith dressed in evening beauty bare-necked perfect ingeborg took it up with a natural pride in having such a lovely thing for her very own sister and handed it to the baroness here she is said ingeborg full of natural pride the baroness stared in real consternation what she said this is the schoolmaster's wife this is our pastor's sister-in-law i had thought she broke off and with a firm gesture put the photograph on the table again and said she could not stay to supper since then there had been no intercourse with glambeck and the baroness did not know of the satisfactory turn things had t taken at the parsonage till on christmas eve from her gallery in church to which she and the baron had decided to return on the greater festivals as a mark of their awareness that herr dremmel desired to make amends she beheld during the drawn-out verses of the chorale ingeborg drop sideways on the seat in her pew below and remain motionless and bunched up her hymn-book pushed crooked on the desk in front of her and her attitude one of complete indifference to appearances the baroness did not nudge the baron because in her position one does not nudge but her instinct was all for nudging herr dremmel could not see what had happened custom concealing him during the singing in a wooden box at the foot of the pulpit where he was busy imagining agricultural experiments till he came out the singing went on and suppose thought the baroness he were to forget to come out once he had forgotten she had heard and had stayed in his box having very unfortunately been visited there by a revelation concerning potash that caught him up into oblivion for the best part of an hour during which the chorale was gone through with an increasing faintness fifteen times she knew about the hour but did not know it was potash suppose he once again fell into a meditation there was no verger beadle pew opener or official person of any sort to take action 
the congregation would do nothing that was outside the customary and the prescribed there was no female relative such as the frau pastor would have had staying with her over christmas if she had been what she ought to have been and what every other pastor's wife so felicitously was a german and for herself to descend and help in the eyes of all kokensee would have been too great a condescension besides involving her in difficulties with the wife of the forester and the wife of the glambeck schoolmaster who was also the postman both of whom were of the same social standing as the younger frau dremmel and would jealously resent the least mark of what they would interpret as special favour herr dremmel however came out punctually and went up into the pulpit and opened his well-worn manuscript and read out the well-known text and the congregation sat as nearly thrilled as it could be waiting for the moment when his eye would fall on to his own pew and what was in it would he interrupt the service to go down and carry his wife out would the congregation have to wait till he came back again or would it be allowed to disperse to its christmas trees and rejoicings herr dremmel read on and on expounding the innocent christmas story describing its white accessories of flocks and angels and virgins and stars with the thunderous vehemence near scolding that had become a habit with him when he preached his text was peace on earth good will among men and from custom he hit his desk with his clenched fist while he read it out and hurled it at his congregation as if it were a threat he did not look in his wife's direction he was not thinking of her at all he wondered a little at the stillness and attention of his listeners nobody coughed nobody shuffled the school children hung over the edge of the organ loft motionless and intent baron glambeck remained awake at the end of the service herr dremmel had to stay according to custom in his wooden box till everyone had gone and it was not till he came out of that to go through the church to its only door that he perceived ingeborg for a moment he thought she was waiting for him in an attitude of inappropriately childish laxity and he was about to rebuke her when it flashed upon him that she had fainted that it was the second time in ten days and that he was indeed and without any doubt at last the happiest of men in spite of the bitter wind that was raking the churchyard every person who had been inside the church was waiting outside to see the pastor come out the glambecks and elders of the church would have waited in any case on christmas eve to wish him the compliments of the season and receive his in return but on this occasion they waited with pleasure as well as patience and the rest of the congregation waited too they were rewarded by seeing him presently appear in the doorway in his gown and bands carrying the bundle that was the still unconscious frau pastor as if she were a baby his face illuminated with joy and pride it was as entertaining as a funeral double congratulations were poured upon him double and treble handshakes of the hand he protruded for the purpose from beneath ingeborg's relaxed body and his spectacles as he responded were misty to the immense gratification of the crowd with happy tears this was the first popular thing ingeborg had done since her arrival she could not if she had planned it out with all her care and wits have achieved anything more dramatically ingratiating the day was the most appropriate day in the whole year it had been well worth waiting thought her overjoyed robert in order to receive such a christmas gift the baroness who with the baron was most cordial felt flattered 
as if only of course less perfectly for she herself had produced her children in actual time for the tree her example had been taken to heart and followed the village was deeply gratified to see an unconscious frau pastor carried through its midst and her limp body had all the prestige of a corpse everybody was moved and pleased and when ingeborg after much persuasion woke up to the world again on the sofa of the parsonage parlour it was to live through the happiest day she had yet had in her life the day of robert's greatest joy in her and devotion and care and pride and petting once more and for this day she outstripped the fertilizers in interest and the laboratory was a place forgotten she was pampered she lay on the sofa feeling quite well again but staying obediently on it because he told her to and she loved him to care watching him with happy eyes as he tremendously hovered he finished the arranging of the tree for her and fixed the candles on it interrupting himself every now and then to come and kiss her hands and pat her beams seemed to proceed from him and penetrate into the remotest corners in a land where all homes were glowing that christmas night this little home glowed the brightest the candles of the tree shone down on ingeborg curled up in the sofa corner talking and laughing gaily but with an infinitely proud and solemn gladness in her heart that at last he believed that at last she was fairly started on the road of the higher duty that at last she was going to be able to do something back something in return for all this happiness that had come to her through and because of him ilse was called in and came very rosy and shining from careful washing to be given her presents there were surprises for ingeborg she had to shut her eyes while they were arranged that touched and astonished her so totally blind had robert seemed to be for weeks past to anything outside his work a pot of hyacinths twisted about with pink crinkly paper and satin bows that he must have got with immense difficulty and elaborate precautions to prevent her seeing it a volume of heine's poetry a pair of fur gloves a silver curb bracelet a smiling pig of marzipan with a label round its neck ich bin gluck she not realizing what a german christmas meant had only a cigar case for him and when her lap full of his presents and her wrist decorated with a bracelet in which he showed an honest pride carefully explaining the trick of its fastening and assuring her it was real silver and that little women he well knew liked being hung with these barbaric splendors she put her arm around his neck and apologized for her dreadful ignorance of custom and want of imagination and solitary unsurprising miserable cigar case when she did this with her cheek laid on his furry head he drew her very close to him and blessed her blessed her his little wife and that greatest of gifts that she was bringing him both of them had wet eyes when this blessing solemnly administered and received was over it was done in the presence of ilsa who looked on benevolently and at the end came and shook their hands and joined in her thanks for what she had been given her congratulations on the happy event of the coming summer july said ilsa after a moment's reflection we must furnish that room she added ingeborg felt as though her very bones were soft with love chapter eighteen but these high moments of swimming in warm emotion do not last she found they are not final they are not 
as she had fondly believed a state of understanding and cloudless love at last attained to and rested in radiantly she discovered that the littlest things put an end to them just such a little thing as its being bedtime for instance is enough and the mood does not return and not only does it not return but it seems forgotten she became aware of this next morning at breakfast and it caused at first an immense surprise she had got the coffee ready with the glow of the evening before still warming her rosily she was still altogether thinking dear robert and wondering her head on one side as she cut the bread ilsa was a little cross after the marzipan and a smile on her lips at the happiness the world contains and when he came in she ran to him shiningly ready to take up the mood at the exact point where bedtime had broken it off the night before but herr dremmel had travelled a thousand miles in thought since then he hardly saw her he kissed her mechanically and sat down to eat to him she was as every day and usual again as the bread and coffee of his breakfast she was his wife who was going presently to be a mother it was normal ordinary and satisfactory and the matter being settled and the proper first joy and sentiment felt he could go on with more concentration than ever with his work for there would not now be the perturbing moments so frequent in the last six months when his wife's condition or rather negation of condition had thrust itself with the annoyance of an irrepressible weed up among his thinking the matter was settled and he put it aside as every worker must put the extraneous aside just on this morning he was profoundly concerned with a function of potash in the formation of carbohydrates he had sat up late long after ingeborg feeling as if she were dissolved in stars and happily certain that robert felt just as liquidly starry had gone to bed considering potash he wanted more starch in his grain more woody fibre in his straw she was not across the passage into their bedroom before his mind had sprung back to potash more starch in his grain more woody fibre in his straw less fungoid disease on his mangles at breakfast his thoughts were so sticky with the glucose and cane sugar of digestible carbohydrates that he could not even get them free for his newspaper but sat quite silently munching bread and butter his eyes on his plate well robert said ingeborg smiling at him round the coffee-pot a smile in which lurked the joyful importance of the evening before well little one he said absently not looking at her well robert she said again challengingly what is it little one he asked looking up with a slight irritation of the interrupted what you're not pleased any more she asked pretending indignation pleased about what she stared at him at this without pretending anything about what she repeated her lips dropping apart he had forgotten she thought this really very extraordinary she poured herself out a cup of coffee slowly thinking he had forgotten the thing he had said so often that he wanted most was a thing he could forget once he had the certain promise of it in a night the candles on the christmas tree in the corner were not more burned out and finished than his tender intensity of feeling of the evening before well that was robert that was the way of course of clever men but the tears he had felt enough for tears it was without a doubt that he had felt tremendously how wonderful then she thought slowly dropping sugar into her cup for even the memory of it to be wiped out well that too was robert 
he did not cling as she did to moments but passed on intelligently and she was merely stupid to suppose any one with his brains would linger would loiter about her indefinitely gloating over their happiness she left her coffee and got up and went over to him and kissed him dear robert she murmured accommodating herself to him proud even now that he could be so deeply preoccupied with profound thoughts as to forget an event so really great for after all a child to be born a new life to be launched was not that something really great yet his thoughts her husband's thoughts were greater dear robert she murmured and kissed him proudly but the winter in spite of these convictions of happiness and of having every reason for pride was a time that she dragged through with difficulty she who had never thought of her body who had found in it the perfect instrument for carrying out her will was forced to think of it almost continuously it mastered her she had endlessly to humour it before she could use it even a little she seemed forever to be having to take it to a sofa and lay it down flat and not make it do anything she seemed forever to be trying to persuade it that it did not mind the smell of the pig or the smell that came across from glambeck when the wind was that way of potato spirits being made in the distillery there when these smells got through the window chinks she would shut her eyes and think hard of the scent of roses and pinks and of that lovely orange scent of the orange-coloured lupin she had seen grown everywhere in the summer but sooner or later her efforts however valiant ended in the creeping coldness the icy perspiration of sick faintness as the months went on her body became fastidious even about daily inevitable smells such as the roasting of coffee and the frying of potatoes which was extremely awkward when one had to see these things oneself and it often happened that ilsa coming out of the scullery or in from the yard fresh and energetic with health would find her mistress dropped on a chair with her head on the kitchen table in quite an absurd condition considering that everybody assured her it was not an illness at all of feeling as though it were one ilsa would look at her with a kind of amused sympathy the frau pastor will be worse before she is better she would say cheerfully and if things were very bad and ingeborg white and damp clung to her in a single struggle to feel not white and damp she used the formula first heard on the lips of baroness glambeck and nodded encouragingly though not without a certain air of something that was a little like pleasure and said ya ya those who have said a must also say b when ingeborg's spirit was at its lowest in these unequal combats she would drop her head and shut her eyes and feel she hated oh she faintly coldly sickly hated b the fun of housekeeping of doing everything yourself wore extremely thin during the next few months she no longer jumped out of bed eager to get to her duties again and bless the beginning of each new day by a charming and cheerful breakfast table for her man she felt heavy reluctant to face the business of dressing sure that no sooner would she be on her feet than she would feel ill again she talked of getting another servant a cook and herr dremmel who left these arrangements entirely to her agreed at once but when it came to taking the necessary steps to advertising or journeying into konigsberg to an agency she flagged and did nothing it was all so difficult she might faint on the way she might be sick and she could not ask robert to help her because she did not know what problem 
nearing a triumphant solution she might not disastrously interrupt end of section seven